Oh, he's the shove it man. Oh, he's the shove it man. He's gonna shove it. Yeah. He's gonna shove it man. All right, the squad. It's a pretty big day for me as today I bring back a video from the vault, except it's been remastered and improved. My Monday Night War videos is what initially launched my channel, and most of these were recorded in a cupboard back in 2018. I can't believe how long you've all allowed me to do this for, so bringing this video back is a gift to you guys to thank you. Except now the audio will actually be bearable and not recorded in a cupboard. I've kept the lines exactly the same for nostalgia purposes, and enjoy the TNA vs WWE Monday Night War in full. It all started when TNA signed Hulk Hogan and there was so much hype around this signing. TNA was on the Spike TV network and they agreed to trial Monday nights for TNA with Hulk Hogan leading the show. TNA had typically been on Thursday nights, so Spike TV and TNA were cautious about moving to Mondays, so they would do an initial trial in January. The first show was to take place on January 4th, 2010, and the show would be a special three-hour show. The first hour of the show would run unopposed, but the rest of it would go up against Raw, so this was quite a momentous occasion. There were lots of shots and threats coming from TNA and Hulk Hogan saying how they were going to take all WWE viewers and they would become the biggest wrestling show out there. So this doesn't seem like it's going to be a friendly war straight away. The show starts with... Oh, Bubba the Love Sponge. He's interviewing fans in the car park and threatening WWE. After six minutes, we get our first match, the notorious X Division Asylum match. It was the Mercy Seat Machine Guns, Lethal Consequences, Homicide, Kiyoshi, Suicide and the Amazing Reds. The match itself is confusing in the first place because most of these wrestlers are in tag teams and a couple of them are singles wrestlers. But this is a match where everyone takes on everyone. The aim of the match is to escape outside the cage, however it's not your normal cage match because it's not easy to escape out the cage. To start with, just look at this match, it looks horrible. I can't see anything going on in the ring, the bars are too thick. And this would have been the first thing that new fans tuning into TNA would have seen on the show. A match they can't even watch. To make matters worse, the match is thrown out when Homicide attacks the other wrestlers with a baton. He then tries to climb out the cage, but he can't do it. It's very painful to watch. He climbs very slowly and gets stuck at the top. Then all the other wrestlers try to climb up to get him, and then he falls into the middle of the ring. Very strange, I'm not sure what they were attempting here. Then suddenly some strange music plays, and Jeff Hardy randomly appears in the crowd. This was really bad. He takes out Homicide who has now gone out of the cage and then he climbs up the cage and Hardy just sits at the top smiling. This wraps up the first 15 minutes of the show. You have got to remember though, this is Jeff Hardy. He had been wrestling for the WWE very recently, massive star in the WWE. But TNA never really mentioned Jeff Hardy again on this show. To the back now and Nash is here saying that Hogan's on his way but he won't be coming on his own. ODB and Tara are up next for the knockouts title. Tara kicks her ass for a few minutes, but ODB wins by pulling the trunks and wins the gold without really getting much offense in. Straight to the back again, a limo is pulled up, and this time it's Ric Flair making his TNA debut, and he heads to AJ Styles' locker room, and there's lots of intrigue into what's going on with that. Elsewhere outside, Mick Foley arrives, but security tell him he's banned from the arena. Bobby Lashley then arrives and comes straight to the ring with his wife, Crystal. She says he has better things to be doing than TNA, and asks for his release from the company. This was quite a strange thing to put on a show where lots of new fans would be watching. A wrestler saying he had better things to be doing than TNA? A bit like fans had better things to be doing than watching this show. Backstage, Velvet and the Beautiful People announce that they'll be playing strip poker throughout the show. But this turns out to be a massive letdown. Lacey loses the first round and has to take off her top. Also backstage, Hall and X-Pac have turned up and they're trying to get into the building but security also stop them. Instead, they somehow come through the crowd. Everyone is trying to get a view of Hogan's debut. Also, it's quite funny that Hall and X-Pac get in the building, but other people won't find it so easy later in the show. Hang on, hang on. Let's check the time. I think Raw's starting now. Let's see what they're up to. Let's change the channel. On WWE Raw, the show opens up with a hype package for Bret Hart returning to the company after 12 years. WWE were using Bret to make sure that they got a good rating and combated TNA's debut of Hulk Hogan. Bret opens up the show and calls out Shawn Michaels. The two meet in the middle of the ring for the first time since the Montreal Screwjob and they both talk about their history and they agree to a handshake. They then hug it out. Brett also calls out Vince, but he doesn't show up. This would be a running story throughout the show with Brett trying to get hold of Vince. Okay, let's switch back to TNA and see what they were doing as Brett Hart was on WWE Raw. After lots of build, Hogan finally makes his way out. Hogan talks about how TNA is going to be the next big company and how great it is. He makes sure to put himself over as much as he can. 
Hall and X-Pac are invited into the ring by Hogan. They say they're here to party and earn big money. Hogan says things have changed and it's not about that anymore. This brings out Kevin Nash, who's upset because he also thought they were going to party. Hogan tells him he's wrong. Poor Nash. Now Eric Bischoff is here and he says everybody must earn their place in this company and the Wolfpack all leave the ring together. Bischoff asks for a script from the director and then he tears it up and says we're starting over. It turns out that this was a real format of the show which Bischoff tore up. Hogan says if you can't wrestle or talk, we're shipping you off up north, brother. It's worth noting that TNA took a few shots at WWE, but WWE didn't really take any shots at TNA. Sting is shown watching from the rafters. Gosh, Sting in the rafters again? Didn't this already happen in like 1996? Pass the remote, let's check out Raw instead. Justin Roberts tracks down Vince McMahon, who says he'll meet Bret Hart later on tonight. Back in the ring now, Maurice takes on Brie Bella in a tournament to crown a new Divas champion. Maurice wins after the Bella Twins switch place, but it doesn't really work, so it was pointless. A short match. Miz then meets Maurice on the ramp and says he may call her back one day, forecasting a future for them together. Miz is here to do commentary and scout the wrestlers in the next match. He is the US champion and there's a fatal four-way to decide the number one contender. The participants Swagger, MVP, Carlito and Mark Henry. Carlito and Mark Henry don't even get an entrance. MVP wins a very short match after hitting Swagger with the Playmaker and becoming the number one contender for the US title. And we're at the half hour mark on Raw. Let's flip back to TNA. Back in TNA, the Knockouts tag titles on the line, which I forgot even existed. I actually covered that in its own video. It's the team of Awesome Kong and Hamada, another one I forgot existed versus the champions at the time, Taylor Wilde and Sarita. During the match, the Motor City Machine Guns are shown being attacked backstage, and they're on the floor dead. Hamada and Kong win the belts after a dropkick powerbomb combination. Backstage, the former Val Venus has barged into the beautiful people's locker room playing cards. Elsewhere backstage, Mick Foley is still not allowed in the building. The Nasty Boys are also unable to get into the building. I don't know why all these guys just don't do what Hall and X-Pac did. Back in the ring, Raven and Dr. Stevie of Daphne are beaten in a pointless 30 second squash match by Hernandez and Matt Boring. You know, Bischoff comes up and uh, Jason Hervey says they were always in the creative stuff. They come out to me and Matt Morgan because, ah, we got time for you guys to do a two minute squash against uh, Stevie Richards and um, Raven. But you have two minutes, but you guys can't have entrances. Or you can shake Ric Flair's hand as he gets out of the limo. That was your choices. You want to show what TNA can do. And my choices were me and Matt Morgan squash uh, Stevie Richards and Raven, or we shake Ric Flair's hand when he gets out of limo. We're the tag champs. Remember, we we, we, get, we get to have a two minute squash against Raven and uh, Stevie Richards. And then they give a long, what, 10, 10 minute match with the Dudley Boys versus um, the Nasty Boys. You know, so you, so you set up Monday Night War to go against Raw, and you tried to find every ex WWE guy you could possibly find to put them on TV to show them that we, they, that we, that we can hang with you. Yeah, that'll work. And you wonder why it went bad. Because if that was the mentality going in, there was no coming back. Away backstage, and the Pope gets interviewed about his match with Desmond Wolf later in the show. He's interrupted by Orlando Jordan, who's making his first TNA appearance. He's also looking for Hogan's office. This is definitely time for me to change the channel back to Raw. Back on Raw and Jericho are backstage talking about their match with DX for the tag belts. If they lose the match, then Jericho will be chucked off Raw. Jericho wants to talk to Bret Hart about it and meets with him. He asks Bret Hart to referee the match and screw DX, but Bret says no because he doesn't want any more problems or controversies. Hornswoggle backstage with Triple H is promoting wrestling figures. Sean walks up and asks what they're doing. Santino also joins them dressed as Jericho and Hornswoggle attacks him. Triple H gives Hornswoggle a cookie to thank him for the attack. This was so painful and cringy to watch. The match is up next, it's Jericho vs DX. Jericho did some Hogan impressions during the match and this was pretty much the only reference WWE ever made to TNA. DX win after Hornswoggle distracts Jericho and he gets nailed with the sweet chin music. Jericho now has to leave Raw. DX lead the crowd in singing goodbye to Jericho. This goes on for a while and it seems to be a good time to switch back to TNA. 
Back in TNA land, Desmond Wolfe is taking on the Pope in a match which tries to be technical in three minutes. Pope wins with a small package. In the back now, and Rhino has been attacked by someone. The lighting here is so poor, which is probably a good thing when Bubba the Love Sponge is on telly. World Champion AJ Styles backstage meets of Eric Bischoff. He says AJ will be putting the world title on the line tonight against Kurt Angle. Jeff Jarrett is shown limping backstage and he comes out to the ring to put over the TNA originals and say how great they are. But then he's interrupted by Hogan who suddenly turns heel. He's horrible to Jeff. He tells Jarrett he's run the company into the ground and tells Jeff Jarrett he's no longer Dixie Carter's partner. It's all about Hogan from now on. Nobody cares about Jeff and it's time for Jeff to get back in the ring. This was all completely out of the blue and I'm not sure why Hogan went heel on Jarrett for no reason. Across the arena, Christopher Daniels is trying to do an interview, but he's interrupted by Mick Foley, still trying to get into the building to talk to Hogan. Mick Foley pushes past Jeremy Borash to finally achieve his entry to the building. Back over to Raw. Vince is backstage with Randy Orton. Orton offers to punt Bret Hart in the head if Vince agrees that he'll make Orton the 30th entrant in the Royal Rumble. But Vince actually rejects this offer. He walks on down the corridor where Legacy threatens to beat Orton up if he can't beat Kofi Kingston later in the night. Following this, it's an advert for Mike Tyson being the next Raw guest host. Wow, that's two good guest hosts in a row. We didn't get this very often during the guest host era. World champion, Sheamus now. He's been feuding with Cena, and he recently won his first world title in that table match with Cena where he got lucky and pushed him off the top rope through a table. Evan Bourne randomly comes out to challenge him. Bourne does come close to an upset, but quickly loses to Sheamus. Michael Cole then acknowledges the passing of Dr. Death, Steve Williams. A long hype package is then played about the Montreal Screwjob and the upcoming Bret Hart-Vince McMahon confrontation. Next up is the main event of Raw, Orton vs Kofi Kingston. They've been feuding for a few months at this point. Orton wins the match with the RKO after an excellent back and forth match. He raises his hand in victory and Legacy just kind of stare at him for ringside. All of this has got me thinking. I wonder if the Nasty Boys managed to make it into the building. Let's switch back to TNA to find out. Jeff Hardy is shown backstage with his weird stoner friend Shanna Moore painting an ugly picture of himself. The friend tells him it's time to go and meet Hogan. Abyss takes on Samoan Joe next who is covering for Rhino who was taken out earlier in the night by the mystery attacker. This is when Abyss was at his most idiotic. Soon he would become Hogan's best friend, a completely unbearable time period for Abyss and TNA. Joe was also lost in the shuffle as usual. Anyway, Joe taps out Abyss in the Coquita clutch. Backstage, Crystal Lashley asks for a meeting with Hogan to discuss Lashley's release from TNA. But Eric tells her to get in line with everybody else. The whole show seems to be built around a meeting that everybody is going to have with Hogan. Somewhere else backstage, and beer money have been taken out, and Bubba the Love Sponge is in the darkness trying to tell us about it. We're with the Nasty Boys again now, who have now officially made it into the building after fooling security. Outside the building, Jeff Hardy and his weird stoner friend are celebrating getting something from their meeting with Hogan. Some underage Jeff Hardy fans run up and ask for autographs, instead he gives them a kiss and a portrait which he made earlier. The Nasty Boys are breaking into Team 3D's locker room, who are away in Japan at this point. The Nasty Boys absolutely trash the locker room and spray paint all over it. Seeing this much of the Nasty Boys is enough to make anyone want to change the station back to where we go. Vince comes out in the long final segment. He hypes up Mike Tyson being the guest host for next week. Bret Hart walks out to the ring and squares up to Vince. Vince talks Bret Hart down and talks through what happened at Survivor Series. You think they're finally going to put their differences aside. They talk about Bret Hart's accomplishments and they shake hands. Vince then turns around and boots Bret Hart in the nuts and walks off leaving him laying as Raw comes to a close. So how did TNA close out their show? Pass the remote please. TNA closed out their show of an amazing AJ Styles Kurt Angle main event for the world title. During the match, a masked man would run out and attack AJ, but Kurt Angle helps AJ to throw him out of the ring. This masked man would end up being a returning Tomko. An amazing back and forth match is taking place and the crowd are chanting who needs Brett in response to Raw. Ric Flair is shown watching the match. He's been in AJ Styles locker room earlier on. Kurt kicked out of three Styles clashes and AJ kicked out of a top rope angle slam. Eventually, AJ Styles wins with a springboard 450 splash. Hogan comes out to say how great the match was, but he's interrupted by something happening backstage. The camera cuts backstage to Mick Foley, who's searching for Hogan. He barges into the Val Venus Beautiful People poker game, but it's actually too dark to see anything, so it's pointless. He then barges into Eric Bischoff's office. Seriously, can't TNA afford to have any lights switched on? The whole corridor and office were in pitch black. Foley is threatening Eric Bischoff when he gets attacked by Hall Nash and Pack from behind. Just when this is happening, Hogan arrives and looks confused on whether to side with his friends or side with Foley. 
And that's how the show ends. Okay, so after watching both shows back, I really do think that TNA put on the better show overall. It did get a bit confusing at times with all the bodies, and then there was a lot of pointless wrestling characters featured here. There was also a lot of stuff going on backstage. I think I lost track of the amount of times I said the word backstage. Raw's show was completely built around the confrontation between Bret and Vince at the end of the show. If you did not know or like Bret Hart, it would have been difficult to enjoy the show, but it was quite streamlined and it was clear where it was heading. There wasn't really anything to get confused over on the Raw show. On the TNA show, Hogan really only had one long segment, so you didn't have to love him or like him to enjoy it. So the first battle of the Monday Night Wars was over. TNA's network Spike TV said they would have been happy if they could retain their normal crowd figures from Thursdays. But they absolutely smashed it, drawing in an average of 2.2 million viewers. The most viewed segment was Hogan's segment, which drew in 2.5 million viewers and aired at the same time as the Bret Hart segment. This was record setting for TNA. Spike TV was so happy with the trial run that they agreed to sort it out so TNA could move to Monday nights permanently from March. It's also worth noting that the viewing figures show fans tuned out as the show went on. I wonder how many people tuned out because of that horrible cage match at the start of the show. When Bischoff came in and Hogan came in, I'm not sure which one it was, where they had a part on of getting Homicide off TV. That match there was the that sealed his faith that he was not going to stay. <laughs> as, well as, as well as that the, the, the exhibition guys were going to get less TV time. And you had this man with a hurt shoulder dangling from the top <laughs> because he's, his shoulder was too injured to pull himself up. The end, end result of that match was supposed to be him and Hardy on top of the cage. So now the Monday Night Wars are officially back on two months after the trial in January. I need to point out that TNA made its first major mistakes of the Monday Night Wars in this episode. You'll see what that is as the video progresses. Raw is on the build up to the WrestleMania at this point, and you'll see it mentioned all over the show. So enough recapping, it's the 8th of March 2010, the time is 9pm and it's Cracker Jack. TNA and WWE are about to go head to head in the second instalment of this video. Hogan and Bischoff stumble out to the ring. They challenge Ric Flair and AJ Styles to a match tonight. Hogan and Biss get a great crowd reaction. That's probably not for you, Abyss, let's be honest. They end up milking it and play to the crowd for a while. Abyss is truly at his worst here. I truly hated the abyss mania storyline where he got the Hall of Fame ring from Hawk Hogan, and he and Hogan are best friends. It turned the monster into a whimpering idiot. They get the mic to talk some trash, and then they call out Flair and Styles to challenge them to a match right here and now. Surely they should be saving Hogan vs Flair for the main event at the end of the night, right? Styles is doing his styling and profiling gimmick where he's basically a miniature Ric Flair, apart from his dressing gown has a hood on it. He really reminds me of some wacky buff bagwell of all the shenanigans going on. The crowd is hot for this match, but the ref quickly throws the match out after he loses control. Styles carefully kicks Hogan in the head and taps him with his foot. Then the lights go out and Sting appears in the ring. Sting acts like he's going to hit Flair and AJ, but instead, he turns on Hogan and Abyss. Everyone is confused by Sting's actions as he batters them with a baseball bat, and then Abyss and Hogan get leveled with a chair. As Hogan's lying there trying to recover, he grabs the mic and says a match will take place at the end of the night, and this time it's going to be a no-DQ match, so they can get the revenge against Flair and Styles. Let's check out Raw. Undertaker stamps out to the ring. Shawn Michaels is trying to force The Undertaker into a WrestleMania rematch. He recently cost the take of the title at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view and this has forced Undertaker's hand into agreeing to a rematch. He's interrupted by HBK just in the nick of time. HBK says the Undertaker fears him and reminds him how close he came to beating the Taker at the last WrestleMania. He also says nothing lasts forever, except maybe this promo. Two matches later tonight will be Orton vs Tony Rhodes and Vince McMahon vs John Cena. Kind of a boring way to start the show. Not much energy, I have to say. Honestly, TNA has been much more exciting so far. Let's switch back. Backstage, Dixie Carter approaches the Stinger. She's angry at him for attacking Golden Boy Hulk Hogan. Sting pins her up against the wall and says he owes her nothing. What's up with the Stinger's crazy actions? AJ and Flair give a wacky interview thanking Sting and threatening Hogan for the match later on. Then somewhere else backstage, Abyss is crying because Sting beat him up. He's supposed to be main eventing at the next pay-per-view, but instead he's back here whimpering like a complete buffoon. This guy's a total moron. Keeping the trend going, Brooke Hogan is shown crying backstage. Frankie Kazarian is on the mic. He's not crying, though. He talks about how great the X Division is. He's then interrupted by Daniels, who tells him how worthless he is. 
They're interrupted by X Division champion Douglas Williams, who sounds like Jonathan Burkow from British Parliament. Eric Bischoff comes out and sets up an impromptu freeway match for the belt. Lots of nice pinning combinations and high risk moves in this match. There's bodies flying everywhere. Nobody has a clear advantage. Daniels misses the BME on Kazarian, which leads to Douglas Williams hitting him with a devastating rolling Chaos Fairy suplex. Williams then gets jumped by the scrawny Shannon Moore, who hasn't appeared since the first episode of the Monday Night War back in January. Bischoff says he'll be facing Williams for the belt at the pay-per-view. Vintage TNA pushing an ex-WWE guy who doesn't deserve it. Backstage, Dixie Carter threatens Sting and says he'll be facing a mystery opponent later in the night. I wonder who that'll be. Great fun X Division match. Let's switch back to WWE. The Divas come out to the ring. They have a three minute match. It's Kelly Kelly, Gail Kim, and Eve Torres taking on Katie Lee, Alicia Fox, and Maurice. Maurice is the Divas champion at the time, but she doesn't get her entrance shown. Gail carries a lot of work in the early part of the match until she eats a big boot. The heels are only on top briefly until Eve Torres starts battering Maurice and then she taps her out. Kelly Kelly and Katie Lee didn't even do anything in this match. What was the point of them even being here? Triple H is scheduled to address the Sheamus situation after he was attacked last week. We then meet our raw guest host of the evening, Chris Angel. He does magic tricks and it's completely pointless and cringy and a waste of time. Then there's a recap from last week about how our truth and Morrison became the number one contenders for the tag titles at WrestleMania. Show Miz comes to the ring to make fun of them and point out they aren't even a proper tag team. Wow, was the tag division really this thin at the time? Truth and Morrison then have a tag match with Show Miz, which lasts about 10 seconds. Show ends up getting DDT'd on the outside and the Miz gets suplexed into the crowd. They celebrate and leave the ring. It seems like I'm spending less time talking about Raw. It's because there's so many WrestleMania packages on this show, there's no point me covering them all. Then there's another reminder about Orson Clash and the Legacy later tonight. Let's switch back to Fight TV. The TNA knockouts are now in action for the vacant tag belts. They've been vacant since Kong left the company. Sarita and Taylor Wilde versus The Beautiful People versus Tara and Angelina Love. A three minute match also. It looks like Angelina and Tara are going to win when they hit the Botox injection. Tara goes for the Widow's Peak on Madison, but Daphne randomly interferes, hitting her with the belt and costing her the match. The Beautiful People win the tag belts. Look, there's Lacey Von Botch, the worst female wrestler of all time. Daphne would be facing Tara for the knockout style pay-per-view, but this wasn't even mentioned. To the back, there's a dodgy looking attack as Desmond Wolf is hurt in the Pope's knee. There is a funny line here though, where Wolf tells Pope to keep the chain. Sting is then shown coming down from the rafters to face his mystery opponent. Elsewhere backstage, the beautiful people celebrate their win. Madison tells Lacey she's also a tag team champion. That must be some of the cheapest champagne ever. Lacey cringes when she tastes it. Sting in action next to his last seen in TNA in January on the first Monday Night War episode, hiding in the rafters just like WCW. Suddenly some god awful music plays and oh my god, it's RVD making his TNA debut. He attacks Sting from behind with a kick off the top rope. And this is going to be so good. Here comes a rolling thunder from RVD. He nails it. One, two, three, huh? What? The celebrations don't last though as Sting hits him with the bat. Again, and again, and again. Okay, we get it. And again. See, this is just terrible TNA. A major free agent like RVD debuts and you don't build it up at all. You don't try to pop a rating. You don't try to do anything special. You just have him do a quick rolling thunder in a 30 second match and win. If you'd have hyped RVD's debut, you might have attracted some new eyes to the product. Yes, you're putting on a great show, but what's the point if nobody's watching? Why would you debut RVD like this? Sting batters RVD, referees and security. Then Hogan comes out and Sting batters him too. RVD's debut has now been completely overshadowed by Hulk Hogan. And there's a pay-per-view coming up. Sting facing Hogan at the pay-per-view. No. So what's the point? This made me so mad. Hogan is basically dead at this point. He looks like a bloodied corpse. And he's supposed to be having a match later tonight. Is he even going to be able to compete in it? Oh, this is so annoying. Let's switch back to war. There's a video playing showing how John Cena suffered herniated discs after a botched powerbomb from Batista two years prior. Cena then talks to a gormless looking Josh Matthews about how he's scared as he can't beat Batista and he expects him to interfere in his match tonight with Vince. In the back, Evan Bourne and Regal exchange words. There's some sort of match happening tonight. Ryback is also here looking like a complete goofball in this Skip Sheffield days. I don't know how anybody took him seriously after this. He looks like a complete moron. More rubbish with the guest host. Complete waste of time. Regal looks bored. Looks like he wants to smack him one. Legacy make their way out to the ring, but Orton gets the jump on them both and plays a lot of mind games. Both members of Legacy seem intimidated by Orton. Orton is a bit of a tweener at this point, but he obviously gets cheered over Legacy, who are both very bland. Orton is in complete control of the match until the numbers advantage gets to him. Orton recovers after a bit and starts dominating Legacy, who is seemingly too scared to take Orton out. 
Eventually, DiBiase drop kicks Orton on the outside and puts the heels on top. But then Orton manages a comeback. This is a really entertaining back and forth handicap match with Orton showing amazing in ring psychology. He looks up annoyed at the WrestleMania side knowing that he won't be able to go anymore and this causes him to take his eye off the ball. He forgets Tony Rhodes is there and Rhodes distracts him allowing DiBiase to hit the Dream Street and get the pin on Orton. Then Rhodes hits the crossroads as dodgy finisher just to add insult to injury. Wow, Ted Jr's push continues, we'll see where this is heading on the next Raw. Backstage, Batista, the World Heavyweight Champion, promises not to get involved in the Cena vs McMahon match later tonight. Is he telling the truth? Only time will tell. Raw has gotten better, let's see what TNA is up to. Nash and Eric Young are in the ring and they call out Hall and Pack. Eric Young was attacked by them last week but no recap video is shown. These guys have been hiding backstage for months and still don't have a contract. Nash says they'll fight in a tag team match at the next pay-per-view, and if they can win at the pay-per-view, they'll be granted contracts. Hall and Pack seem completely gone at this point, they can barely walk. Bischoff agrees to the match, but says if they lose, he doesn't want to ever see them again. Hall and Nash both shake hands, but Pack slaps Young. This leads to a brawl in the ring, and Bischoff is here looking arrogant, and he says Pack and Young can have a match right now. It's a completely pointless match. Pack goes for the Bronco Buster, but misses, and Eric Young wins with a pile driver. At the time, fans were up in arms that Hall and Pack were getting so much screen time. Then the army come out and line up along the ramp for Kurt Angle's entrance. Angle and Anderson are involved in a blood feud after Anderson stole Angle's dog tag which was given to him by a soldier. Angle cuts an amazing promo about US soldiers and how Anderson has been disrespecting them. You can truly feel the hatred. Anderson starts running him down backstage but Kurt tracks him down and beats him down to the ring. Anderson hits Kurt with the dog tag and gets the advantage, tries to leave but he's blocked by army members. Kurt then throws him over the top time and time again as army members beat down on Anderson. The crowd are going nuts for this, they're all eating it up and enjoying this. This is great seeing Anderson getting his comeuppance. Angle then hits an ankle slam and celebrates with the army like a true American hero. Backstage, Bubba the Love Sponge is kissing Hogan's ass and then they're interrupted by Earl Hebner. Hebner was fired by TNA a couple of months earlier after confessing to screwing Brett at Montreal and also screwing Kurt out of a recent match. It's nice to see an on-screen carryo from Earl Hebner, especially for WWE fans checking out the product. Hogan has Hebner promise he'll stop the main event tonight if it gets too violent. This is also a small shot of the WWE, you'll see why later. They then promote the Motor City Machine Guns vs Generation Me, aka the Young Bucks, Destination X. It's going to be a great match, but it's a shame that none of them have appeared on the show tonight. Abyss vs AJ is also happening for the world title, and this is pretty much its only promotion. Wow, that angle segment was fire though, I do have to say, I think TNA is winning the war tonight, let's check out Raw. The game makes his way out to the ring to confront Sheamus. They replay the kick that Sheamus did to Triple H last week. The game gets on the mic and he starts to scare Sheamus. He makes a good argument. He says wrestlers who have beaten Triple H get to the next level in star power, but those who have lost to him have had their careers destroyed. Wow, Triple H acknowledging that he buries wrestlers. A good promo for Triple H, but longer than a July summer's day. It lasts four minutes until they eventually fight it out. Triple H hits a little spine bust on Sheamus and he runs for the hills. Next up, it's Christian on commentary of NXT rookie Heath Slater. They're watching a Money in the Bank qualifier match between William Regal and Evan Bourne. Regal hits some lovely suplexes on Evan Bourne before he makes a mistake, he gets kneed in the head and beaten by Evan Bourne. It was a two minute match and I don't like seeing Regal jobbed out like this. At least Evan Bourne is a better fit for the Money in the Bank match, which is going to be a great match. Okay, we're alright to switch back to Spike now. Ah, look who it is, my favourite wrestler, your friend of mine, the old cowboy James Storm. Jarrett is complaining backstage because Eric Bischoff has been bullying him and making him do demeaning tasks. He'll have to fight beer money in a handicap match tonight. They again get into a little scuffle but Mick Foley breaks it up. Foley will be the special referee tonight for that match. Mick Foley has also been getting bullied by Eric Bischoff and made to look stupid. So Jarrett and Foley have a bit of an alliance going. In the ring, Storm and Rude completely dominate Jarrett in this match which surprised me because Jarrett is normally booked so strongly within TNA. I guess this is a sign that he was quite low on backstage power at this point. Beer money hit all their special moves but then a mistake by Storm spitting beer in Rude's face allows Jarrett to make a comeback. Then beer money start cheating so Foley hands Jarrett a barbed wire pole. Jarrett tries to deck Rude, but Bischoff sends out a second referee to regain control of the match. And this distraction allows Beer Money to hit the DWI and beat Jarrett. Kind of a screwy match here. It would have been nice to see him fight out of all the dodgy booking. I guess Beer Money are heels now then. In the back, Brooke Hogan is still crying in her dad's arms, but Hulk is comforting her. God, calm down, Brooke. You're not the one who has to fight tonight. Back on Raw, they're promoting all the huge WrestleMania matches that will be happening. I think by this point, it's pretty obvious that WWE doesn't care about TNA. 
They're only focused on selling us WrestleMania, or are they? The show then starts focusing on Brett versus Vince at WrestleMania, and it shows how Brett was recently smashed by a limo and now has a broken leg. It's a shame that Earl Hebner was under contract to TNA at this point. It would have been nice to see him involved in some way at WrestleMania, but it was like TNA decided to tease WWE this week. Vince is then shown walking backstage for his match with Cena. Then suddenly WWE does something to combat TNA as they announce Cena vs The Big Show and Autumn vs Triple H for next week. And then the nail in the coffin, they announced the contract signing of Bret and Vince with the enforcer Stone Cold Steve Austin. He hasn't been seen since his Hall of Fame induction over a year prior. I think TNA is in trouble now. Fans are going to tune in to see Austin, let's face it. TNA hasn't announced a single thing for next week. The guest host is now in the ring announcing the participants for the main event and he gets quite a good reaction which surprised me. Cena comes out and then Vince comes out who's doing the most ridiculous strut I've ever seen. You can tell he's got a plan up his sleeve. Vince gets on the mic and says he's made some changes to the match and makes it a handicap gauntlet match. First out is Vladimir Kozlov who hits some power moves on Cena and then Vince asks to tag in. For some reason when Vince tags in the wrestler must then leave the ring like they've been defeated. Vince gets a two count. Why would Vince make a rule like that? It doesn't seem very favourable to him. Vince then calls out Drew McIntyre who rushes to the ring and hits a downward spiral and then McIntyre tags in Vince. But again Vince can only get a two count. Vince decides to call on Jack Swagger next. Ugh, I think I'll change back to the last part of TNA now. Back in TNA, Flair and Styles make their way out to the ring for their main event match. Out comes Hogan and Abyss after this, who look a bit worse for wear. Hogan starts out the match, which surprised me as he starts to beat on Ric Flair. They brawl all around the outside of the ring. Hulk Hogan looks like he's moving in slow motion with his punches and they're just embarrassing. Flair is bleeding like a stuffed pig, as he normally does. The crowd don't look very impressed as you can see how weak Hogan's punches look up close. Hogan starts chopping Flair and then Flair tries to escape but he's brought back to the ring by Abyss. Hogan starts whipping Flair with the belt. Remember, this is a no DQ match. This is Hogan's first proper match in four months since the Hulkamania tour where he fought Ric Flair once again. Flair eventually cheats which allows the heels to take advantage. AJ pushes Hogan into the ring pole and he's bleeding again. Hogan eventually fights back and makes the hot tag to Abyss who runs wild and chokes Slam Styles and Flair. AJ manages to fight back eventually with a springboard but Abyss kicks out of this. And then he starts hulking up. God I hate this so much, why did he have to be a clone of Hogan? Abyss and Hogan hit stereo big boots but no leg drops, not of Abyss's dodgy knees anyway. Abyss then pulls out the black hole slam on AJ Styles to get the pin. Abyss celebrates and shows off his ring but then he's attacked by Desmond Wolfe with a steel chair. He's trying to impress Ric Flair and get in his good books. Pope then also runs to the ring to fight off Wolfe who attacked him earlier in the night. Pope isn't really selling his ankle so what was the point in the attack earlier in the night? I don't blame him either, that attack looked terrible, why sell it? Jeff Hardy then runs down to the ring to fight off the hills. The crowd are going bonkers, Hardy hasn't been seen in the ring since the January Monday Night War episode. Hardy goes up to the top to hit the Swanton Bomb on AJ Styles. And, and, wait for it, the show ends. <laughs> nice job TNA, you absolute idiots. How do you continuously let this sort of thing happen? You missed the end of the show. Imagine what he's thinking in his head back in North Carolina. I'm done with this, let's see how Raw ended. Was it actually caught on camera? Cena is making a small comeback during the break, then Swagger's in the ring jumping around like a nutcase and beating up Cena. He's a bit more cautious than the other wrestlers to tag in Vince. He wants to make sure that enough damage is done. Vince is extremely confident when he's tagged in and he walks up to get the pin, but to his shock, Super Cena kicks out again. Vince calls out the next participant, who is Mark Henry, and he doesn't look very happy to be here. He hits Cena with the world's strongest slam and he reluctantly tags in Vince. Cena kicks out again, surprise, surprise. Vince flips out on the mic and makes it a no DQ match. Vince hands Henry the ring bell, but Henry refuses to hit Cena with it and throws it away. Batista runs in and spears Henry. Kofi Kingston runs in to protect his friend John Cena, but Batista makes short work of Kofi. The distraction's enough to allow Cena time to recover. Cena almost takes McMahon out, but he's hit with a weak looking Batista spear. Batista nails the power bomb on Cena, but McMahon makes the cover for the free. Batista poses for a while above Cena as the show goes off the air. So there we have it, the second episode of the TNA WWE Monday Night War. There was an abundance of talking points which you can discuss in the comments section, but I would really like to know who you thought had the strongest show on this week. From my point of view, I think TNA had a much stronger TV show. A lot more excitement around it, however they made some critical errors with no forward planning. The RVD debut and the return of Jeff Hardy should have at least been promoted and used as a catalyst to boost the show's viewership. You could pretty much not watch TNA for the two months between the two Monday Night War episodes because it was almost a follow on with a lot of wrestlers only returning once the war was back on. WWE was entirely focused on WrestleMania although they did do some simple promotion for the next week with Stone Cold being announced. 
TNA promoted absolutely nothing and barely even promoted their own pay-per-view. And the numbers were in. Raw did a 3.4, this is down from a 3.6 the previous week. TNA did a 0.98, down from a 1.5. And surprise, surprise, not promoting your show has paid off you then, TNA. Starting with Raw first this week. This show is billed as WrestleMania Rewind Week, and several massive matches have been announced as taking place this week. WrestleMania is two weeks away. Stone Cold out first, yes, that's good. Starting out the show with some energy this week. Stone Cold asking for beers and hyping up the crowd for WrestleMania. Stone Cold talks about WrestleMania 13 where he took on Bret Hart in the iconic match where Austin is shown in the sharpshooter in a pool of blood. He brings up that he had to face Bret Hart and Vince many times in his career and that he'll make sure Vince doesn't screw Bret in the contract signing later tonight. Then John Cena randomly interrupts Austin. Austin pretends he's going to stun at him and then randomly leaves. It feels a bit awkward. It turns out he's just here to take on the Big Show. Big Show struggles to get Cena up for the alley-oop in the early go and I still love that move though. Big Show's the clear heel here and he puts Cena in a submission. Big Show's really dominating the early going as he reverses a Cena scoop slam. Big Show then makes the obvious mistake of going to the top rope. Why would you try that Big Show? Cena telegraphs it. Cena then nails a top rope leg drop and goes to hit the five knuckle shuffle but Batista interrupts and makes his way to the ring. This allows Big Show to hit the choke slam but Cena kicks out. That would have been the finish in TNA. Big Show then cheats and manages to nail Cena with the knockout punch for the three. Batista mutters something to Cena in the ring, but doesn't attack him. Over on TNA, an orange Hummer pulls up with Abyss driving Hogan, RVD and Jeff Hardy and they walk into the backstage arena looking like the biggest group of misfits you'd have ever seen. Why would Abyss be driving the Hummer? AJ and Flair come out to the ring to start the show. AJ talks for a while making fun of Abyss for believing that the Hall of Fame ring is magical and also says he doesn't believe in Santa Claus. He then calls a person in the audience, Fat Boy. Then Flair gets on the mic and talks about his hatred of Hogan and Jeff Hardy and he beats himself in the head until he reopens his cup from last week. Jeff Hardy comes out but he doesn't have much to say. AJ says Hardy is nothing and hasn't done anything in TNA and sets up a match for Styles vs Hardy for the main event tonight. Flair then gets on the mic and says Hardy is a wannabe artist and he'll have to sniff enough paint to get high enough to beat AJ Styles tonight. Destination X is next week and I'd forgive you for forgetting that the main event for that show is Styles vs Abyss. Backstage, Bischoff is moaning at Foley for ruining the handicap match between Beer Money and Jeff Jarrett. Bischoff says Foley is a rubbish executive and they will be shaving him in the ring later tonight to fit the corporate image better. They also promote that later in the night Hogan will be confronting Sting. Let's switch back to WWE. Evan Bourne is in the ring. Sheamus comes out to take him on. Sheamus gets on the mic to tease cut a promo but then decks Evan Bourne with the mic and hits the bro kick and a powerbomb. The match never officially starts. Sheamus gets back on the mic and starts running down on the wrestlers Triple H has beaten in his career. Sheamus brings up how much he achieved in the first year of his career and that Sheamus has been looking forward to fighting Triple H all of his life. Sheamus says WrestleMania will be a turning point for Triple H as he's going to take his throne. To answer Triple H's question from last week, he does have the guts to face him. Stone Cold is shown backstage and Michaels walks up to him. Stone Cold says he thinks The Undertaker is going to beat Michaels at WrestleMania. Michael says he will prove that he has what it takes by beating up Jericho later on tonight. Jericho then suddenly appears in the office despite there being no door on that side. Jericho reminds him that he's the world champion but Michael says he would destroy him and walks off. Jericho tries to kiss Austin's ass but Stone Cold tells him to get lost. There is a poster in the back for a Stone Cold movie that I've never heard of. Not to go off the original script but come on why is Jericho back here? Just two shows ago he got kicked off Raw didn't he? Now he's back? Got to hold WWE to the same standards that we hold TNA. Back in the ring, Kelly Kelly makes her way to the ring. Maurice, the Divas Champion, comes out to face her. Lots of blonde hair flying about in this match. Didn't realise how tall Maurice is. Maurice is getting dominated by Kelly in the early game before Maurice randomly scores the French kiss and the match is over in less than a minute. You know, looking back, Kelly has to be one of the biggest letdowns in women's wrestling. She really was billed as being that generation's Trish Stratish, but she can never live up to it. Maybe they expected too much. Maurice kicks her in the ribs and then Gail Kim and Eve Torres run to the ring to beat her down. Then Lakel run out to the ring to clear house. Eve then attacks Layla and grabs her leg and the women's champion Michelle goes for a kick but she botches it and it looks very awkward. Vicky Guerrero is shown cheering them on. I have no idea what the women's match is supposed to be at Wrestlemania but this was confusing and I'm not sure what we're building to. Let's put Spike TV back on. Back on TNA, a recap video plays showing earlier today the Nasty Boys attacked Jesse Neal backstage in the Kota ring area. 
Trust the nasty boys to be in the catering area. Jesse Neal was brought into the company by Team 3D and they first started feuding on the January Monday Night Wars episode when they destroyed Team 3D's dressing room. A couple of weeks before this, Team 3D had defeated the nasty boys in a table match after Jesse Neal had gotten involved. This is all leading to a match back in the ring, but none of what I just mentioned is recapped. The nasty boys are on the mic and they're truly vile. I know that's kind of gimmick, but I just couldn't stand watching them. They say it'll be a handicap match with the Nasty Boys and Jimmy Hart taking on Team 3D as they have an injured third partner, Jesse Neal. I don't see how this was threatening as Jimmy Hart isn't a wrestler and 3D are three times his size. Well, it turns out Team 3D have got a replacement for Jesse Neal and they bring out Spike Dudley. Nice little return for him here. It's a terrible three minute match. Hart waits in the corner for what seems like forever to hit Team 3D with the biker helmet. I don't know how else they couldn't see him coming, everybody could. He then gives the helmet to Brian Nobbs who decks Bubba with the helmet when the ref is distracted to let Jimmy Hart cover Bubba for the free. The Nasty Boys then beat down 3D and T's putting them for a table win. When Jesse Neal runs out to fight them off and this leads to a free man 3D for a table on Jerry Sags. No offence but this looked terrible. So what happened to the Team 3D vs Nasty Boys feud? They should be fine at Destination X pay per view right? Wrong. The Nasty Boys got released from TNA a week after this after an incident involving Spike TV executives in the Hard Rock Cafe. What a complete waste of time. Everybody as dog knew these grotesque fat boys were only brought in because they were buddies with Hulk Hogan. When he wanted to bring in the Nasty Boys. Hmm. And bro, I remember the creative meeting where Ed Ferrara and Eric literally got in an argument. But bro, I could tell you, I mean... That was not Eric. Er Eric was just trying to do because Hulk wanted to do his buddies a favor and get his buddies a payday. So, you know, Eric was going along with it, but, but I knew Eric didn't really agree with it. But so now you're kind of getting in arguments, bro, of they want to bring in their own guys because they're working Dixie. All these guys are getting a payday. And that's when you really, really, really started seeing, uh, you, you really started seeing things break down at that point. Backstage, Angelina Love threatens the beautiful people after losing in the knockouts tag title match last week. She reminds them she was the original beautiful person and issues an open challenge to any member of the beautiful people to face her tonight. Elsewhere backstage, Borash interviews Hall and Pack about their upcoming match with Young and Nash at Destination X. If they can win that one, they'll get TNA contracts. Hall has a filthy looking TNA jumper on which someone has written Wolfpack on with a pen. It looks so low budget. Then Hall and Nash walk up and Nash laughs at Pack for losing to Eric Young last week. He then issues Hall an open challenge to face him in the ring tonight for $25,000 if he can last five minutes. God, is there not enough old wrestlers competing in the ring tonight? Hall says he'll be the one in the ring that looks like Elvis. I guess I'll see you at the pay-per-view. I'll be the one that looks like Elvis. See you out there, I'll be the one that looks like Elvis. <laughs> Remember... We probably need this health care. Pretty expensive nowadays. Mr. Anderson and Wolf make their way to the ring. They're facing the team of Kurt Angle and the Pope. They actually play a recap video of Mr. Anderson being assaulted by the soldiers last week. Surprising to see. Pope is selling his knee a lot more than last week. It starts out with Wolf and Angle. Wolf tries to tag out to Anderson, but he's playing the cowardly hill and refuses to tag in whilst Angle is fresh. He eventually tags in after Wolf has beaten Angle down. Lots of aggression shown by Mr. Anderson. I'm absolutely loving this feud. The Pope gets the tag and beats down Anderson Wolf despite being one-legged. And he almost gets the free after an STF. Angle then hits the angle slam on Anderson and Wolf. Then Wolf gets to work on the Pope's ankle but it's later reversed into a small package and Pope gets the free. What a depressing story Desmond Wolf in TNA is. It was definitely worthy of me making a video. A three minute match which could have used way more time. In the ring, Anderson hits the mic check on Angle and then violently cuts Angle's head open with the soldier's dog tag. He then gets on the mic and starts screaming in Angle's ear and bashing Angle in the head repeatedly with the mic. Angle looks like a dead body. I have never seen a wrestler look more dead than Kurt Angle did right here. If Mr. Anderson had spent the rest of his career in TNA like this, he would have gone down in memory as an excellent TNA signing. But unfortunately his star faded after the Kurt Angle feud ended. Back to Raw now. HBK comes to the ring to take on Chris Jericho in one of the big WrestleMania rematches tonight. Michael starts out as a house on fire and beats on Jericho until he's thrown over the top rope. Jericho now fully in control after hitting a guillotine and then putting the submission on. Michael spikes out of it but he's whipped into the corner and Y2J is back on top. Jericho's being his usual cocky self, eventually manages to catch Jericho and kips up. He reverses the walls into a small package before Jericho hits a bulldog and he's momentarily back on top before Michaels blocks the line sort of his knees. Top rope elbow from Michaels and he starts getting ready to hit sweet chin music. 
Jericho bails and runs from the ring and gets himself counted out. Edge then runs out to attack him. They'll be competing for the world title at WrestleMania. Edge hits the spear and celebrates. A shame this match was really starting to heat up as you would expect with the competitors involved, but it keeps both wrestlers from being pinned before their WrestleMania matches. Back in TNA, Hogan tells Jeff Hardy Abyss would be the special enforcer for the main event match against AJ tonight. Bischoff then comes in complaining that Hogan has signed Hardy and RVD without telling him. Well, that's a weird time to bring this up, considering Hardy was signed two months ago and appeared on the first Monday Night Wars episode. Bischoff then starts kissing Hogan's ass and apologising for not communicating better with him. He then walks off and Hogan calls him weird. Back in the ring and Angelina Love is set to face a member of the Beautiful People. Velvet gets on the mic and says that tonight Daphne is an honourable member of the Beautiful People and will be facing Angelina. Daphne attacks her from behind. The match is thrown out in seconds after the beautiful people interfere. Daphne pulls Angelina into the ring pole by her feet and Taz asks if that would actually hurt a woman. Daphne then slams her into the ring ramp. Tara then breaks up the attack and hits Madison with a widow's peak like she meant to the previous week. I don't understand why Daphne would even want to face Angelina. She's meant to be facing Tara at the pay-per-view. They recap the beating Sting gave RVD with the bat last week and then Hogan waddles out to the ring to address the Sting situation. Hogan brings up that Abyss was crying last week after he was attacked and said he needs to ask Sting why he did that. He says that Sting has stabbed Dixie Carter in the back and has lost everybody's trust. They search the rafters for Sting and then Sting takes a very long walk down to the ring. He looks blown up from this long walk. He's then attacked from behind by RVD and he kicks him all over the ring. RVD chucks the baseball bat to Hogan and Hogan makes out that he's going to beat on Sting with it. But then, what on earth? Eric Bischoff runs to the ring and he's screaming, don't do it. Bischoff tells Hogan off for his actions and reminds him that he's no longer a wrestler. Security then takes Sting away. Great, so RVD has once again been overshadowed by Hogan. Bischoff reminds Hogan that he promised he wouldn't be wrestling anymore and Brooke is shown crying in the crowd. God, I swear the only talent she has is crying. Let's turn back to Raw. They announced that at WrestleMania it'll be a triple threat match between Randy Orton, Ted DiBiase Jr. and Cody Rhodes. Matthews asks Orton how he's feeling about his match with Triple H later tonight. Orton says he doesn't like Triple H, but he respects him and takes him seriously. But he does not take Tony Rhodes and Ted DiBiase seriously, as they have never had to exist without him. He says at WrestleMania they're going to find out that without Orton, they're both just nothing. Yep, pretty much right, Orton. The game comes to the ring to take on Orton. Triple H is in control early on, hitting a knee before Orton throws Triple H over the top rope. He then goes for the vicious DDT off the ropes, but Triple H reverses it before throwing Orton over the ropes and into the ring stairs. He then goes for the vicious DDT again off the steps and hits it this time on the outside. The commentary team barely acknowledge it. Orton is now in complete control of the match, hitting a bat breaker and looking to hit the RKO. Triple H dodges it and hits the clothesline. Both wrestlers are now trading punches, but a running knee downs Orton. Very back and forth match. Orton gets a two count from a side slam before Triple H then hits the spine buster. He then goes for the pedigree, but Orton counters. The commentators build up how well Orton and the game know each other. Triple H then nails the pedigree for the ropes, but Legacy run in and attack both wrestlers. This was going great and was match of the night to this point, so I wish Legacy would just get lost. Triple H gets in the ring and attacks them, but then Sheamus runs in and kicks Triple H's head in. Legacy dragged Triple H outside and Cody Rhodes hits a crossroads on Orton outside the ring. All the heels stand dominant over their WrestleMania opponents, with young superstars seemingly ready for WrestleMania. Let's change the channel back to the Hulk Hogan show. Backstage, and Jeff is walking along before Hernandez interrupts him and says he wants to help Jarrett out. Bischoff is shown spying on them, tells them off, and puts Hernandez in a handicap match with beer money. Bischoff reminds Jarrett once again that he doesn't run the company. He then makes Jeff the special referee for the match and threatens him not to screw up the match tonight. My first interaction with Eric Bischoff, he comes up to me and goes, Hey, Sean, how are you doing? He goes, Are you six foot tall? He goes, sir, I'm like six one, six two. He goes, Oh, you don't look it. I'm like... <laughs> I, I just knew this, you know, if someone, if this is your first interaction with someone and that's what they tell you, that life is not going to be good. <laughs> Up next, and Kevin Nash is out for the five minute, $25,000 challenge with Scott Hall, who is already in the ring. Scott Hall is still wearing his dodgy Wolfpack t-shirt. He looks like a homeless scrub. Makes me sad to see the bad guy look this way. This crowd are absolutely dead and you can hear a pin drop. Nash eventually knocks Hall down. Today reminds us there is only four minutes left of the match. Thanks, I wish it was less. Pack then runs in and clips Kevin Nash. Apparently it's no DQ. They handcuff Nash to the ropes and beat him down. Eric Young then runs out, but the numbers advantage catches him up. 
Who hits one of the worst slow motion punches I've ever seen? What was the point in the match, the money or the five minute stipulation? What was the point in the match, the money or the five minute stipulation? Beer Money is then moaning backstage about their lack of TV time. Storm says Bischoff has given them an opportunity tonight to get back on TV by bullying Jeff Jarrett. Storm says from now on it's all about making cash and getting trashed. Jarrett comes to the ring with no ring music and looking miserable. Beer Money out to the ring now for the handicap match against Hernandez. Hernandez is apparently the tag team champion. I had to look that up. His partner is Matt Morgan. They've barely been on the show. Morgan then makes his way to the ring but then changes his mind and goes to the commentary desk. Morgan and Hernandez are partners who don't get on very well and Morgan has a history of screwing his own tag team partners. Apparently they're defending the titles of the pay-per-view but they refuse to say who they're facing. Probably Beer Money. That would at least make some sense. Beer Money are dominating until Hernandez makes a lovely comeback. He reverses the Beer Money suplex and Morgan says he can't be bothered to watch anymore and heads backstage. Hernandez eats the last cool super kick from Storm and then he's beaten by the DWI. Beer Money asks Jeff to raise their hands in victory and they beat down on Hernandez once more. They realise that Morgan has deserted his partner and they push Jarrett over and this causes him to snap and attack them. What trouble will this get Jarrett in with Bischoff? Let's switch back to Raw. They're hyping up the Hall of Fame induction for this year and it will be featuring Ted DiBiase Sr. and Antonio Inoki amongst others. They play a hype package for Gorgeous George who will be the next to be the Hall of Fame inductee. WWE are full on hyping WrestleMania once again as they should. Batista makes his way to the ring. He looks very confident ahead of his WrestleMania match against Cena. Kofi makes his way out to the ring. He got involved in Batista's attack on Cena last week. Batista does not look impressed in Kofi. Batista's not going off his feet early on. Kingston's trying everything he can and eventually does manage to kick him down. Batista bails to the outside and then dodges Kofi and beats him down. Kofi goes for the springboard move but gets caught with a clothesline and Batista hits a spine buster and the power bombs to score the three in a quick dominant victory. Despite being dominant though, Batista is busted open by Kofi. Batista sees an obese Cena fan in the crowd and he pretends he's going to hit him and the fat boy sits down terrified. They then show that Pete Rose will be the next guest host. Wonder if Kane will be involved. They announce a handicap match for next week. Triple H and Autumn will be taking on Legacy and Sheamus. Let's put TNA back on. Bischoff is shown backstage next walking along with some trimmers. In the ring, Bischoff says he'll get his revenge on Jarrett next week but now he needs to deal with Foley and he calls him out for his haircut. Bischoff goes to cut Foley's hair, but then Foley pulls Soccer out and then chokes him in the barbershop chair. Foley grabs the clippers and shaves Bischoff's greasy long locks off. Bischoff then wakes up and his face swells up red with anger. I'm getting sick of seeing Bischoff, he's been on the show more than Hogan. Jeff Hardy's weird stoner friend is backstage with Christy Hemi and I think he threatens Douglas Williams for the pay-per-view. I don't know, he chatted some rubbish. The Motor City Machine Guns are in the ring now, hyping the return of the Ultimate X match. I wish they were the tag champs. They're facing Jen Mee at the pay-per-view. And out they come, two skinny Hardy Boy rip-offs. Jen Mee says the guns should be scared because they beat them in their debut match. Shelly says they're like an Xbox game and Jen Mee are like Ataris. Shelly then says, let's talk about the night we spent with your girlfriends and the Bucks lose it and attack. Surely these two guys didn't even have girlfriends. Then Brian Kendrick joins in the attack and then Amazing Red attacks and is soon followed by Kaz and Daniels. All the X Division guys are flying around the ring. Amazing Red does a crazy dive off the top of the ladder onto some guys. Four guys celebrate in the ring. I'm so confused now. I thought the guns were good guys. And even more, I thought it was the guns versus Generation Me. But this segment made me think it's all these guys in the X Division match together. Backstage, Abyss accuses AJ of being jealous of him and says, What are you going to do when Abyss runs wild on you, AJ? Just shut up, Abyss. I'm sorry. I'm really not enjoying this episode of TNA. A great time to switch back to catch the last part of Raw. <laughs> Bret Hart comes out for his contract signing with Vince McMahon. He's on crutches and he's still selling his leg from the limo crash. Vince is very angry and glares at Bret. Hart doesn't look too bothered, he's just chilling in his chair. Austin comes out next to supervise proceedings. Austin says he needs to take care of some other business before the contract signing. He says Stu Hart, Bret's dad, has been blocked from being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Stone Cold says he will be inducting Stu Hart and Vince is kind of happy about this. He says as the whole Hart family will be there that night. Brett will lose in front of the whole dysfunctional Hart family. Brett says he doesn't care if both his legs are broken. He could still beat Vince. Brett makes it a no holds barred match. And Vince says Brett is screwing himself once again by choosing this type of match. Brett and Vince both sign the contract and Stone Cold announces the match is now official. Austin goes to leave but then turns around confused and says Brett has something else he needs to tell Vince. As the camera pans back to Brett, the leg cast is lying on the table and Brett shows us that his leg is fine. He reveals that the whole thing was just a setup and he was never run over and his leg is 100%. Hart 
Hart says that Vince screwed Vince and punches Vince over the table and hits him with the cast. I have to admit, I was slightly disappointed that Vince didn't get a stunner tonight. It feels like this should happen whenever Austin is on the show. A good way to end the show, though. I enjoyed Bret Hart's trickery, and it'll be interesting to see what Vince will do next time. Time to catch the TNA main event. Abyss is coming out to the ring with his weird Hulk Hogan theme music. I hope AJ chooses to batter him instead of Jeff Hardy. Here comes AJ in his dressing gown with Flair following him to the ring. I've gotten so used to seeing Flair covered in blood that it looks weird when he's not bleeding. Jeff comes out for his first match back in TNA against AJ. I can't believe they're giving this match away for free. Hardy's dominating here in the early gun, hitting a leg drop. Eventually AJ tosses him to the outside and Flair looks to attack him, but Fatty Abyss stops him. AJ teases that he's going to dive over the top rope, but doesn't do it and mocks the fans. AJ's resting this match in quite a nice heelish way. A lot of people say AJ didn't change his style as a heel, but I'd say they're wrong based on this. Abyss is still watching the match in his McDonald's outfit, whilst AJ snaps Hardy across the ropes. Hardy eventually fights back here in a front suplex, but AJ quickly fights back with a brain buster that a certain Austin Aries would be proud of. Hardy kicks out and fights back with a whisper in the wind, but AJ kicks out. He goes for the twist of fate, which AJ reverses into a Pele kick. AJ then accidentally takes out the referee of a springboard. He then rolls out to the floor to get a steel chair, but Abyss blocks him, wagging his fat finger at him. AJ misses a 450 and Jeff Hardy hits the twist of fate and a swanton bomb. Abyss rolls into the ring to count the pin. Just get lost, Abyss. I'm sick of seeing him. Is he a monster or is he just a Hogan fanboy? Abyss hulks up after Flair hits him with some weak chair shots and then Abyss choke slams Flair through the ramp. AJ looks terrified. Okay, very good, but did we really need Jeff Hardy to beat AJ? What was the point in that? It's not even like Abyss screwed him. He just got beaten cleanly. Then the show ends suddenly. Not as bad as last week, but close enough to almost miss the choke slam on Flair. A bad episode of Impact, it has to be said, and I still don't know what half the matches are at the pay-per-view because they didn't run down anything in any way. Way too much Eric Bischoff on the show and only one good wrestling match. WWE had several good matches and lots of WrestleMania build whilst effectively promoting Stone Cold's appearance on the show. No offence, but this isn't looking good for TNA. They got battered this week. Let's check the ratings for tonight. Here they are, the ratings are in. WWE scored a 3.71. Wow, massively up on last week. That's the Stone Cold effect right there. TNA promoted basically nothing for this show. Let's see. Yup, 0.84. That's shocking. This is now far less than their normal crowd when they're on Thursdays. I had a feeling this wasn't going to be a good week for them. It looks like any Raw viewers who had switched to TNA have now switched back to Raw. And it was a much better show, so I don't blame them. RVD did basically nothing on this show. What was the point in bringing him in last week? Far too many old men on TNA and only one good feud in Angle and Anderson. And that's the end of this episode. I reckon those Spike TV executives are starting to get a bit twitchy. Impact starts out with Eric Bischoff in the middle of the ring playing the guitar. What is wrong with them? Are they trying to get people to change the channel? I would rather jump out of a moving car into a herd of incoming alpacas with foot and mouth disease than sit here and watch this idiot in his cheap TNA hat that looks like something a two year old would wear. I'm starting with Raw, fuck this. It's the last episode of Raw before WrestleMania 26. HBK comes out first to hype his new DVD and his match against The Undertaker at WrestleMania. He says there will be a lot more DVDs to come because he won't be losing this match and be forced to retire. Then the arena goes dark and the video starts playing displaying all of HBK's career highlights and his performances at WrestleMania and then a memorial to the end of his career and the crowd cheer at this. Wow, for a demon zombie-like character, The Undertaker sure has some good video editing skills. Michael says he's not scared and tells The Undertaker to come and say it to his face. He's interrupted though by some cheesy music and our guest host for the evening is Pete Rose coming out. Pete Rose backs Michaels for WrestleMania and the crowd boo. Rose looks confused and puts Michaels in a match against Kane tonight. He asks Michaels to get revenge on Kane for all the attacks he's made on Rose over the years. First time of hearing Kane mentioned on this series, I'm not even sure what he's doing at WrestleMania. Next up, a hype package plays about how Batista broke Cena's neck a while back. The two will have a final face-off later tonight. Show Miz out next now. Miz is the unified tag team champion and the US champion. Miz is the first wrestler to hold three belts at the same time. Miz is basically 40 now. Let me know if you're happy with how his career turned out or if you think he got more than he deserved. His opponent tonight is John Morrison, his former tag team partner, although they barely mention this for some reason despite the two tagging together for years. Big Show and Truth are both on commentary for the match. We get a surprisingly good TV match here. Morrison with a nice jump to the outside, but when they come back from the ad break, Miz is on top. Morrison with a close two. Our truth says on commentary that Show Miz is not a real tag team and he is a real tag team. I'm pretty sure they've been together for three weeks, so he can shut up. Morrison dominates the rest of the match and almost beats Miz again. 
Morrison then hits a power bomb from the top and follows up with the Starship Pain for the free. A quick dominant win for Morrison. Maybe he should challenge for the US title instead. Big Show tries to attack the High Flyers, but they baseball slide him and make their escape. Show looks like he's dropping his guts in anger. This is the best Raw I've seen so far in this series, and the WrestleMania build-up is great. Let's switch back to the Hulk Hogan show and see how they're getting on. Okay, so after Eric finished his driving away another 50,000 fans who thought they had tuned into America's Got No Talent by mistake, I kid you not, a minute and a half wasted on this guitar rubbish when Samoa and Joe can't even get on the show. Eric says he's a classically trained musician and Bischoff takes offence that Jeff Jarrett uses his guitar as a prop. No, not this feud again. This is a very bad start to the show. Jeff wasn't even on the Destination X pay-per-view last night. How about hearing from someone who won a match like AJ on the Motor City Machine Guns? Bischoff challenges Jeff to play the guitar against him. He asks if the crowd want to hear Jeff play the guitar and the fans boo. Jarrett dodges the request and instead threatens Bischoff for trying to humiliate him. Jeff acts like he's going to hit Bischoff with the guitar, but he's too much of a wimp. Bischoff then makes fun of Jeff for not being in charge of TNA anymore, and this causes Jeff to whack him with the guitar. There will be consequences for Jeff, but I'm not sure anyone cares. Foley celebrates backstage with Jarrett, who's also been getting bullied by Bischoff. Foley was the executive shareholder before Bischoff and Hogan came into the company. Back in the ring, Eric scrambles to his feet and threatens Jarrett and Foley with the sack, but instead puts them in a match against each other where the loser gets fired from TNA and the winner will have to be Bischoff's bitch. Backstage, the old men start sulking. It's now been 12 minutes with no one under the age of 50 on the screen. Oh look, it's the Knockouts Tag Team Champions who won the belts for the first time last night. I actually made a whole video on those belts. They're tagging up with Daphne who lost her match for the main title, but she helped the beautiful people win theirs. Daphne did still poison the tarantula at the end of the match. Daphne threatens to stomp on the tarantula, which brings Tara out to the ring. I'm sure there's people who pay good money to watch that. Tara is joined by Taylor, Sarita and Angelina Love. They wrestle for a little bit, but then Daphne brings the tarantula into the match to taunt Tara, which revives her. This match is weird because Tara is the champion, but the heels single her out. The wrestlers then all start hitting their finishers, or at least I think they are. Velvet does a DDT. Taylor does a Northern Light Suplex and Madison nearly kills the spider. Earl saves the spider. Madison uses her knee for her finisher. Then Sarita hits a double underhook powerbomb. Lacey hits a choke slam. I could barely say that on the straight face. And then Tara then kills her with the Widow's Peak and tries to save the spider. But Daphne runs back in and hits a Fisherman's Buster and pins her for the free. I actually forgot the match was still going. One of the biggest wins of Daphne's career in TNA. She steals the spider again, that poor creature. I'm surprised TNA didn't have any problems with the animal charities because that spider is being tortured. Backstage, Ric Flair is being lowered from a mobility van in a wheelchair. I'm changing the channel. Triple H is tagging up with Orton tonight to take on Legacy and Sheamus. Triple H threatens him and says he better have his back because he can't forget their past. They hype the Batista vs Cena face off again for later tonight. Back into the show is a zoomed in shot of Jack Swagger's face. I almost changed the channel. This will be a Money in the Bank qualifier match against Kofi Kingston. He got beaten up by Batista last week. His opponent will be Vladimir Kozlov. Kofi looks terrified. Look at the shape Kozlov is in here. They really should have done something better with this guy. I think he deserved a bit more love. Kozlov throws Kingston about like a ragdoll. He then hits a fall away slam. Shout out the one who looks like Elvis. Kozlov then dumps Kingston on the top rope and batters him. Swagger on commentary is terrible. He has no enthusiasm or character. He can barely speak. It's embarrassing. No wonder he never made it big in WWE. They pushed him with a thousand gimmicks, but he couldn't get over. Kofi connects with the trouble in paradise and wins. I feel sorry for Kozlov. Mind you, it was never in doubt. Kofi was obviously going to be in the Money in the Bank ladder match. Stu Hart is hyped as the next Hall of Fame inductee. We learned this from last week's Raw where Stone Cold went behind Vince's back to get him on the list. Legacy out next. The only good thing about them is their theme music. They both get on the mic and talk about Randy Orton. At WrestleMania, it'll be a triple threat, but Legacy say they don't care which one of them wins. Then they make a few sly jabs at each other. Cody is much better than Ted on the mic. They both sound sort of nerdy here. Sheamus comes out and he'll be teaming up with Legacy. They take on Orton and Triple H here in a handicap match. Triple H is hesitant to work with Randy Orton and doesn't want to tag him in. It costs him and it allows the youngsters to get on top of Triple H, but eventually Triple H hits a spinebuster on Cody Rhodes. Triple H decides to tag Orton in this time. Orton clears house with some clotheslines and scoop slams. This is the definition of a hot tag, ladies and gentlemen. Orton gets ready to hit Sheamus with the RKO, but Cody sneaks in. Orton sees him and grabs him for the DDT. When out of nowhere, Sheamus hits Orton in the head with a bro kick for the free. Orton's on a bit of a losing streak before Mania. 
If you ask me, Legacy have nothing to worry about. Sheamus tries to attack Triple H, but he gets clotheslined over the top rope. Lots of great in-ring stuff tonight. I'm really enjoying the show. Let's see if the mobility van has finished unloading Flair's wheelchair. Backstage, Flair is wheeling himself to the van and AJ is on a crutch. They look completely goofy and AJ doesn't look like a champion. He looks like a cartoon character. A promo play showing how AJ won at the pay-per-view last night due to a best choke slamming AJ through the ring causing the match to get thrown out. So I guess he didn't win. Hogan and Abyss out next. Some people have been upset with me over my treatment of Abyss. I promise you I will try to go easier on him tonight. You know, isn't it weird how Hogan and Abyss are together? Isn't Abyss the type of character that Hogan spent most of his career beating? You know, big, fat and ugly. Oh, for God's sake. Sorry, Abyss. This crowd loves the Hawkster so much he can barely speak, so he tells them to listen to him. Hogan starts kissing Bischoff's ass. You know what else is weird? Bischoff is a clear heel here, but he's friends with Hogan, who is a good guy. Hogan says he's going to get the company back on track for the 50th time. He says that Lockdown Abyss will be the captain of Team Hogan versus Team Flair. Abyss says he hopes Flair and AJ have stayed at home tonight. No, you idiot. They arrived about 10 minutes ago. Didn't anyone tell you? Abyss thanks his ring for giving him the power of the chokeslam and threatens Flair, so I guess he's going after Flair now instead of AJ. He then makes a threat, but nobody understands him, and this kills the crowd. So what you gonna do when Abyssomania runs fatal on you? What an idiot. You can't even talk now. Flair comes out of AJ and Chelsea, who is Desmond Wolf's manager. Flair says they can't be beaten because they are wrestling gods. Randomly, Flair then says his team captain will be Sting. I thought it was going to be Flair. Okay, random. Sting has been against Hogan and beat up his friend RVD. Hogan gets handcuffed while Abyss gets beaten down. The Pope then randomly runs out. Okay, it was sort of random. I forgot his match last night was to be the number one contender for the world title. He beat Desmond Wolf. Abyss then clotheslines Flair out of his wheelchair. Pope would have been better off away from Hogan. He was cool because he was a street preacher. Backstage, the Stoner crew then turn up and flirt of Hemi. I don't know, they all muttered a couple of words at her. They were hype. Next up, it's Tomko in the ring. Whoa, I can barely keep up. When did Tomko join TNA? Where's he been? He was the masked moron in episode one. Oh God, it's Rob Terry. This is going to be bad. It went two minutes and a spin kick and a spine buster. The exact same match as last night on the pay-per-view against Magnus. The man with the worst haircut in the world celebrates. Backstage, Foley is walking towards the ring for a match. Let's switch over to the ring. Bret Hart is shown stomping backstage. He certainly got one over on Vince McMahon last week as he tricked him into signing for a match as he thought Bret had a broken leg. Bret says he's tired of hearing Bret scoot Bret and he gets the crowd chatting Bret beat Vince. He says WrestleMania is his chance to right his wrongs and leave the WWE with his head held high. Hart hopes that all of his family members will be at WrestleMania. Bret lists all his accomplishments. This promo is really dragging though and it's the low point of this show. Vince McMahon then walks out and says one way or another you're screwed. Thanks for coming Vince, you needn't have bothered. Shawn Michaels is backstage walking along and Pete Rose wishes him luck. I wonder if Shawn knows who he is. Rose is a pretty low-key guest host. I wish they'd all been that way. What was your name of the bad guy from Toronto? Ah, she's going That was a pretty dull 15 minutes of television. Let's find out how Jarrett and Foley get on in their match. Back to Spike TV we go. Beer Money are backstage in referee outfits. Apparently they're both refereeing Jarrett versus Foley. They lost at the pay-per-view last night and this was a bad period in their TNA run. They had nothing for them. They then waste another five minutes playing a video about how Jeff Jarrett and Foley hate Bischoff. You don't need a package to explain that. Most people do. Foley shaved Bischoff's head and Jarrett is the former owner so he can't accept his new role in TNA. There, I explained it in 10 seconds. They then have an interview about it. They basically kiss each other's asses. Here comes Storm and Rude. Hopefully Storm will do something funny to make this bearable. Jarrett doesn't get any music, but he does get a little introduction showing him as a 10-time world champion. Jesus, 10 times. Why take away his theme music but still list his accomplishments? Foley is battering Jarrett for the first few minutes. Jarrett looks for the stroke and then Rude grabs Jarrett's leg, which allows Foley to get back on top. Eric Bischoff then comes out to do commentary because we haven't seen enough of him tonight. There is a sign saying really awful wrestling. There's also a sign saying, where is Samoa Joe? That's a good point. He was either kidnapped by the ninjas or it was the other time he disappeared. Jarrett then hits the stroke on the chair and Beer Money count the win. Foley is fired. Bischoff laughs and says at least he can't complain he was fired by FedEx. In reality, Foley had just made too many appearances and was costing TNA too much money. He would be back in four months to take part in the ECW invasion. The two old men then cry and Foley leaves. Eric then asks Beer Money to beat up Jeff Jarrett. 
The stoner crew then run out to save Jarrett. Actually, they all don't. Shannon Moore is missing. He wasn't enough of a rating draw to run to the ring. They challenge Beer Money to a match later on tonight. Foley's then saying goodbye to everyone, but Bubba Love Sponge gets in his face. Bubba is booed loudly by the crowd. Bubba had recently made comments about Haiti and had caused problems with Awesome Kong. Hey, it's Bubba Love Sponge. Mick Foley, your last match ever with TNA Wrestling. Let's talk about it, kiddo. I'd rather not. Now's not the time. Okay, hey, Bubba? Uh, it's now, it's, that's not the time. There's a list of people I'd like to talk to. You'd be very last on that list, okay, pal? Foley legit gives Bubba a black eye when he smacks him out. Backstage, Hogan tells Bischoff to leave Jarrett alone because he's getting over with the fans lately. Well, it's about time. It's only been 20 years. Change the station. Back on Raw, HBK is coming out to the ring. He looks confident as normal. I'm interested to see what Kane is up to at this point as I haven't seen him much during these Monday Night War episodes. He must be on SmackDown. Kane starts to dominate against Michaels with a big boot and hanging suplex. Then a corner clothesline, lots of brutal punches. Kane then goes for a top rope clothesline, but Michaels tries to turn it into a cross face or an armbar, but it looked awkward. Kane goes for the choke slam, but Michaels reverses it into another awkward submission. Michaels then gets Kane off his feet and kips up. He scores with a top rope elbow and sets Kane up for sweet chin music. Suddenly the arena goes dark and you can hear the Undertaker's dong sound. He appears in the ring and choke slams Michaels. It then goes dark again and he disappears. Kane looks confused and goes for the pin. The crowd are confused. Why was that not a disqualification? Anyways, Michaels kicks out and hits Kane with the sweet chin music to the free. Damn, Kane was a jobber at this point. I don't even know if he's got a match at WrestleMania. Michael sends a good message to The Undertaker. Little bit of a sloppy match here, probably the worst of the night. There's build up for SmackDown this week. All the Money in the Bank competitors will be in a big match. Oh look, there's Kane. Good luck in your match, Glenn. Raw then spends the next five minutes building up WrestleMania. They show most of the matches that will be happening. In the back, Pete Rose is there with O. It's Christian. They laugh about how Kane lost tonight. Kane then appears and drags Pete Rose into the dressing room and locks the door. There's lots of thudding noises and Christian pulls silly faces. I wonder what Kane did to him in there. In the ring, Beth Phoenix is with Gail Kim and Eve Torres. Kelly Kelly and Mickey James are also there. Maurice is teaming up with Layla and Michelle McCool. They are a cheap, beautiful people knockoff. Alicia Fox is also at ringside. The women have been treated like absolute trash in all my episodes. Just like my last war episode, Gail Kim is doing some amazing wrestling at the start of the match. And she manages a beautiful counter into the pin, but then, bam, Styles Clash by Michelle McCool for the free. That match was one minute long. I feel sorry for Gail Kim. It's no wonder she went back to TNA when women's wrestling was treated slightly more seriously at this time. Let's switch back to Spike TV. Beer Money are backstage explaining why they're working for Eric Bischoff. Storm says the fans are stupid and says sorry about your damn luck while doing the RVD finger point thing. Storm's funny. Suddenly I can hear Don West's voice as he tries to flog some merchandise. Miss you, DW. JB is interviewing RVD and Jeff Hardy, two thirds of the stoner crew. Where has Shannon come? He must have felt so rejected not being allowed on telly. They say they're win and they aren't scared. There's literally no way Beer Money are beating Hardy and RVD tonight. Then it plays a package about how Matt Morgan and Hernandez don't like each other. They are tag team champions who don't get on. Last night at the pay-per-view, Morgan kicked Hernandez after they won their match. They're going to settle their differences tonight in a match. Morgan comes out of both tag belts, but is jumped during his entrance by Hernandez. Hernandez beats Morgan around the ring for a while. These are two guys who have both flirted with the main event, but never quite made it. Morgan then starts pleading and begging. What an absolute idiot. It's no wonder he never made it as a big man wrestler. Hernandez is battering him. Morgan hasn't done anything until he throws Hernandez to the outside. Morgan then goes out there and damn, kicks Hernandez's head into the ring pole. Damn, son, brutal. To be fair, I actually remember this. It's quite a big moment. Hernandez is taken off on a stretcher. The comedy team do their sad voices. Homicide even comes out to help his friend. I forgot Homicide was still in TNA at this point. Do you know what would have been better than Matt Morgan as the tag team champion? How about an LAX reunion? If you want to see more about this, watch my video on Matt Morgan's failed run as a main eventer as this is leading up to a concussion storyline. There he is, I've finally spotted Jeff Hardy's stoner friend. He is still in the building, I'm satisfied now. Back to Raw we go. The guest host next week will be the Hot Tub Time Machine guys. The world champion Batista then comes out surrounded by some geeks. Batista then gets on the mic and says, say hello to the bad guy. He then threatens Cena and says he doesn't have a chance at Mania. Batista does some bad impressions of John Cena. Batista again calls himself the bad guy. Batista says he hates the fans and sees them all as money, and in some cases a lot of money, as some of the audience are very fat and had to pay for two seats each. Batista seems to be doing more hating on obese people than me on these shows. Batista then calls out Cena, who looks very hurt at Batista's comments. 
Batista is hiding behind security for some reason. Cena says he has disappointed everyone and let them down. The crowd chant, you can't wrestle, and Cena looks like he's going to cry. Cena is very doubtful about his chances at Mania, and Batista looks very pleased with himself. Cena says he's sick and tired of this garbage. Then he changes his mind and says he's not scared anymore, and this upsets David. Cena says at WrestleMania he's taking back the title. Cena and Batista then come to blows, and security struggle to separate the two. Batista then walks off, and it's over. Kind of a dumb ending to the show. Cena was scared of Batista and Sonny wasn't. What kind of rubbish is that? Anyway, let's catch the last bit of TNA. There's a promo for the band up next. They won TNA contracts at Destination X last night and turned on Eric Young. Then nothing happens and Beer Money come out instead. Damn, I thought Scott Hall was going to cut another promo about how he looks like Elvis. The Stoner crew out next. No Job Rob and Nero Hardy. There's no way that Beer Money are going to win this match. Mike Tanay says they have it confirmed by the network that we'll stick with this match until the end. Well, I hope so because we've had precious little wrestling tonight. Tanay says Beer Money are the best tag team in the world, despite last night on pay-per-view when they couldn't beat Morgan and Hernandez who were fighting each other at the same time. Van Damme with some impressive moves. This was the start of his TNA run, so he was a bit more motivated. Beer Money try to isolate RVD, but he comes back almost straight away. Hardy then starts battering Storm with his trademark moves, but he gets cut off when he attempts to whisper in the wind. The commentary announced that next week Daphne and Tara will be fighting in a first blood match. Why doesn't Daphne just give the damn spider back? Why are we focusing so much on a spider? Isn't Tara the knockouts champion? Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. There's a match going on. In the ring, Brood hits the double R spinebuster for the two. Jeff is sort of isolated until there's a double down. Hardy then still can't make the tag as Beer Money starts cheating to isolate Hardy more until the whisper in the wind connects on Storm and RVD finally gets tagged in. He's battering both members of Beer Money and almost scores the free on Rude, but it's broken up by Storm. Split-legged moonsault by RVD. Then there's some confusion and RVD ruins the Beer Money suplex. RVD then kicks out the DWI. This is supposed to be Beer Money's finisher, but nobody acts like it. Hardy then hits Rude with a twist of fate, but Storm drags Hardy out and slides under a ladder which was set up earlier and drives it into Storm's face. Back in the ring, the rolling thunder by RVD and a five-star frog splash by RVD to put away Robert Rude. As a fan of Beer Money, I find this match completely offensive. I saw it coming, and I knew Beer Money wouldn't win, but why put them in this place in the first place? Why couldn't they beat up a team who doesn't matter? In fact, couldn't they have beaten up Matt Morgan and Hernandez? It wouldn't have exactly... It would have had exactly the same outcome. Then Eric Young runs into the ring. Okay, that's intriguing. You've got my attention, TNA. Young looks like a heel, but says next week the main event will be Hardy, RVD, and EY versus the band. EY looks weird standing between Hardy and RVD. They hold their hands in the air so long that Jeff Hardy forgets to put his arms down. One of the few moments I found funny on this show. A bad episode of Impact. The main event was good. Nothing else was. Entirely too much Eric Bischoff and other old men. I don't care about Eric Bischoff for you with Foley and Jarrett. Fans would have been tuning out in numbers. There was nothing keeping anyone from changing the channel. You know, I'm starting to think that this TNA Monday Night War was missing a big storyline to keep people intrigued. Maybe the Aces and Eights would have worked better if it had taken place around this time. Anyway, that's it. It's over for another week. To sum up my thoughts, I thought Raw was a much better show once again. This is becoming a bit of a trend. The Raw show did decline as it went on, but there was much more wrestling and the promos were all building up matches for WrestleMania. No time was really wasted except the Bret Hart promo which dragged on a bit. TNA was really bad. A bunch of sad old wrestlers again who would have been better off in an old people's home. A spider was almost murdered and only one proper match. You can see why people were changing the channel at this time. So let's catch the ratings and they're in. Wow, shocker. Raw is down to 3.2, the lowest of the Monday Night Wars. Impact is actually up slightly to 0.86. I wonder how those viewers who came back to TNA feel after this show. Okay, we've made it to the halfway point. It's the 29th of March 2010 and this is episode 5. We're going to start with TNA first this week, so let's do it. The show opens with a recap of Jarrett and Foley feuding with Bischoff. Foley was kayfabe fired last week after losing to Jarrett. Foley wasn't actually fired. TNA just couldn't afford him. Jarrett is in Bischoff's office and he apologises to Eric how his... Jarrett is in Bischoff's office and Hogan apologises for how Eric has treated Jarrett recently. Hogan gives him a number one contendership match if he can beat AJ Styles tonight. Hogan says that this is due to the fan support for Jarrett recently. He said he was also proud of how professionally he handled Bischoff. Well, if you count smashing your boss over the head of a guitar as professional. Jay Lethal then barges in doing his Macho Man impression. We haven't seen Lethal in this series. Lethal offers to team up with Hogan tonight to recreate the Mega Powers. I don't understand what this is leading up to. It wasn't explained. 
They announced that Tara will take on Daphne in a first blood match for the first time ever. The band's music hits and the first person who appears is Bubba the Love Sponge. Well, this is going to be another bad episode. The crowd chant Fire Bubba. He's accompanied to the ring by Pac, Nash and the one who looks like Elvis. Bubba comes out and says he doesn't need this job and runs down Jeremy Borash. Bubba is trying to hide his broken nose from being smacked out legitimately by Mick Foley last week. Bubba makes fun of Eric Young and hands the mic to Nash. He calls out Eric Young as he wants to apologise for turning on him during the tag match at the pay-per-view. Nash says Young is actually his friend and his attack was not personal and he had to do it so his friends could win the match at the pay-per-view to receive contracts. Nash offers Eric Young a chance to join the band. Young is supposed to be teamed with Hardy and RVD in a six-man tag tonight against the band. Nash tells Young to throw one up and join the band, but Young attacks Nash. All three members of the band get some punches in and then RVD and Jeff Hardy run out to make the save and the band bail. Why did TNA decide to make that fat tub of love Bubba the Love Sponge the mouthpiece for the band? Who and Nash are more than capable of talking on the mic and certainly don't need any help from this moron. Hardy says the six-man tag match tonight will be in a cage. He then starts singing his theme song and sounds stupid and the band look confused. Douglas Williams out next and he'll be teaming with Brian Kendrick but he doesn't look too happy about this. Williams retained his X Division title over Jeff Hardy's stoner friend at the pay-per-view. After the match, he cut a promo running down all the high flyers. Out he comes, and he's teaming with Kazarian, who won the number one contendership for the X Division title at the pay-per-view. Kazarian with a couple of close falls on Doug before he tags Kendrick in, who also gets beaten down by Kazarian. I'm glad Kazarian is the number one contender, as he's over with the fans here. Williams then starts slowing down the pace of the match. Then he does that move that Madison Rain does. I prefer it a little bit more when Madison does it. There's a mid-ring collision, and this gives Kaz the chance to tag in Jeff's friend. He's a house on fire and takes out Kendrick Williams and hits a top rope Hurricanrana for a close two. They connect with a lovely double team which takes out Kendrick but they're unable to make the cover. Moore then hits some sort of move on Brian Kendrick and gets the free. Not a bad match but seriously TNA why are we still pushing Jeff Hardy's stoner friend it's Kazarian who's the number one contender. Shannon Moore then puts makeup all over Kendrick just like Williams did at the pay-per-view. Williams just walks away because nobody cares about Brian Kendrick and it doesn't affect him. Backstage, Eric Bischoff is on the phone saying somebody is ribbing him and tells them to have fun in New York. He's also sniffing something that looks like a large pen? I don't know, you tell me. It's a cigar, alright. I get it. Miss Tessmarker then makes her first TNA appearance as Bischoff's assistant. Eric warns her that he needs to guard his door tonight. Can't he just hire some security? Lethal then barges in and tells Eric he needs to be the third member of the Mega Powers. Lethal has written down a card of a load of 80s wrestlers, but Eric tells him to leave and come up with a sensible main event. Why is Lethal booking the main event? <laughs> Bischoff then tells Tessmarker to fetch beer money for him. Let's check out Raw. Okay, it's the first Raw since WrestleMania. This one is usually a good show and draws in the viewers. This show is being built as Shawn Michaels' goodbye as he lost to The Undertaker at WrestleMania due to the loss he has to retire. Batista comes out first. He lost the WWE title to Cena and comes out looking annoyed. He gets on the mic and says that Cena's win was a complete fluke. The crowd get on his back chatting, you taps out. Batista says he wants a rematch. This brings out John Cena. The champ is here and the little kids go mental. Cena looks awfully cocky here considering just a week earlier he admitted to being scared of Batista. A huge Cena sucks chant then starts as Cena has to wait for them to shut up. Cena eventually agrees to a rematch tonight. Oh dear, that's some sort of main event there. TNA is in real trouble here. Oh, and then Batista says the rematch won't actually be tonight and sucker punches Cena. Swagger then lays Cena out with the Money in the Bank briefcase. He won the Money in the Bank last night. He grabs a mic and says he's cashing in right now. What a stuttering idiot. Cena then fights back and Swagger bails from the ring, saying he's changed his mind and he runs away. Cena looks to be a marked man tonight. They'll be showing parts of Shawn Michaels' career tonight and they start off by showing us the Rockers. A bunch of WWE legends then come out to the ring led by Ted DiBiase. Rowdy Roddy Piper then comes out of even more legends. King then gets up from the commentary desk to join them. The special guest hosts then come out. I can't say I've ever heard of them or seen their film. The crowd boo and these two guys come across as complete goons. They make a main event of Batista and Jack Swagger vs Cena and a mystery partner. They also say that tonight there'll be a special hot tub match. These two versus the WWE Divas. They then start healing on the crowd. They say the girls won't want the fans in the hot tub with them. Well looking at these two I doubt they would want to be near them either. It's a Legends Lumberjack match now. Christian Captain Charisma comes out and he's taken on Ted DiBiase Jr. who lost in the triple threat match at WrestleMania to Orton. This is a weird match. It's like they just wanted to get everyone on TV. Ted DiBiase is pretty much on a warpath with a nice clothesline and follows up with a kick to the head. Christian then hits a top rope drop kick for a close two. 
He goes for it again, but he gets jerked off the top. Christian then hits a nice reverse elbow from the top. He tries to get the Emperor here, but DiBiase reverses it, and both men end up on the outside. The Legends then all start fighting, and DiBiase Jr. is distracted. Christian hits the Umperidia for the free. Wow, Ted DiBiase Jr. has really faded over the course of these shows. He looked like he was on the cusp of the main event, but it's all gone downhill since just after Elimination Chamber. Ted then pushes his dad and walks off in a huff. Back on TNA, the Pope comes out. The Pope is the number one contender for the world title and will take on AJ at the pay-per-view. Didn't Bischoff say Jarrett would be the number one contender if he beats Styles tonight? Pope won a tournament to become the number one contender. Pope says Ric Flair was a boy 50 years ago and it's time for him to grow up. He says AJ has been dodging him and he's scared. Great promo by the Pope. This guy's so charismatic and should have done more in wrestling. The crowd love him. The crowd are on their feet chanting that Pope is pimping. Chelsea then comes out. She's been pushing Ric Flair's wheelchair in recent weeks and she's also Desmond Wolfe's manager. A Chelsea chant starts in the crowd. Pope looks smitten with her. Chelsea flirts with him and says she wants to be a hoe for him. Chelsea asks if he's got a gun in his pocket, but Pope says he's just happy to see her. Desmond Wolfe tries to sneak attack him, but Pope sees it coming. Pope steals a kiss from Chelsea and puts some money in her bra. Oh my god, it's Samoan Joe. He looks like he's having a painful bowel movement in the lavatory. He says that they have spoken. We haven't seen Joe in the Monday Night Wars yet. Oh, he's gone now. Bye, Joe. Thanks for coming. Oh god, it's Orlando Jordan. Um... Um, I don't know what to say. Taz says he doesn't get it either. I don't often agree with Taz. A door opens and there's two people sat there. Oh, it's Santana Garrett. Then it ends. Good. Borash is backstage with Tara. Daphne is petting up Tara's spider poison. Tara says Daphne will pay tonight. Daphne then attacks her. Tara starts slamming Daphne into a fence. The match is now official and underway. They start brawling on top of the announcers. Daphne whips her into a wall and then chokes her out of a cable and then drags her towards the ring with it. Daphne pulls out a broomstick. It looks like it suits her. Daphne then snaps it and tries to murder Tara with the spike. Tara is able to reverse it, luckily. Tara then hits the Widow's Peak out of nowhere. How did Daphne... How did Daphne not reverse that? She hadn't taken any abuse in this match. Tara bangs Daphne overhead with a toolbox, and this is enough to open Daphne up, and Tara wins the match. This is the smallest amount of blood I've ever seen anyone bleed. Not a very good match, I'm afraid. Styles is coming to the ring, accompanied by Flair in his pushchair and Chelsea. Let's see what Raw is up to. Back on Raw, they're showing the breakup of the Rockers. Triple H is bouncing along backstage next. The two hot tub goons are in dressing gowns backstage. Then Santino walks past with a CD player above his head. This was never explained. The Divas are in the hot tub and said whoever can stay in the hot tub the longest gets a Divas title match. Triple H comes out to the ring now. He beats Sheamus at WrestleMania. However, he's looking a bit down in the dumps here because his best friend Shawn Michaels has to retire. He reminisces for a while and then he pretends to start crying. He then says he needs to tell Shawn something when out of nowhere Sheamus comes out of nowhere to knock Triple H out of a pipe. I don't think Sheamus liked Triple H's promo either. The Divas then come out for another throw all the women together in a match for three minutes match. This is terrible. Please can we give them something to do? This feels like it happens every week. Oh great, Vicky Guerrero is here again. She won the match at WrestleMania for her team by hitting the Divas with her belly. It was a terrible zero star match. Maurice starts out posing here and then Eve Torres rolls her up for the free. What on earth was that? They all start fighting again. You cannot argue that on any level at the same time the TNA knockouts were worse. No offence, but it's not even up for debate. They then replay parts of the Shawn Michaels ladder match against a wrestler who looks like Elvis. It was a great match and I'm going back to watch it. Bret Hart is backstage. Great, he had an awful match against Vincent Mania. They then share a recap of Shawn's first world title win. Bret then comes out to cut a promo. I think I'm going to fall asleep. Bret says Shawn was one of the best wrestlers he's ever faced. Brett then says he's finally getting his own closure by beating Vince at Mania. Then there's a huge Owen Hart chant and Brett shows off his t-shirt. Brett says he's done and he's gonna leave, but then the unified tag team champion Show Miz come out. Miz is also the US champion. Miz makes fun of Brett for needing support from 25 other wrestlers to beat Vince. He does have a fair point. Miz says he's sick of the amount of TV time Brett has taken up and calls Brett Hart and his whole family overrated. The Hart Dynasty had come out because it looks like Bret Hart is going to get his sunglasses handed to him. This then leads to a tag match. The Hart Dynasty are all over the Miz early on and Tyson Kidd is elevated over the top rope with a lovely dive. Big Show then gets the tag and starts dominating. Show Miz with a nice double team knee for a close two count. Miz keeps mocking Bret Hart throughout this match. They manage to isolate Tyson Kidd but Miz makes a mistake and David Hart Smith tags in and he's a hawk on fire beating down the Miz. Hart Dynasty then hit a lovely double team on the Miz. Tyson then puts the sharpshooter on the Miz, but Big Show drags him out of the ring, and then they both bail out the match because they're losing. 
Back on TNA, they recap the Jarrett versus Bischoff feud again. We get it, okay? Enough is enough. Nobody wants to see this. The amount of time this rubbish has taken up on this series is ridiculous. Bischoff has had more TV time than any single wrestler on this show. Want to know why fans didn't support TNA during the Monday Night War? It's because of this WCW-esque rubbish. Jarrett comes out. He's got his music back. It looks like he's no longer in the doghouse. AJ Styles come out and has Flair and Chelsea with him. This match could be good, to be fair. Styles is on top earlier on. He's playing some mind games. Ric Flair's loving AJ's confidence. Jarrett eventually gets on top and clotheslines AJ to the outside. Jarrett with the strut. Flair looks livid. Jarrett hits an Inzaguri for a close two count. Styles then starts working Jarrett's legs and locks on the figure four leg lock. Flair tries to assist, but the ref spots it quickly. AJ misses an Inzaguri of his own and then Jarrett locks on his own figure four. The ref gets annoyed with Flair's shenanigans and sends him to the back. Security then take him away. He looks like, hey look, it's Gunner and Murphy. AJ is too distracted and Jarrett hits a massive throw on AJ back into the ring. AJ then clearly gets back on top with a big knee drop. This is probably the slowest style I've seen AJ work since being a heel. It seems to be working, the crowd are firmly in Jarrett's corner. Jarrett eventually fights out of a submission, hits a big back body drop and follows it with a suplex. Jarrett then hits the pedigree on AJ Styles. Has Jarrett ever done that move before or was that a shot at the WWE? Tell me in the comments down below. Styles then looks to go high flying for the first time in the match with a beautiful springboard clothesline for the two. AJ then tries to set up the Styles Clash, but Jarrett reverses it into an Alabama slam. Both men are down and spent. This match has gone on long for a TV match. Oh, Flair's back out. He then distracts the referee Brian Hebner. AJ then knocks the referee down and it looks brutal. Back in the ring, Jarrett hits the stroke from the middle rope and AJ is clearly out, but there's no referee. Bischoff then appears again. He tries to hit Jarrett with the guitar, but he blocks it. This gives AJ the chance to low blow Jarrett and then he follows up with the Styles Clash for good measure. The referee counts the free account. I don't know what to say, it was a really good match, but Eric Bischoff yet again, why is he the main focal point of this entire show? Hogan told him to leave Jarrett alone. Just get lost Bischoff, I don't want to see you again tonight. I'm so close to stopping this review, but I do it for you guys. I just can't stand having my time wasted. I actually mean it, I'm sick of seeing his swami face. How is it that Eric Bischoff gets even more TV time than Hulk Hogan? If this wasn't such a good long match, I'd be more annoyed. Backstage, Eric Young thanks Jeff and RVD for saving him earlier on. Young says Nash is in the business for the wrong reasons. RVD says they've got Eric Young's back tonight. Eric just looks like such a heel here. He stands out like a sore thumb. He says they'll win tonight. Jay Lethal is backstage talking about Brutus the Barber Beefcake. And up walks. Right, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to lose it. What the hell is wrong with TNA? Are they complete morons? I just can't do this anymore. It seems that Eric Young has put Jay Lethal in a handicap match against Beer Money. Once again, Beer Money are Eric Bischoff's lackeys. I'm going to just speak on this whilst Beer Money beat down this guy. Look, is Eric Bischoff going to be the world champion? Is he going to be a main event at the pay-per-view? Is he who the fans want to see? If you answer no to all three of those questions, you would be correct. If TNA had given this Bischoff TV time to somebody else, then they might have made a star. Oh, by the way, Lethal rolls up Robert Roode for the free. And then Bischoff is shown sulking backstage. Right, that's it. I'm going to go back and tell you how many minutes Bischoff had on screen for this week at the end of the video. Put in the comments section below how many minutes you think it'll be. I swear you need to take a drink every time he's on the screen. You'd end up paralytic. You would end up in hospital having your stomach pumped. That's how I spent my childhood. Taz says next week they will hear from Matt Morgan about sending his tag team partner Hernandez to hospital. I don't care, I'm sorry. I'm not in the mood for this anymore. Pope comes out. It seems he's taking on Desmond Wolf. If any of you've watched my Desmond Wolf video, this is around the time when Desmond Wolf was thrown to the wolves, to pardon the pun. He is now a loser who has his own manager kissed by other men. He lost constant matches to the Pope and Abyss around this time and no longer gets any mic time. Wolf tries to beat up the Pope here, but he seems to be more distracted by Chelsea on the outside. Pope eventually fights back with Luther's press and an open hand pimp slap on Wolf. Pope then hits a lovely elbow in the corner and the fans love him. Chelsea then distracts the referee and Wolf pulls out a steel chain and hits Pope for the free. Wow, didn't expect that. Maybe there's hope for Wolf. We all know there's no hope for Wolf. What strange booking here. The number one contender for the world title loses in five minutes to a man I'm pretty sure doesn't even have a match on the next pay-per-view. The cage is lowered around the ring and then Kurt Angle stomps out to ring looking miserable. I'm not sure what he's even here to do. Angle beat Anderson on the pay-per-view, but Anderson cut a promo after the match saying their feud isn't finished. Well, it's a pretty simple promo from Angle. He agrees the feud isn't over and challenges Anderson to a cage match at lockdown. What a match that'll be. Anderson then comes out and says the two are completely even. 
He says that Eric Bischoff has made a match for next week on Impact, and it will be a ladder match with the key to the lockdown cage hanging in the air. This feud is great. This is how you book a feud that doesn't involve a title, a proper blood feud. Let's check out Raw. Back on Raw, they're replaying all the key moments of Shawn Michaels and DX, and unfortunately the later years of DX, where they had reformed and were hanging around with Hornswoggle and dumping slime on people. Up next, Jack Swagger and Batista are going to take on John Cena and a mystery partner. Back in the hot tub, the Divas are looking bored. The goons suggest getting sexual, and this causes the future Taran Terrell and some other diva that I don't know the name of to leave. The Bellas are told they are the winners by some guy on a screen. I don't know, I don't know who it was. Then Mark Henry joins them in the hot tub for some reason. The goons look very awkward and scared, and then suddenly Hornswoggle emerges from the hot tub with goggles. Don't you just love Hornswoggle comedy? This show feels quite flat, not a lot of wrestling on this show, it looks like it's all just billed for HBK. The Money in the Bank winner, Jack Swagger is the first out and he gloats about winning at Wrestlemania. He looks like he's going to eat the briefcase. The animal Batista doesn't look too happy to be here. Cena then comes out and gets on the mic and says his mystery partner tonight is an old friend of Batista's, and out he comes, it's Randy Orton. Batista doesn't want to face Cena at the start and tags Swagger in. Swagger is getting battered early on, so he rolls out the ring. Swagger then eventually gets the advantage over Cena and hits a backdrop and follows it with a nice splash. Batista is now happy to tag in with Cena at a disadvantage. Batista takes Cena out of a spine buster and then tries to go for the Batista bomb, but Cena reverses it. Orton gets tagged in and he's a house on fire, taking everyone out. Batista spears Cena and then Randy Orton hits an RKO on both Batista and Swagger to pick up the three. It looks like Orton's losing run is certainly over. Kind of a boring match, it needed more time. Quite a weak show for wrestling this week. It looks like all the time is going to be given to HBK's retirement speech. Let's switch back to the Eric Bischoff show. Back on TNA, Angle is slowly leaving the ring. What's wrong with him? Does he have problems with his legs? The band's music can hits as Nash passes Angle, they throw it up in what was a cool flashback to the main event mafia. But Kurt ignores the one who looks like Elvis. How disrespectful is that? The three good guys come out and they're all hugs and happiness before the match. Eric charges at the door like an idiot, so Pac slams it in his face. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, EY. The band beat down the good guys on the outside of the ring whilst Nash fights Jeff Hardy on the inside. Six Pack chains the door shut whilst Eric Young is on the outside, creating a handicap situation inside the cage. It doesn't seem to be much better though, as Hardy and RVD do a good job fighting back. The two have a similar style. Hardy and RVD are on top, and then EY decides to climb the cage. The timing doesn't even make sense because his teammates are winning without him. The band are all down and Hardy and RVD hit stereo swanton bombs and frog splashes and it's a lovely move. Eric Young then dives from the top with an elbow and six pack for the three. Not a bad match, a little too short, but the band didn't embarrass themselves. They didn't really have to do too much. I wanted to see Scott Hall do more. Talking to the one that looks like Elvis, this would be the last time he would be the main event at TNA Impact and his wrestling career was unfortunately on life support at this point. The show's not over though because backstage the Idiot Abyss has chosen his first partner for his team at lockdown. This hasn't even been mentioned all night so I would forgive you if you forgot about this match. Jarrett is the first pick for Team Abyss. Jarrett says he's chosen Team Abyss because he now trusts Hogan. That doesn't even make sense. Earlier tonight you were screwed out of a world title shot by Hogan's business partner Eric Bischoff. So what about this man is trustworthy? He's let you get bullied and abused on TV for months and also last week allowed you to compete in a loser leaves TNA match. This doesn't make any sense. Speaking of leaving, let's catch the last part of Raw to see HBK leaving. Sean teases speaking for a few minutes before The Undertaker's dong sound hits and then he makes his way to the ramp to watch HBK say goodbye. Sean is in tears, people in the crowd are bawling, it's not the happiest of moments. Sean continues to thank the fans for the support throughout his career. Sean says he's not going to change his mind and says he'll honour his word that he's now retired. He thanks Bret Hart and apologises for all the stuff he put him through in the 90s. He then thanks Vince for keeping him on track during the 90s. He of course thanks God for his career. He then leaves the mic in the middle of the ring and walks off. Triple H comes out to hug him before the end of the show. And that's a wrap folks. So first, my thoughts on TNA. I thought it was terrible. I wanted to pull my eyes out of pliers and shove them. I felt physically sick. And the numbers are in. Eric Bischoff was on TV for 10 minutes this week. This is insanity. Even when he wasn't on TV, wrestlers were cutting promos on him and mentioning him constantly. TNA treats Eric Bischoff like he's the rock. The wrestling was fine. Jarrett vs. Styles was actually really good. But everything in between was a shambles. Bubba the Love Sponge trying to act tough. I have no idea what that Orlando Jordan segment was. And the Pope is jobbing when he's the number one contender. And I don't know where the stuff with the band is even going. I don't even know why that is the main event. TNA needs to get their act together and quickly. It feels like these shows are getting progressively worse. There isn't any direction and the only proper feud is Angle vs Anderson. They didn't get much TV time this week. 
Hogan only made one brief appearance at the start of the show, and it seems like his buddy Bischoff took all Hogan's normal TV time. Raw was kind of bad too, not much wrestling and goofy comedy everywhere, with the hot tub guys and hornswoggle. I suppose the show was mainly all about ending HBK's career, so everything else was going to take a back seat. I'd say TNA was the more interesting show this week, but you had to wade through piles of excrement to find the golden nuggets. I said more interesting though, not better. If you're not a fan of Eric Bischoff, then this show wouldn't be for you. Let's see what the ratings are this week, because Raw did really poorly for their last Raw before WrestleMania. Okay, so wow, as expected, Raw has scored highly on the first Raw since WrestleMania, getting a 3.7. TNA heavily featured Bischoff and the older guys once again. Let's see what they got. A 0.62. That is disgusting. That's the worst rating they've had so far. I guess Eric Bischoff isn't the draw that they thought he was. It's hard to see how TNA can recover from this. It looks like the war may be over. Okay then, it's the 5th of April 2010 and it's Raw vs TNA. TNA got destroyed in the ratings last week, so Spike TV has decided that they're starting the show an hour earlier this week. Luckily I've got both shows recorded, I can still watch them head to head. Tonight I was still crossing my fingers that Eric Bischoff doesn't appear too much on the show, because I've agreed to do a shot every time he appeared on the screen. Last week he appeared on the telly for 11 minutes in total all over the show, and it was terrible. Well, guess what? It turns out he's not actually on the show this week. I'm not going to let myself off that easily though. I'm going to do a shot every time something stupid happens, so wish me luck. The TNA show starts out this week with Christy Hemi talking about the TNA lockbox challenge that's happening later on tonight. All the knockouts will be competing to win. The prizes up for grabs tonight will be the TNA Knockouts Championship, Tara Spider, having to do a strip tease, and an open contract to fight whichever knockout they want to do. Wow, someone can win the TNA Knockouts title in a lucky draw from a box? Great, I'm drinking already. The beautiful people said they're going to win all the boxes, and Lacey Von Erich said she's still looking forward to having to do a strip tease later on. Oh god, now Hulk Hogan's music hits, there's usually something stupid that happens around him. I have to admit, I'm quite happy that I'm safe this week. Without Eric Bischoff on the show, I won't have to drink as much. Hogan comes out to hype that at lockdown it'll be Team Hogan taking on Team Flair in a cage match. Jeff Jarrett was added to Team Hogan last week. The commentary team say Eric Bischoff will not be here tonight. Pretty good promo by Abyss to be fair. This brings Ric Flair out to the ringside who's in his push chair as usual with Chelsea. He's then joined by Desmond Wolfe, Sting and Beer Money. What a random group of wrestlers together. I guess this is going to be Flair's team at lockdown. Flair brags about how good his team members are. He then brings up his Hall of Fame ring, mixed on of Abyss for having Hogan's Hall of Fame ring. Hogan says they'll be finding out the other team members tonight. Flair's face is so red here, he looks like a squashed tomato. Jeff Jarrett then asks Sting to step into the ring and answer some questions. Jarrett asks Sting why he's turned to the dark side. Well, I was wondering that too, it's pretty random. Nothing's ever really been explained since he battered RVD weeks ago. Sting doesn't really answer the question, so Jarrett slaps him. The bad guys spill into the ring and corner Hulk Hogan. Desmond Wolf has a chance to nail Hulk Hogan with a baseball bat, but he doesn't do it. That's definitely a drink. RVD and Sting then run out to make the save. It looks like these two guys will be joining Team Hogan at lockdown. Then there's an impromptu match as it's RVD versus James Storm. Don't worry Storm, you'll be back in the bar in less than 5 minutes time. RVD is completely dominating, kicking Storm to the outside. Storm does manage to turn it around briefly and slams RVD onto the barricade. Storm then DDTs RVD back into the ring for a close 2 count. Storm then suplexes RVD and does the beer money chant all on his own. Man, Storm's awesome. RVD then fights back and reverses a kick into a close two and follows it up with another kick. Both men then trade punches in the middle of the ring and then RVD kicks him again. RVD then hits the rolling thunder but is still unable to pin James Storm. Storm then hits a jumping in Zagurium and follows it up with the eye of the Storm for a close two count. This is actually quite a good back and forth match. Storm then eats another kick. Man, he better hope he has dental insurance because TNA ain't going to pay for it. RVD then hits James Storm with a split legged moonsault and pins him for the free. RVD is happily celebrating but then Storm smashes over the head with a beer bottle. <laughs> Storm then tries to beat on RVD but the security drag him away. Storm taunts RVD with the RVD finger point taunt and says, Beer, the man, knee. Hardy then attacks Storm and tries to help RVD. Rude then runs in and hits the double R spine buster on Hardy. Wow, this is a good start to the show, I'm impressed. And Kurt Angle is taking on Anderson in the main event ladder match tonight. Only two drinks so far, not too bad so far. I wonder if Raw can top this. Over on Raw, the first person we see is Jack Swagger. Swagger cashed in his money in the bank briefcase over on SmackDown, beating Chris Jericho to become the World Heavyweight Champion. He comes out looking a bit less goofy than normal, but I'm still not forgetting how stupid he looked last week on Raw when he tried to cash in on Cena and got scared. Swagger gets on the mic and said that the only reason he cashed in on Chris Jericho instead of Cena is because Jericho is better than Cena, and beating Jericho makes him look better in return. 
He also says he's now going to be on SmackDown instead of Raw. Good, go there then, get off the screen. Swagger is sweating buckets, all he's done is talk, what's wrong with him? I've never been so happy to see WWE Champion John Cena interrupting him. Cena says that everybody is glad that Swagger is leaving Raw. He then makes fun of how Swagger is sweating. I beat you to it, Cena. Cena then calls him a weasel and challenges him to a match tonight for the WWE Championship. They are then interrupted by Randy Orton, who's on a mini winning streak. Orton challenges Swagger, but they are then interrupted by Sheamus. Miz accuses them of trying to steal the spotlight as usual, and then proceeds to try and steal it himself. Then some music that I've never heard hits, and it's David Otunga from NXT. He comes out to dead silence. He has Raw shaved into his hair like he's some 14 year old child. For some reason he's the special guest host tonight and makes the matches of Swagger vs Orton and Show Miz against Batista and Cena. Orton then tries to RKO Cena but Cena pushes him away and RKO Swagger instead. Man Swagger's been the champion for two minutes and he's already a complete joke. Let's get back to drinking. Back on TNA, Tara is sulking because her belt and her spider are both on the line in the match tonight. And to be honest it is stupid and a bit unfair on her. Angelina then butts in and says that she'll win tonight. ODB then butts in and said they've both got PMS and screw the knocked up title. Instead she wants to win an open contract so she can fight AJ's booty? Hamada then shrugs. It seems that she's doing a stereotypical Asian gimmick and can't speak English. That's a drink. The title is on the line next and it's Homicide challenging Rob Terry. Never have I wanted a man to win a match more than this. I don't think we've seen Homicide on this series since he got stuck trying to climb up the little red cage. Rob Terry throws Homicide around and Homicide can't do anything to hurt Rob Terry. Rob then press slams Homicide and follows it up with a front power slam for the free. Rob Terry and his awful haircut are still the TV champions. Drink. After the match, Homicide hits Rob Terry with a steel chair in the back and then smashes him in the face with the steel chair, but nothing happens. Rob Terry then choke slams him and blood starts to trickle down his head. He's then interrupted. Orlando Jordan's music hits and he appears in the burlesque mask with cream all over him yet again. It's pointless and I can't stand it like last week. Drink. Backstage the beautiful people are acting like porn stars. Apparently this knockouts match is a tag team match. It's Tara, Angelina, ODB and Hamada versus the beautiful people and Daphne. Taz makes fun of Hamada for not speaking English. Madison Rain beats up on Tara and does her special face buster. Tara then drags her off the top and nails the widow's peak. Tara's won a key and doesn't need to compete in the match anymore and she rolls out the ring. Then there's an elimination during the advert break because Hamada missed the moonsault and then Daphne hit her with a diamond cutter to score a free and win a key. Taz then starts making fun of WCW pole matches and said let's put Dave Penzer on a pole. Taz seems to be in an extra humorous mood tonight. Drink. ODB then hits a fall away slam on Velvet for a two count. You know this might not seem great but it's mad to think that this is actually better than what the WWE Divas are serving up right now. Velvet then hits a DDT on ODB to pin her for the free. Lacey and Angelina then start fighting. Lacey tries to go for a moonsault but misses and then Angelina hits the lights out to pin her for the free. No surprises there. I guess Lacey won't be getting her wish to do a strip tease tonight then. The match is over and they start to show the four prizes that are up for grabs. Sounds like they're waiting to the end of the show to reveal who's won what. Apparently the ladder match is up next and the prize reveal will be in the main event instead of the ladder match. Don't ask me why. Back on Raw, Kofi Kingston is coming out. The commentary team say that he's still basking in the glow of WrestleMania. Pretty sure he lost. He's taken on Sheamus who attacked Triple H last week with a pipe whilst he was trying to bid farewell to Shawn Michaels. Sheamus with a nice backbreaker that silences the crowd early on. Kofi then fires back with a kick and then a crossbody to wake up the crowd. Then he bounces off the ropes and hits a drop kick. Sheamus then fights back with two brogue kicks and a razor's edge and pins him for the three. He then heads out of the ring and grabs a pipe and then he whacks Kofi over the head with it. Triple H is then seen stomping backstage. There's a hilarious sign in the crowd that says Ronald McDonald. Sheamus then gets on the mic to make fun of Shawn Michaels and point out that it only took him six months to win his first world title. Sheamus says that he's still sulking about losing to Triple H at WrestleMania. He also makes fun of Triple H for crying last week. This brings out Triple H who's a little bit wary to get in the ring at first while Sheamus is wielding a pipe. The game then pulls out a sledgehammer and, and smacks Sheamus in the stomach with it. Triple H goes for it again and Sheamus dodges and escapes through the crowd. The game then calls him a silly Irish man and stomps off. Apparently it's a dress to impress Battle Royal with all the Divas up next. Just like every week, all the Divas in the same match. The winner of this match will get a title shot against Maurice. Maurice is on commentary for this match, and this is the highlight. Maurice says that Kelly Kelly looks like she's from the 80s and looks like she wants to go to a school prom. She also says that Gail Kim looks like a peacock. This is actually quite entertaining, the Divas take turns walking out and then Maurice rips them to shreds. It's like when Scott Steiner was an announcer on TNA. 
She says that Eve Torres is the worst of the night and laughs about how bad she looks. This match is just a battle royal, but they don't need to go over the top rope. Kelly Kelly eliminates two divas at once, including Gail Kim. It comes down to Eve Torres, Gillian and Alicia, who team up on Eve. Alicia then makes a mistake and is thrown out. Alicia then tries to pull Eve out of the ring and Gillian thinks she's been eliminated, but she actually hasn't and throws her out to win the match. To be fair, Eve has been booked consistently during this series. She normally wins her matches, it's just that the matches are terrible. At least Maurice on commentary made this hilarious. Next up, there's a hype promo about how good David Otunga is. He says he's a combination of The Rock, <laughs> Triple H and John Cena. Can't say that of a straight face. He then calls himself the It Factor. Bobby Roode stole his gimmick. He's then backstage with some goons talking about how good he is. One of them looks like just incredible. Apparently David Otonga is such a star that they've made him an entire bowl of green M&Ms. Santina Morella then interrupts and asks where the A-team is at and starts doing impressions of Mr. T. Hornswoggle is then shown eating the M&Ms and then the goons all chase him away. Embarrassing. Let's switch back to TNA. Back on TNA, the ladder match is up next. Good, I won't need to keep drinking for a while. The winner of this match will be the one who retrieves the key for the cage at lockdown. Lots of keys on this show tonight. Anderson comes out first. He's been feuding with Angle for a couple of months at this point and it's been extremely personal, with Anderson attacking Kurt Angle with his warrior medal and bloodying him on several occasions. Angle comes out and he looks really ready. This is going to be a good one, folks. Anderson brings the ladder into the match early on and suplexes Kurt back first onto the ladder. He then realises Angle isn't hurt enough yet and tries to throw Angle onto the ladder again, but Angle reverses it into an overhead belly to belly onto the ladder. Damn! Angle and Anderson start fighting around the ladder and Anderson pushes it into Kurt's head. Taz says you've got to be violent in a ladder match. Yeah, thank you Captain Obvious. Anderson tries to climb the ladder but Angle catches him with the Angle Slam. It looks like this one's over. Angle climbs this ladder like he's been in a 30 minute match and this allows Anderson to recover and push Kurt off the ladder and over the top rope. The crowd are swearing so loudly here that the production crew has to mute them. Back in the ring, Anderson has almost secured the key, but then Angle flies out of nowhere with a missile dropkick at Anderson. Kurt then drags Anderson on top of the ladder. He beats him down and spits in his face. Man, this feud is brutal. Angle then climbs onto the top rope and wow! Angle hits a moonsault onto Anderson on top of the ladder. Beautiful. Kurt then throws Anderson into the ring post. The camera slowly pans to show Mr. Anderson spotting Kurt's warrior medal. In the meantime, Kurt Angle is climbing the ladder. Anderson runs up behind him and starts choking him out with the warrior medal. He still manages to keep climbing the ladder, but he's turning purple from the pain and lack of oxygen. Eventually, Kurt Angle passes out and falls from the ladder. Anderson scrambles up to the top of the ladder to grab the key and win the match. Wow, that match wouldn't have looked out of place on a pay-per-view. Anderson now has the advantage at lockdown. As Anderson's walking off, he shows off the key. It's attached to a piece of wood that says cage key on it. Gee, thanks for that. Anderson walks off and celebrates. Backstage, Jeremy Borash is interviewing Hulk Hogan about everything that Bischoff did on TV last week. Hogan refuses to talk about it, and then Bubba the Love Sponge walks up. Hogan asks Bubba why he's hanging around with the band. Hogan says that he brought Bubba the Love Sponge into TNA to help them out. How is this fat greaseball supposed to help TNA? This is ridiculous, I'm drinking for that. Bubba the Love Sponge says that he's enjoying hanging around with the band much more than Hulk Hogan. Jay Lethal then walks up, talking about the mega powers. Oh, I'm gonna have to drink, aren't I? and Hogan looks like he can't wait for Jay Lethal to stop annoying him. Let's drink and switch back to Raw. Show Miz are up next. Apparently this match will be for the tag titles. I didn't hear them say that earlier on. They are taking on John Cena and his partner is Batista. They're not exactly friends and it's doubtful that they will be able to get on in this match. Batista doesn't actually want to be there. Show Miz beat up on Cena early on for a while and then when Cena eventually tries to tag out Batista, he drops down and runs off. Cena gets angry and chases Batista away and starts hitting him on the ramp, but Batista carries on walking off. Cena is then counted out and looks livid about this. God, chill out, John. Did you really want to be the tag champion with Batista, your mortal enemy? A complete waste of time. David Otonga then comes out and says that Shomiz aren't getting off that easily, and tonight they will be taking on Cena and himself in a match. Great. Ted DiBiase Jr. is out next, who's on a bit of a losing run and lost last week to Christian. After the match, he pushed his dad. Ted has the million dollar title with him tonight for the first time ever. Jr. grabs the mic and says that he pushed his dad because he's a bad father. He then brags about how much money he has. Christian is his opponent tonight. Christian is clearly on top early on and hits a nice dive over the top to the outside. Ted turns it around with a hard clothesline that almost gets a free count. Christian fights back with a top rope crossbody. This match is an even back and forth contest. Christian then goes for the Umpredia, but Ted DiBiase manages to reverse it into Dream Street, but can't hit that either. Christian then rolls him up for a close two count. 
Christian is then sent shoulder first into the corner and Ted DiBiase Jr. is able to hit Dream Street and cover him for the free. It looks like his losing run is finally over. Good for him. Now let's change the channel. Hello, next. Back on TNA, the band have just arrived at the building. Cutting it a bit fine, aren't you guys? The show's almost over. Oh well, at least you've just showed up. Oh great, Bubba's with them again. Christy Heme is then backstage interviewing Matt Morgan about kicking Hernandez into a pole a couple of weeks ago. Matt Morgan says that Hernandez is no longer a tag team champion and starts referring to himself in the third person as the sole tag team champion. Oh great, I forgot about this stupid gimmick. Matt Morgan is the sole tag team champion. We are the champion. Stupid. Drink. Oh look, it's the Motor City Machine Guns. Yay, a girl who looks like a Russian Viking is going nuts in the crowd for the machine guns. Go on guys, you finally got a ring wrap. Looks like all the advice Kevin Nash gave you early on in your career is finally paying off, Shelley. The guns are taken on Team 3D in a number one contenders tag match. Mike Tanay says that this is a return match because nothing was settled last time. When did they fight last time? I swear I don't remember it. Drink. Bubba Ray is dominating the small men early on and then tags in Devon who hits a diving headbutt. Chris Saban gets the tag and he finally takes Team 3D down with a kick from the top and then the machine guns start dominating and being awesome. Machine guns start hitting their finishing move from the top but Devon kicks out of this. They then get battered from behind and Team 3D hit the what's up. Team 3D then go to get the tables. Suddenly Six Pack slams Devon into the ring post and Nash hits Ray with some brass knuckles. The referee then throws the match out. Six Pack hits the X Factor in the middle of the ring. A man with a red headband who looks like Elvis then hits the razor's edge. He doesn't need any help this time though. Nash then hits a clothesline. You thought he was going to hit the jackknife? Nope, not for free. You've got to catch the pay-per-view to see a jackknife. The band then spray the guns with spray paint and the band are refusing to leave the ring. Bubba the Love Sponge then comes out to join them. His glasses make him look like a sex offender. Nash then gets on the mic and says that they are running the show. The one who looks like Elvis has a top on that says West Memphis Fire Department. I've looked this up and this is not a legit clothing brand, so why is he wearing it? Drink. Nash threatens Hulk Hogan and says that he's got bigger things to worry about than Ric Flair. X-Pac then says they are the Bubba Army. I thought you were the band, make your mind up. Backstage, Jeremy Borash is interviewing the Pope. The Pope is the number one contender for the world title but I'd forgive you if you've forgotten about that. He talks about how he lost to Desmond Wolfe last week and says that he's gonna get revenge tonight on Desmond Wolfe and Chelsea. Desmond Wolfe then walks up to Pope and calls him the poop. Wolfe says that he doesn't know why they are wrestling again. Well, he has a fair point. They then make a deal that if Wolfe can win against Pope tonight, he will become the number one contender. Tara is backstage worrying about if she'll win the belt or a spider tonight. The X Division champion Doug Williams is out next. Do you know what? This show feels a bit jumbled up tonight. Doug gets on the mic and says that the days of the trampoline high flying wrestlers in the X Division are over and they need to go back to the circus or alternatively go back to wrestling school to learn how to be technical wrestlers like him. Doug says that he's the king of technical wrestling and from now on he needs to be referred to by his full name, Douglas Williams. I thought we already did that. Tonight he has challenged both members of the Young Bucks to a gauntlet match. Douglas Williams starts off with Jeremy Buck and almost loses straight away to a moonsault. Douglas Williams then pokes him in the eye. Jeremy then goes for yet another moonsault but misses and Douglas Williams hits the rolling Chaos Fairy suplex to beat Jeremy in about two minutes. Wow, how things have changed, Jesus. Max is up next now and he's a house on fire. Max then hits a leg drop but it's not as good as the Hawksters. Sorry, what was I saying? Oh yeah, he only gets a two count with this. Douglas then kicks him off the top rope and catches him in a guillotine submission and taps him out also in less than two minutes. He refuses to let go and Jeff Hardy's stoner friend runs out to make the save. He's not actually the number one contender, so why is he bothering? Go away. Then he gets on the mic and says that there's no room in the X Division for boring wrestlers like Douglas Williams. I don't agree with this. He says Douglas Williams should grow some balls and give him a shot for the title at the pay-per-view. Look, you've had your chance, Shannon, and you got hit with a brick, so back off. Let's change the channel back to the red brand. On the red brand, they're advertising that next week there'll be a draft. Oh great, looks like TNA's in trouble then. There is a five minute recap of Shawn Michaels' career, so sorry if I haven't got much to say here. Swagger comes out next looking much more goofy than earlier on. His opponent tonight will be Randy Orton. Swagger hits a nice throw on Orton early on, but Orton fights back with some uppercuts. Swagger then knocks Orton off the ring apron into the ring barrier. Swagger then hits a back suplex for a close two and then another suplex for a close two. Orton seems to be struggling a bit here. Swagger then eventually works the abdominal stretch for a while until Orton fights out, chucks him out the ring. 
As Swagger comes back into the ring, Orton catches him with the DDT from the ropes. That's the second time we've seen that move tonight. Orton then builds up some momentum and hits the backbreaker. Orton starts gritting his teeth and preparing to hit the RKO, but Swagger reverses it with a kick. Orton manages to kick out of this kick, but then Swagger follows it up with a splash in the corner. And then another splash. Orton's in real trouble here. Swagger thinks he can get the win, but he can't. And then he lifts Orton up and tries to hit the gut wrench powerbomb. But Orton reverses it and nails him with the RKO. Orton wins the match. And Swagger has been punked out by Orton twice in one show. I think we can see why Jack Swagger never made it. I don't actually want to switch back to TNA. I'm dying a bit here. But I'll do it for you guys. I can't drink much more. Back on the TNA show, Team 3D are moaning about the band attacking them. They challenge them to a match next week on Impact. Back in the ring, Desmond Wolfe is there, but he doesn't get his entrance shown. Pope heads out. This match is for the number one contendership for the world title. Wolfe meets Pope on the ramp, but gets knocked over and thrown back into the ring. Wolfe fights back with a flying hammerlock and tries to hit the Tower of London from the top rope, but Pope reverses it. Pope then shows a bit of his boxing past and floors Desmond Wolfe. This looks like a legit knockout. Pope then runs at Wolf and hits the DDD, the D'Angelo De Niro Express. Wolf sells it well and it looks brutal. But this is what I'm talking about. Wolf lost to Pope in two minutes here. Pope is then celebrating and he's jumped by the world champion AJ Styles. AJ Styles then hits the Styles Clash and then the idiot Abyss waddles out to make the save. Wolf tries to jump on Abyss and then Abyss gets chop blocked. Wolf then hits Abyss with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> Team Flair have really battered Team Hogan tonight. We're on to the last part of the TNA show now, thank god. It'll be the reveal of the knockouts lock boxes. Velvet gets a massive reaction from the fans. Velvet opens her box first. The fans are all hoping it's going to be the striptease box, but they are let down however as Velvet wins the open contract for a fight. Tara is up next, her spider and her world title are both on the line. Tara opens the box and her spider is in the box. She's absolutely ecstatic to win her spider back. Borash tells Tara that she's no longer the knockouts champion. She looks surprised. The remaining two knockouts then open their boxes at the same time. Angelina Love wins the TNA knockouts title and Daphne has to perform a strip tease. Angelina Love won the knockouts title for a random raffle and then she celebrates like she's won the lottery. Tara looks absolutely livid about this. Jeremy Borash then informs Daphne that she's not allowed to leave and forces her to go to the ring to do her strip tease. Daphne looks like a leprechaun this week, but she certainly doesn't have the luck of the Irish. Daphne stands in the ring looking annoyed. She acts like she's gonna do the strip tease, but doesn't really seem into it. There's horrible, slow, repetitive jazz music playing the whole entire time. This is so embarrassing and awkward to watch. For two minutes, Daphne stands in the middle of the ring, slowly moving her clothes around. Lacey Von Erich then runs out to the ring and hits Daphne with the ugly stick. She takes off her robe so she can perform her strip tease instead. The cameraman decides to pan off of her and instead focus on Tara and Angelina who are arguing. Why would you do that? The two then brawl into the ring and Lacey is completely unaware of what's going on. She's bouncing around and still trying to do her striptease while they fight. Velvet Sky then gets on the mic and says that no beautiful person is allowed to upstage the other and the fans then think that Velvet's going to join in with the striptease, but she doesn't. And instead she says that she'll be cashing in her open contract on Angelina Love next week in a leather and lace match. Tara then randomly hits Lacey Von Erich. The show ends. Good. Over to the last part of Raw now. They advertise that David Hasselhoff will be the guest host of Raw next week, and they say that he is the most popular man in England. This simply isn't true. Show me has come back out to take on Cena and David Otonga for the unified tag belts. This whole show is built around trying to make a star out of David Otonga, so let's see if they're successful. He starts out knocking Miz over a few times. Once again, show Miz isolate John Cena. Can Otonga be Cena's hero in this match? There's eventually a double down from a clothesline and Cena has his chance to tag out. Cena tries to make the tag, but then David Otonga refuses the tag and jumps away. Big Show then smacks Cena and pins him for the free. Batista then comes out and picks Cena's lifeless body up to cripple him with the Batista bomb. Kind of a bad week for John Cena. Batista then grabs a microphone and the camera cuts to David Otonga who gets on the mic and says that Batista has something to say. Well, obviously, he just picked up the microphone. We could all see he had something to say. Batista then says they'll be doing a rematch at Extreme Rules for the title and it will be a last man standing match. So that's it for another week. 
Thank God. So what are my thoughts? If I can manage to put them into words. A trend I've noticed from doing these videos is how Raw will feature just a very few wrestlers and build everything up carefully, sometimes too much, whilst TNA will feature a hundred wrestlers on the show each week, and the cameramen must earn their living running all over the impact zone trying to cover all the footage. TNA is definitely more chaotic, and if you blink you might miss something. This TNA show was uh, a lot better than last week. The TNA knockout stuff aside, we got Storm and Hardy and Angle vs Anderson. Both good matches. There was a lot more wrestling than promos, and the Hawkster was kept to a minimum, with Eric Bischoff not on the show at all. Don't get too excited though, he's back next week apparently. Raw was also better than last week, much more action. The show is still missing buzz, and Swagger is still a terrible champion. The Batista Cena feud is decent at least. The David Otonga stuff was stupid and it was basically just used as a device to forward the storyline between Batista and Cena. Okay, let's check the ratings for this week. So, on to Raw. They got a 3.15. It's massively down on last week. What's going on there? Probably because it was a boring show last week. There isn't too much going on on Raw right now. TNA, let's check them out. Well, they got a 0 0.9. Wow, that surprises me. That's pleasant. That's their highest rating since March 15th. Starting an hour earlier probably did help them. They also advertised Angle vs Anderson in the ladder match in advance. A glimmer of hope for TNA perhaps? Well, maybe not because Eric Bischoff is back next week. Anyway, I'm done. It's April 12th, 2010, and it's time for a war. Last week I destroyed my liver for your entertainment. I took a shot of whiskey every time something stupid happened on the TNA show. You know what? I'm in a really good mood. I want to keep entertaining you lot this week. I'm going to do something really crazy now. I'm going to pull out one of my eyelashes every time someone over 40 appears on the TNA show this week. Just a brief recap on last week, TNA moved time slots to an earlier slot, so the war ain't over yet because they did a bit better. Hmm, did I just hear someone say war? I do love a war if I say so myself, but let me ask, who are you? Oh wait, I know who you are. You're that, um, scummy, I mean, ma sorry, Marky D. Aren't you that small little channel that tried to start a beef with me and tried to start a war with me? Top 10 wrestling? You tried to say that I was stealing your series and you tried to have your fans invade my channel? Yeah, real funny. Well, you know what? I'm invading your channel now. This war is on and you're definitely not going to win it. But you know what, Marky? While we are in a war and I'm not, you know, too fond of you, I'm going to be nice to you. Uh, because, you know, I'm a nice guy. Rest your voice. Because I'm reviewing Raw tonight. So Raw opens and the main event graphic for the night is shown as Randy Orton is taking on Batista and it's a bit mental to think about the fact that Randy Orton and Batista are main eventing an episode of Raw and then four years later they're pitched to main event Wrestlemania. That's a bit mental. And Raw is emanating from the UK tonight, woo! UK represent. You know man, I love the UK and everyone in it, except for Marky. And the guest host, David Hasselhoff, comes down to the ring. Oh my god, I forgot that this was the guest host era of Raw. Hoff hypes up the crowd a bit and just said a lot of name puns like saying he feels Hoffsome. Please, please be quiet. He mimics The Rock and said the Hoff has finally come back to Monday Night Raw. Ugh. Hoff announces Randy Orton vs Batista for the main event, which was already announced and introduces the Divas title match of Eve, who won a battle royal last week to face the champion Maurice. This was a very short match because of course it was, it's a Divas match in 2010. The match goes about 3 minutes with Eve picking up the victory, reversing Maurice's finisher into a pinning combination to win and become the Divas champion for the first time in her career. So Raw already opening with a title change, which is okay I guess. Eve wouldn't really come into her own until about two years later when she turned heel, but she's in the stage of her career where she was just a bit of a bland baby face. This match was very short, I can't really give too much of an opinion on it, but yeah that's how Raw opened. We opened with The Hoff, the greatest celebrity in the world on the amazing guest host era of Raw and the Divas Division match in an era where women were treated so damn well in WWE. I'm kidding of course, but I'm gonna send it back to Marky, so here, back to you. 
All right, all right. Not this guy. Calm down, Tom. Keep your hair on. In fact, I better be a bit more serious and keep mine on. Eyelashes, you're safe for now. I can imagine Tom in his little room with his little glasses, shaking with excitement at that three-minute Divas match. Should have gone to Specsavers, Tom, but anyway, let's check out TNA. Jeff Jarrett starts out by stamping straight to the ring. He's upset because last week Sting refused to tell him why he turned to the dark side. Jarrett threatens Sting and scurries into the rafters to find him. Jarrett manages to find Sting and beats him back down the stairs. I guess RVD is too chilled out with 420 and all that to go to the rafters and get revenge on Sting for the beating Sting gave him with a baseball bat on his debut a month ago. This fight goes on for quite a while, whilst Jarrett continues screaming, give me an answer. The crowd start chanting, why Sting, why? Then the lights go out and Sting is now stood up with his baseball bat. Sting gives Jeff Jarrett the RVD treatment. Jeff Hardy and his little friends then run out to make the save. Backstage, Ric Flair is in his pushchair with his lockdown team, minus Sting. Flair says that they will continue to beat down Team Hogan tonight, and they will win at lockdown. Robert Roode then makes fun of RVD getting smashed over the head with a beer bottle last week, and says he'll beat Jeff Hardy tonight. Storm then says sorry about your damn luck. Desmond Wolfe then threatens Abyss, and AJ Styles says tonight he'll team up with Wolfe to take on Pope and Abyss. Team 3D and Jesse Neal then run out to the ring and start complaining about the band. For some reason this will now be a six-man street fight. The band then get their entrance cut out, which is never cool. Early on in the match, Bubba canes an Elvis lookalike in the back. He then uses a kendo stick on Sean Waltman's baby maker. The crowd are really behind Jesse Neal for some reason, as he goes nuts for kendo stick. He's done nothing to deserve that reaction, by the way. Bubba then hits a trash can off Kevin Nash's head. Taz then says Scott Hall looks more dizzy than normal. Bubba then bounces another trash can off Kevin Nash's head. They then hit the what's up on Elvis. The band continue to have zero offense in this match. Team 3D and the man with the mohawk then get the tables. They put six pack on the table, but then an extremely fat man runs out to the ring to distract Bubba Ray. The distraction allows six pack to hit the X factor through the table and pin Bubba Ray for the three. The band win the match thanks to Bubba the love sponge. Get him off the screen now. I mean it. For God's sake, he's now coming out and saving the band in matches. Get this grease ball off the TV now. Eric Young then runs out of a hockey stick and the band flee. Eric challenges Kevin Nash to a match at lockdown. Not a great start, TNA, I'm just being honest. I'm now going to have to lob the remote at Tom's head. Let's give Raw a go. Show has come out and the two basically say that they are the best tag team in WWE history because nobody's able to take the titles off them and that's when Bret Hart's music hits. Bret Hart is still around in WWE after his terrible, 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 terrible match with Vince McMahon at WrestleMania 26. He looks like he really doesn't want to be there when he comes out though. Like, at all. Brett says to Show Miz to give him a break and says he can name two tag teams just on the top of his head that are better than them. I mean, only two? O only two? I can name about a hundred. He says the Hart Foundation and the British Bulldogs, which obviously get a big pop from the UK crowd, so now it's obvious why he could only think of two, because he's being very vain. Show Miz says that if he was to face the British Bulldogs, they'd slap them up, and he says it in a British accent to get heat from the British crowd. Miz, even in 2010, was still a really good heel, not gonna lie. Then the Hart Dynasty come out, who were a team that I forgot existed. David Hart Smith, Tyson Kidd, and Natalia all walk their way down to the ring, and David Hart Smith challenges the Miz to a one-on-one -on -one match where if David Hart Smith wins, then the Hart Dynasty get a tag title match at Extreme Rules, which the Miz accepts. On the condition that if he wins, then Bret Hart has to say that Show Miz are the greatest tag team of all time, which they accept, and Miz vs Hart Smith is next. Uh, so yeah, still just pretty average stuff going on. I'm just going to send it back to Marky just to annoy him because I've barely spoken. TNA, how's it going, Marky? Hogan is talking to Christy Heme about lockdown. Hogan then pokes his hawk nose around the corner where he sees his business partner, Eric Bischoff, talking to Flair in his pushchair. Hogan tells Bischoff they need to speak in the office about this. It looks like Bischoff is in trouble. Jeff Hardy's stoner friend is out next. He will be taking on the number one contender for the X title, Kazarian. The commentary team announced that the title match at the pay-per-view will now be a freeway, and Jeff Hardy's stoner friend is now somehow in the match. Why? He didn't win anything. Last time he had a match, he got hit with a brick. He just doesn't deserve it. Kaz had to win a ladder match to get this opportunity. It's not fair. Some nice chain wrestling in the match early on. No one really has a clear advantage. Eventually someone had to, and Shannon gets the advantage with a cross buddy. But it doesn't last for long, as he makes a mistake, and is sent over the top rope to the outside. Kazarian then hits the slingshot leg drop on Shannon. 
Douglas William, the champion, comes out to watch and joins the broadcast team as Kazarian gets a close two count with a Northern Lights. Douglas calls them both imbeciles. Shannon then proves him right as he misses a dive and lands on Kazarian's knee. Then there's a heavy botch in the ring. Shannon then starts a fiery comeback and they brawl on the outside of the ring. Shannon hits a dive from the top to the outside. It looks like Kazarian is almost done here. Shannon then hits a Hurricanrana from the top rope but Kaz kicks out again. Taz then says on commentary that Dave Penzer has a small package. Look, why does Taz keep gunning for him? Does he even know who he is? Have they even met before? More than hits another move from the top and it's crazy this time, but somehow Kaz kicks out again. This is a really good match. The two then try lots of pinning combinations, but neither succeed. And then the referee ends the match as a time limit draw. That's a shame. Douglas then gets on the mic and says he'll beat them both at lockdown. Backstage, Velvet Sky has a whip and is talking about her open contract that she won last week. Tonight, she will be cashing in on Angelina Love in a leather and lace match. It's basically a bra and panties match. Hey Tom, I bet you'd rather be watching Velvet Sky with a whip than Seamus and his big goofy face. Actually, no. You're probably entertained by Seamus, aren't you? Get a grip. Over to you. David Hart Smith and The Miz have their match, and it's really just a standard TV match. I mean, nothing much to it, but then again, it's David Hart Smith and The Miz in 2010. I'm not sure I was really expecting a five-star classic to take place in this match. It was just a very standard match. During the match, David Hart Smith locks on the sharpshooter on The Miz, and Miz looks as if he might tap out, but then Big Show gets on the apron, so Smith just releases it. I mean, Big Show didn't even distract the referee or interfere, just, he just got on the apron, so Smith released it and lost because of it. What? Tyson Kidd then tries to attack Big Show, but just gets slapped silly in the chest in what was a fantastic moment. Smith looks to put away Miz with the power slam, but the ref is distracted by Tyson Kidd, and Sho gives a right hand to the ribs of David Hart Smith, which looks very awkward, and the Miz hits the skull crushing finale to win. So, David Hart Smith and Tyson Kidd just look like idiots here, because David Hart Smith wasn't being distracted by the Big Show, he just got off the sharpshooter anyway, Tyson Kidd got slapped up by the Big Show, and was the one to distract the referee that led to David Hart Smith losing. So if you ask me, them losing was completely justified. So next week, Bret Hart apparently has to say that Show Miz are the greatest tag team of all time. What a quote that is gonna be. We cut backstage to David Otunga chatting to Batista. So obviously last week, Otunga and Cena wrestled Show Miz for the titles or the sentence, but Otunga walked out on Cena and cost him the match and allowed Batista to attack him. Batista says that Otunga is like a young him. No, he is not. And that's pretty much all I took away from this segment. David Otunga is not like a young Batista in the slightest. But then Otunga goes and meets Hoth backstage and says that Cena versus Otunga is scheduled for tonight. How exciting. Wow. Sarcasm, obviously. And next up, we have Evan Bourne versus Carlito, which is just such a throwback match, and I love it. I mean, this is Raw 2010 in a match. This match was about three to four minutes long, meaning so far of the three matches, The Miz versus David Hart Smith was the longest match at about eight minutes, which speaks volumes about Raw in 2010. Evan Bourne picks up the win with his beautiful shooting star press. Mwah, mwah. Evan Bourne was someone who I really thought was going to be someone in WWE, but for whatever reason, it just never happened. I mean, at some, at, there was a point in 2010 where he was beating Chris Jericho clean, but nothing really ever came of him. He had that team with Air Boom, him and Kofi Kingston. They won the tie titles, but then after that, he never really did anything. And next up is David Otunga versus John Cena. And on that note, Marky, scumbag, take it back, please. It's your channel. It's your responsibility. You can't stop me. Take the video back. Talk about some TNA for us. Do you know what? Batista telling David Otunga to get his coffee was hilarious. It's a bit like me and you, Tom. In fact, you can get me one while I'm covering TNA. Why don't you get a gym membership too while you're at it? You're looking as small as Angelina Love when she was in zombie mode. Cheers, Tom. Hogan is bollocking Bischoff for bullying the TNA talents in the past few weeks and for hanging around with Ric Flair in his bush chair. Bischoff says he was only talking to Flair because he's trying to keep his friends close and his enemies closer. Bischoff says that he has Hogan's back and storms out. Jay Lethal then barges into the office just like every week and says it's time for the mega powers to rise again. What is the point? Jeremy Borash is then backstage interviewing the Knockouts champ about the leather and lace match against Velvet later tonight. 
Angelina Love is making fun of Velvet for not being able to wrestle. Angelina Love then says she didn't come to TNA to parade around the ring like a lady of the night. What is she on about? She's been shaking her butt on the middle rope of the ring for ages. She might have even been doing it longer than Velvet. Tara then interrupts and is moaning about losing her title last week in the Lockbox Challenge. JB then announces that the two will be teaming up at Lockdown to take on the beautiful people with all the belts on the line. They then cut from them in mid-conversation. Classic TNA. Christy Heme is interviewing Pope and Abyss, who say they'll win at lockdown. Good for them, it was boring. Angelina Love then comes out first for her leather and lace match. Velvet Sky comes out with her whip again and gets on the mic. She says it's not actually going to be a leather and lace match because the perverts don't deserve to see her goodies. Instead, she says that Angelina Love will be taking her on with her arms cuffed behind her back. I bet a lot of you perverts were disappointed there, no offence. Anyway, it's not really much of a match because Velvet decks her with the knockouts title early on. She then gets on the mic and says that it's actually an I quit match. Velvet then attacks her with the whip. Her offense is so weak looking. She asks Angelina if she gives up, but Angelina's refusing. Velvet then gets on the mic and threatens to strip Angelina naked unless she quits. The perverts in the crowd go nuts. She then takes Angelina's top off and the rest of the beautiful people run out to join in the beatdown. Tara then runs out to make the save for Angelina Love, even though she doesn't like her. Tara refuses the handshake and walks off. Talk about blue balls. Back in the parking garage, Abyss has been run over and they don't know who's done it. Rikishi was retired at this point, wasn't he? Let's see what Tommy Boy and Rory's Snore are doing now. So John Cena versus David Otunga is up next with Batista watching at ringside. So in this match you have your top guy, the WWE Champion, John Cena, the biggest star in the company against a younger new talent who WWE seem they might have a bit of stock in him. So maybe John Cena and David Otunga might have a bit of a competitive match to help put Otunga over. Well, maybe not, because John Cena absolutely squashed this fool in less than three minutes. What was really the point? I mean, how on earth is this going to help Otunga get over at all? He's already boring as hell and bland, and how is him getting squashed by Cena going to get any stock in him? After the match, it looked as if Batista was about to attack him, but he didn't. I mean, this is how you're building to your WWE title match with David Otunga. Really? Really? Next, Sheamus comes out and cuts a promo saying that Triple H is scared of him and that he and Triple H are going to have a street fight at Extreme Rules. Kofi Kingston then comes out and challenges Sheamus to a match right then and there and a ref comes out and it's on. This is pretty much a few months after Kofi Kingston's push came to an end following that botched RKO spot with him and Randy Orton where he got called stupid, we all know it. But this match was pretty alright and what made it better was the fact it didn't last 3 minutes long so that was pretty dope. It was actually starting to pick up towards the end and get even better but it ended abruptly by DQ after Sheamus hit Kofi with a monitor and then continued to beat up Kofi after the match was finished. The match was actually starting to get pretty good. The ending was a bit abrupt and annoying, but hey, it is what it is. Marky, back to you to talk to us about TNA for the beautiful fans and your fans. Back on TNA, Matt Morgan says he doesn't need a tag team partner, but he's being forced to find one anyway. Morgan says his new tag team partner is going to be Amazing Red. Morgan talks up how good Red is and talks about the potential of the team. I actually like this team and I think they could be good, but you just can't trust Matt Morgan. The tag team titles are on the line. The Machine Guns are apparently the number one contenders. Hang on, didn't the match get thrown out last week against Team 3D because the band interfered? This doesn't make any sense. Matt Morgan doesn't let Amazing Red have one of the tag belts, which means he's probably going to turn on him. Matt Morgan starts out by beating on the much smaller Machine Guns. He throws them both to the outside of the ring and celebrates as it's all too easy for him. Red then does get tagged in and hits a Hurricanrana and then with some Matrix-like moves on Shelly with a beautiful kick. Man, I love watching Amazing Red. Shelly then catches him with a brutal looking kick on the outside, but they can only get a two. Red then almost fights back but the guns hit a double team for a close two count again. Morgan then drags Amazing Red to his corner and tags himself in. Morgan with some elbows in the corner on Shelly and then smashes Saban face first into the corner. The guns then manage to start outspeeding Matt Morgan. He catches Shelly in mid-air but then Saban drop kicks him for a close two. Morgan then starts to panic and slivers back into his corner and tags Red in. The guns take Red out and kick Morgan off the ring apron. Red uses the distraction to hit a beautiful DDT. Morgan then charges into the ring and clotheslines Saban out of his boots. 
He starts to set up the elevator finisher, and whilst he's wasting time posing to the crowd, Red hits the code red for the free. Matt looks annoyed about this, but then starts to pretend to be happy and celebrate. He then kicks Amazing Red and beats him up in the ring. What a surprise, I actually thought this team had potential. Morgan then sets Red up to kick his head in, just like he did Hernandez a while ago, but the machine guns save him and drag him away. Back in the parking garage, Abyss is still down, but they haven't managed to load him into the ambulance yet because he's too fat. They show the footage of the security camera and it looks like Desmond Wolf. Okay, well it looks like this isn't going to be the big mystery I thought it would be, ending with Samoa Joe claiming he did it for AJ Styles. Robert Roode comes out next, he's without the cowboy. He's going to be taking on Jeffrey Nero Hardy. Roode doesn't have a chance here to be honest and Jeff is all over him like a bad shirt. He almost hits the twist of fate early on but Roode escapes from the ring. Roode then drags Hardy out of the ring and whips him into the stairs. Back in the ring, Roode hits a middle rope knee drop for a close two. Roode then carries on using his knees to crush Jeff Hardy's crazy head. Jeff then fights back with a jawbreak and follows it up with a kick. Then there's a double down because both men are exhausted. Come on, it's been about three minutes. You can't be that tired, guys. Back on their feet, Jeff Hardy takes Rude off his feet again with a front suplex and then nails him with the whisper in the wind, but he still can't pin Robert Rude. Rude fights back with a double R spine buster, but he can't get the free either. Jeff then hits a twist of fate, or was it a stunner? He then goes to the top rope to do the swanton bomb, but James Storm runs out to distract him. Hardy fights off Storm, and then he still nails the swanton bomb on Rude and pins him for the free. Beer money are TNA guys, and RVD and Hardy are WWE guys, so they aren't as good. That's the message that TNA writers are sending to the audience. Storm then attacks Hardy, and in the ring he blows a fireball in Jeff's face. Spike TV aren't allowed to show it, and the camera cuts. Damn, I wanted to see it. Oh, here it is. Hope this isn't too violent for you, Tom. Don't want you peeing in your little panties. RVD then runs out, but Beer Money beats him down, and they hit the DWI on RVD. Backstage, Jeff Hardy is shown crying. Talking of crying, let's switch back to Tom who spends most of his night doing just that. Carlita goes backstage and demands a match with Evan Bourne. Turns out Hoff isn't there right now, so Vladimir Kozlov is doing his duties for him. Basically, this segment was pretty much a way to advertise that next week's host is McGruber, who Kozlov says he'll destroy if he doesn't get what he wants. Go, Kozlov. I am fully on your side about this. Yo, remember when he beat The Undertaker clean on an episode of SmackDown? Weird times, man. Weird times. Backstage, Randy Orton is being interviewed about his match with Jack Swagger at Extreme Rules, where he says that Extreme Rules means there are no rules. Uh, no Next up, we have a Baywatch Babe triple threat tag team match with the Divas and David Hasselhoff as a lifeguard. The teams are Kelly Kelly and Gail Kim, poor Gail, the Bella Twins and Jillian and Rosa Mendez with Santino as special guest ref who is very over in the UK. And since the Divas match in 2010, it goes about a minute and a half and all the focus is on Santino who chokes on his whistle and Hornswoggle has to come out and give him the tadpole splash to regurgitate the whistle from Santino. Jesus Christ. And we finally move on to the main event, Randy Orton, the number one contender for the World Heavyweight Championship versus Batista, the number one contender for the WWE title. This is exactly how you'd expect a Randy Orton versus Batista match to go. Long, drawn out, slow, and just a bit dull. Okay, now, nah, I'm being a bit harsh there. It wasn't actually that bad, especially towards the end. The match did start to pick up and get a bit quicker. I mean, it still shouldn't have main evented WrestleMania 30, and I'm glad it didn't with Daniel Bryan getting added. But, of course, it's Raw in 2010. The match ends in DQ when Swagger attacks Orton, and then Cena attacks Swagger and locks Batista in the STF to close the show. And he refuses to let go of the STF, despite there being referees and road agents trying to pull him off. So now Cena looks like the ultimate heel, so that's great. While a DQ finish was a bit anticlimactic, I kind of understand why they did it because they kind of put themselves into a corner with the two normal contenders. Whoever loses is going to look really weak going into their world title match. But that's it for Raw tonight. That was great, Tom. Your biggest hero, Hornswoggle, was on the show again. Look, I saw that poster of him in your room when you did your little pay-per-view review of Victory Road 2011. I know you love him. Well, I have to admit that Raw was decent. I enjoyed the Hoff. He was funny. He has natural charisma, something that you could never have, Tom. Back on TNA, they promote the Angle-Anderson feud. 
Anderson won the ladder match last week and won the key for the cage at lockdown after beating Kurt Angle. This video package goes on for quite a while. I'd prefer if they were actually doing something on the show. Backstage, JB is interviewing the Pope about his match. Abyss has been taken out in the parking garage and Pope doesn't have a partner. Jay Lethal runs up and says that he'll be Pope's tag team partner. I don't know why the Pope is looking so happy about teaming with this idiot. Dog the Bounty Hunter is then shown in the crowd as Pope comes out to the ring. Pope has one of those masks on to protect him from the coronavirus, but Jay Lethal doesn't and is shown backstage getting battered by beer money. Jay Lethal could probably beat them on his own. He beat them in a handicap match not long ago. Oh, uh, maybe not. James Storm just smashed him over the head with a beer bottle. Good night, Lethal. AJ Styles then comes out followed by Ric Flair in his pushchair. He hands AJ the mic and AJ laughs that it will now be a handicap match. Desmond Wolf is coming out to be AJ's partner. Wolf appears on the ramp and then Hogan appears behind him and then he hits Wolf in the back with a chair shot. Wolf is dead from this one weak looking shot and it's now going to be a singles match between Styles and Pope. Pope floors AJ Styles early on with some punches from his boxing past. Ric Flair then climbs out of his push chair and hits Pope with the world title. The match is then thrown out and the two beat down the Pope. Beer Money then come out and join in the beatdown and this was before Ric Flair formed the Fortune Faction. But they're all there, apart from Kazarian. They throw the Pope out the ring and celebrate. Hogan then comes out to the ramp looking annoyed. Next up is TNA Lockdown. Once again, TNA was all over the place. So much going on, never boring, but man, everything moves so fast you can't keep up with it. There was a good X Division match this week and the tag team match was good. Raw also had a couple of decent matches and the Hoff was the best guest host I've seen so far. I'm going to have to hold my hands up and say that TNA shades it this week because I just can't stand the David Otonga stuff over on Raw. Ratings, ratings, let's check the ratings. Raw has climbed up from last week and gets a 3.2. TNA, on the other hand, loses a bit of its audience and gets a 0.8. I don't know, not much to say here. Tom from Top 10 Wrestling, I'd like to say it's been a pleasure, but it hasn't been. I had a really great time invading this channel and not so much watching Raw, I didn't enjoy too much, but wow, invading this channel is great. It's really roomy here, Marky. Uh, thanks for letting me in. You can shove it, man. If you're a wrestler, you would be in the same leagues as Garrett Bischoff, Wes Briscoe and Murphy. You have made a massive mistake by coming on this channel. You haven't won this war because I have something up my sleeve. Oh wait, what's that? You're doing another Monday Night War video, just like me? Raw starts out with the game Triple H stomping to the ring. He will be taking on Sheamus and a street fight at Extreme Rules. Triple H talks about the recent volcanic eruption in Iceland. Because the last episode of Raw was in England, the whole Raw roster was stuck in Europe, except Triple H, who didn't turn up because he was too good for us. He's then interrupted by three strange looking men. CM Punk is leading his straight edge cult to the ring. Punk says he's got two words for them, Jersey sucks. Triple H makes fun of Punk's friends for being bold, and then he makes fun of Punk for not using shampoo. I'm quite enjoying this exchange, this is a nice change from the previous weeks. Punk tries to get Triple H to join his little crew, but he rejects them, and then the Straight Edge Society attacks him and tries to shave his head. Rey Mysterio then runs out to make the save for Triple H, as he's taken on CM Punk at Extreme Rules in a match where Punk's hair is on the line. Rey then cuts off some of Punk's greasy looking locks, before Gallows interrupts the pruning. Can you imagine just how bad that sweaty chunk of hair smells? I can't bear to think about it. It probably smells as bad as you, Tom. The guest hosts this week are the cast of Maguba, whatever that is. They also hype up that there'll be a draft next week. Back in the ring, Drew Galloway is taking on Matt Hardy, but neither of them get their entrances shown. How times have changed for Drew Galloway. Matt Hardy starts off this match on top and does a neck breaker and an axe handle smash before Drew fights back by kicking Matt Hardy into the ring steps. Back in the ring, Matt Hardy fights back with the side effect for a close two. Drew McIntyre is the Intercontinental Champion at this time, but literally nobody cares about him. Matt Hardy then gets to Marky. Anyway, TNA opens with World Champion AJ Styles coming out. Styles has said Flair will be here a little bit later, and he says that last night at lockdown, he proved that pound for pound, he is the best wrestler in the world after beating the Pope. Bro, we had all agreed in a creative meeting, including Eric. We had all agreed that Pope was going to win the title and Hulk shit on the idea. And that was the reason it did not happen. Did the decision that Hogan made about Pope kill his TNA run? Yes, yes. He is then interrupted by Rob Van Dam and his terrible theme. The crowd chants for RVD and RVD says that AJ might be confused by that, but that's a crowd reaction and basically insinuating that AJ doesn't get one. Burn, I guess? 
RVD says that AJ is not the best wrestler in TNA, let alone the world, and that times have changed. Yes, they have RVD, and very much for the worse. Jeff Hardy then comes out and he says the charismatic Enigma, terrible nickname, is here to complete his collection of world titles, which then leads to Hulk Hogan's music hitting and him coming out. Bloody hell, the amount of interruptions, I forgot how much TNA used to do this. Hogan makes a match between RVD and Jeff Hardy tonight in a number one contenders match for the world title to face AJ Styles later tonight for the world title. And yeah, that pretty much happened. Marky D, you can have the remote back, just don't break it. Well, thanks for that, Tom. TNA are stupid giving away Hardy versus RVD for free, and whatever the main event turns out to be tonight. Back on Raw, John Cena is being interviewed via satellite. He says he's sorry to the fans for missing the show. Kozlov is in the ring on the mic, and he's in his red dressing gown. He gets King to read out a statement that he's written. He's basically just moaning about being a jobber and says he wants better competition. He also makes fun of New Jersey. Two people who look like they're from the 80s then come out to the ring. The girl talks, and she sounds absolutely terrified. I'm not sure if this is her character or if she's just bricking herself. They make the match that CM Punk, Chris Jericho, and Luke Gallows will be taking on Triple H, Rey Mysterio, and Edge later tonight. One of these things is not quite like the others. The mullet man then threatens Kozlov, and he talks about how great New Jersey is. He then says that Kozlov's mum's uterus is full of cobwebs. Kozlov challenges him to a match, but instead he says Kozlov can fight R-Truth. R-Truth comes out, and they start shouting what's up back and forth, and then suddenly R-Truth explodes, leaving nothing but Truth smoking boots on the ramp. I'm not kidding you, this was weird. Apparently Maguna has blown up R-Truth. Kozlov says again that he will face him later tonight as R-Truth is now dead. Back from the break and Maguna is trying to escape from the building, but he can't escape through the doors. Triple H points out that Maguna has wet himself with fear and accuses him of stinking of urine. He comes up with a convoluted story about how he got pee all over his pants. It's really immature and stupid. Kane then walks up and Maguna says that Kane peed on his pants and not him. Maguna then runs off and wafts the smell of feces that Kane does not like the smell of. Speaking of feces, let's switch back to Tom and TNA. We then go backstage where Flair has entered the building and he has been informed that Styles is being booked in a world title match by Hogan and he is completely furious. But then next up we have the first match of the evening which is going to be for the TNA Knockouts Tag Team Championships as Daphne and ODB who are teaming up for no reason whatsoever, literally no reason being explained why they're teaming up. They're teaming up to face the beautiful people who of course are the champions and now hold all the knockouts titles after Madison Rain won the knockouts title at lockdown. The match finished sees ODB having Velvet Sky rolled up but the ref is distracted by Madison Rain for a very long time which leads to Lacey Von Erich spraying ODB and Sky rolling ODB up to win the match and retain the titles. We then go back to the backstage area where Jeremy Borash and the cameras are spying on Ric Flair and AJ Styles in their locker room and they're just kind of spying on their conversation and eavesdropping. Basically Styles is furious that he has to defend the title with Flair banned from ringside which I forgot to mention but Flair says he knows he can do it and he says he wants a rematch of Team Flair and Team Hogan tonight. Abyss and Jarrett then head down to the ring who were members of Team Hogan last night they said that last night at lockdown, they beat Team Flair's ass, which prompts Ric Flair to come out with Beer Money, Sting, and Desmond Wolf, who were Team Flair. They come down to the ring and start brawling with Abyss and Jarrett. It's a four on two, so Jarrett and Abyss are easily beaten down. But then Rob Terry, of all people, comes out and makes the save and starts beating the entirety of Team Flair up just on his own and nearly completely botches a military press on Desmond Wolf, but thank you. Fuck, he doesn't. Eric Bischoff then interrupts Flair and says the rematch is on and it will be Team Flair of Sting, Beer Money and Desmond Wolf taking on Abyss, Jeff Jarrett, Rob Terry and a mystery man. Ooh. Anyway, back to you, scumbag. Wow, what a terrible knockouts match, Tom. You probably enjoyed that, though. No offence, but the only good part of the match was the beautiful people's ring gear. Back on Raw, Randy Orton is being interviewed by Satellite. He's over in Ireland. It's just a quick interview, he says he'll beat Jack Swagger at Extreme Rules. The goofball himself is out next. He won a triple threat title match against Jericho and Edge last week. Swagger gets on the mic and he looks like a gone off block of cheddar cheese. He issues an open challenge as a way to prove himself to Randy Orton about how good he really is. His teeth look like they're growing by the second. Swagger can barely talk. 
The Undertaker's dong sound then hits and he creaks out to the ring. This is the first time we've seen The Undertaker since he beat HBK at WrestleMania. For those of you who haven't, go check out my Destination X vs WrestleMania review. The fans are absolutely delighted to see The Undertaker. Swagger manages to knock down The Undertaker early on and everyone looks surprised. Taker then starts working Swagger's arms and goes old school. Swagger fights back of a scoop slam for a close two count. Taker then rolls out the ring and looks like he's struggling. He then proves he isn't struggling by introducing Jack Swagger to the steps. Swagger fights back by reversing an Irish whip and sending Taker into the steps in return. Swagger then starts working on the Undertaker's legs, but Undertaker manages to get back on top by hitting a leg drop on the ring apron. This is quite a good competitive match, with neither man able to stay on top for very long. Swagger is determined to keep working on the Undertaker's legs. Undertaker eventually manages to push Swagger out of the ring with his leg. Unfortunately for the Undertaker, Jack Swagger then wraps his leg around the ring post. They then start trading punches in the middle of the ring. Undertaker hits a running DDT for a two, and then he hits the snake eyes on Jack Swagger, and follows it up with a big boot and a leg drop. Swagger does manage to kick out again. Taker then goes for the choke slam, but Swagger fights out of this, only to get flattened by the Undertaker's big boot. Swagger then hits a DDT of his own, and the pin couldn't be any closer to a three count. Swagger then does his running splash in the corner, but Taker catches him with the choke slam. He hits Swagger with the tombstone, and then Powell drives him to pin him for the three. Swagger is the worst world champion ever. What a complete goofball. He has zero credibility and does not deserve to be in this position. Get rid of him now. Look, I think this match was necessary as nobody was taking Swagger as a serious threat at this point. He just looks like a mid-carder who had no business being in the main events. They wanted to make him look like a credible threat to Randy Orton, but the problem is he didn't really get any offense in on The Undertaker apart from one DDT, and that didn't put him in that much trouble. A good match though, quite long for an episode of Raw. It was about 12 or 13 minutes. Whatever's Tom watching can't be this good. The sole tag team champion Matt Morgan is backstage and he walks past Shannon Moore and Matt Morgan is offering Shannon Moore to be his new tag partner. Shannon Moore says no because he has to focus on his X Division title match and says to kiss his tattooed ass and he walks away as a furious Matt Morgan says he's making a big mistake. Matt Morgan, please beat Shannon Moore's ass. Hogan and Bischoff are backstage and they continue to tease the mystery partner and they start talking about a brand new ranking system for the world title which is apparently coming next week so we'll have to see what that is. And next up is Jeff Hardy versus RVD. RVD was busted open early on in the match and I don't really know how but this match was good and a lot of fun. I'm not too sure why they gave this away on free TV. I mean, if they did this on the pay-per-view with a receptive crowd, it could have been great. But yeah, this was a really good match. Fans were really into it, and I was too. And RVD won the match after rolling out of the way from a Swanton Bomb and then hitting the 5-star Frog Splash for the 1-2-3. And he will face AJ Styles tonight for the TNA World title. So yeah, really good match here, but... How's Raw going, Marky? Because I'm having a really good time, and I hope that you aren't. Okay, I'll hold my hands up. I can be wrong sometimes. Jeff Hardy and RVD was good. Raw needs a strong second half to the show to win this week. Backstage, Jericho is talking to the Straight Edge Society. He said they need to follow his lead tonight. Jericho then carries on walking down the hall and talks to Maguna. Apparently, Jericho's in their film. Maguna asks for help on how to deal with Kozlov. You know, if Maguna is the guest host, why doesn't he just cancel the match with Kozlov and instead puts Kozlov in a handicap match against the entire SmackDown roster? Kozlov is in the ring next, but he doesn't get his entrance shown. Maguna is out next. This guy really reminds me of Eric Young. They both look like terrified little dweebs. Maguna offers to shake Kozlov's hands and then slaps Kozlov in the face. Kozlov retaliates by hitting him with his oversized meatball head. A voice then starts screaming out of nowhere, stop the match! A little man then comes running out to the ring and says it's going to be a handicap match now. The Great Carly walks out and he will be Maguna's tag team partner. I forgot how great the Great Carly's Indian R&B music was. The Great Carly has a blonde wig on and he's instantly beating up on Vladimir Kozlov. Kozlov runs from the ring as he's getting battered and the match ends up ending by a count out. You know, wouldn't it be a draw as Carly and Kozlov were both counted out of the ring for 10 seconds? Maguna's back on the mic again, talking about how great the USA is. Yeah, you've said this about three times, all right, we get the point. Even the crowd barely react this time. There is then a lengthy hype video for the John Cena vs Batista last man standing match at Extreme Rules. You know, Extreme Rules seems to be exactly the same as WrestleMania, except better because all the matches are stipulations. Just the main event left, so we're going to switch back to Tommy Boy now for TNA. We cut backstage to both Hardy and RVD being interviewed by Christy, and they both react to some highlights of the match. This segment was odd because it clearly wasn't scripted and their reactions to the match were just like, whoa, whoa, that was really good, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Rob. It was just, yeah, a bit of an awkward segment, this. We then cut backstage to a locker room with Abyss, Jarrett, and Rob Terry and they're just hyping themselves up for the match. 
and they're trying very hard to put Rob Terry over. TNA, from me to you, this isn't working. And that match is going to be next of Team Flair of Sting, Desmond Wolf, and Beer Money taking on Team Hogan of Jeff Jarrett, Abyss, Rob Terry and a mystery partner. It's going to basically be the same as a lethal lockdown match except there's no cage and it becomes tag team rules when everyone enters the ring. Sting and Jeff Jarrett start off the match and start fighting each other in the crowd. I do love a good crowd brawl. But then Desmond Wolf is out now and it's a 2 on 1 situation for Team Flair. But next out is Rob Terry to even the odds which prompts Orlando Jordan to randomly come out on the ramp and is just standing there watching the match. Nobody has any idea why he's there, myself included. We come back from a commercial break and Orlando Jordan has just disappeared and it's now a 3 on 3 as Rude and Abyss are now out and then the final member of Team Flair, James Storm, comes out and we are now closer than ever to the mystery man and the mystery man is Samoa Joe who is making his return after being kidnapped by ninjas and that whole angle is being left completely unexplained. Samoa Joe coming back was genuinely a good surprise and I was really scared that TNA were just going to pull out someone who was already active on the roster for the surprise entry because I hate when wrestling shows do that. But he comes in, he hits a muscle buster on Storm to win the match for Team Hogan and yeah, that's pretty much it. But the story goes that Vince Russo actually called Joe back early from the abduction angle because he needed more baby faces and couldn't think of a resolution to the angle. So there's that. You know, I, I, I never, bro, I never throw anybody under the bus. But um, and I did not when I was there, but this is years later now. Bro, I got so much heat for that, including heat from Samoa Joe, who claimed uh, claimed that that ruined his entire career. Bro, that was an Eric Bischoff idea. And basically what 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 Eric's idea was, was he wanted Samoa Joe to be kidnapped. And he basically said, you know, his his idea was he was going to bring in uh, Superfly Jimmy Snooker to kind of oversee Samoa Joe. So that's why Joe was going to get kidnapped. They were going to take him to Superfly Jimmy Snooker. So Eric laid that all out. Um, you know, it, it was me, you know, and Matt Conway, you know, if anybody ever wanted to drag him into this, and I hope you don't, could definitely verify that because, you know, he, he was there during that time. But anyway, like at the beginning, I, I did not like it. I mean, I did not like it, but Eric said, no, I could get snooker, blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, bro, we do the kidnapping and everything, and then Eric can't get Jimmy snooker. So now everybody looks like an absolute idiot. But the funny thing is, like, I found out years later, like, Joe had heat with me for many, many, many years because he told me that that killed his entire career. And I had to tell him many, many years later, well, Joe, with all due respect, uh, you know, you had heat towards the wrong guy. Post-match, Ric Flair comes out to the ring and starts talking, but we cut to commercial and never hear what he has to say. But then, they show us what happens, and Ric Flair has challenged Abyss to a match next week for Hulk Hogan's Hall of Fame ring. So, that's going to be something. And next is the main event as RVD is taking on AJ Styles for the world title. But how about a quick update on Raw from the biggest scumbag alive, Marky D, before we do get on to the main event. How's Raw going, Marky? Oh <laughs> God, Rob Terry on Team Hogan. I know he's Welsh, but I swear the lad can barely speak English. He sounds like he was dropped on his head over in New Zealand. And Samoa Joe? Wasn't he shown a couple of weeks ago straining in the lose on Impact? Now he's coming back from the ninja kidnapping as if nothing ever happened. Thanks Vince Russo, I hope you're not condoning any of this Tom. Back on Raw, the game is coming out to the ring, but his entrance music is interrupted by Sheamus on the Titantron, live from his home country. Sheamus then randomly starts beating up a cameraman to try and prove a point to Triple H. Big deal, that guy was about £100, he's hardly Triple H is he? Edge comes out to the ring limping. Jericho kicked Edge's leg on SmackDown and now he's got a bad wheel. However, Mysterio comes out and he seems to be in good health. The Straight Edge Society run out to the ring, but they ain't scaring nobody. Jericho and Mysterio start out the match, but Mysterio is being dominated by the Hills. They try to regroup on the outside, but Rey Mysterio is catapulted on top of them from inside the ring. The Hills then do manage to isolate Rey Mysterio, 
but he fights back by doing a moonsault off the ropes, and then he does manage to tag Edge in. Edge beats up on Luke Gallows, who has no business being in this match by the way. Serena from the Straight Edge Society then gets on the ring apron to cause a distraction, and this allows Jericho to attack Edge's leg on the outside again. The heels then isolate Edge and his dodgy ankle. Edge eventually manages to fight back with a top rope clothesline, and this allows him to tag in Triple H. High knee by Triple H, he also hits the spine buster and tries to hit the pedigree, but it gets interrupted. The ref then loses control of the match as Mysterio is flying everywhere. Mysterio then hits the 619 on CM Punk, and Triple H follows it up with a pedigree to cover CM Punk for the free. And that's it, that's the end of the match, good and quite exciting. It was a decent episode of Raw. It was quite strange with all the Raw roster being stuck in the UK and the SmackDown roster having to fill in. From my point of view, I quite enjoyed getting to see some different wrestlers this week. We will see how that affected the ratings later on. Let's hand you back over to Tom to see who's going to be the reigning TNA World Heavyweight Champion for the rest of this TNA WWE Monday Night War. RVD is still bleeding from his head and hasn't been bandaged up for whatever reason. And this match was, again, pretty good. I mean, AJ and RVD have really good chemistry and RVD overall has just had a very good two nights. He was very good at lockdown the previous night in his match with James Storm and the lethal lockdown match. And his two matches he's had here have been really good. And major props to him because this is his fourth match in 24 hours and he's still killing it. But RVD won the match after he counted a phenomenal forearm into a power bomb and hit the 5 star frog splash to pin AJ Styles for the 3 count and win the TNA World Heavyweight Championship to a huge ovation. Yeah, this match was good like I said and a good way to close the show. And then there's a big celebration with Confetti and then Hogan and Dixie Carter, Jeff Hardy, Team 3D, Rob Terry, Eric Bischoff. Abyss and Jeff Jarrett all come out and celebrate RVD winning the world title. So the main news from the last episode of TNA is that RVD is now the TNA World Heavyweight Champion after beating AJ Styles on Impact. They actually got a pretty decent rating last week, a 0.95. So what on earth has gone wrong on this show? Well, let's find out. Hawk Hogan limps out to the ring to start the show. Ugh. Let the car crash commence. Hawk Hogan puts over how great RVD is for absolutely ages. He then says that it will be a new top 10 heavyweight ranking system debuting tonight. Oh dear, if memory serves me correctly, nothing good comes out of this. The Hawk strategy then puts over AJ Styles for a shocker and calls him one of the current greatest wrestlers of all time, whether anyone likes it or not. Hogan then brings out the new TNA World Heavyweight Champion, RVD. He gets on the mic and says thanks, Hulky. He obviously didn't get the memo, it's meant to be thanks, Hawky. RVD then proclaims himself as being Mr. TNA Rob Van Dam. Rob thanks TNA for letting him be himself. Have they? We haven't seen any segments of the stoner crew around Jeff Hardy's house on 420 yet. RVD just says how great he is basically, and then this brings out AJ Styles and Ric Flair, who is no longer in his pushchair. Hogan calls them the X-World Champions, and the crowd start chanting it, making AJ almost turn as red as Flair's skin tone. AJ calls RVD a hippie freak from Southern California, and says that nobody understands him and his ways. Then AJ asks him if he's high. AJ then says that he only lost the title because RVD lubed up the ropes before the match which caused him to slip and fall. AJ says he'll have his rematch whenever he wants it and finishes up by saying put that in your pipe and smoke it. Hogan then tries to speak but Flair interrupts him and tells him to shut up. Flair then starts ranting about his problems with Hogan throughout his life. Basically he's just annoyed because Hogan gave away his Hall of Fame ring to the idiot Abyss. Flair then starts threatening Abyss and says tonight he will beat Abyss up with the Hall of Fame rings on the line. Backstage it's the beautiful people. Madison Rain is the new knockout champion, which she won at lockdown. She will make her first title defence against two former champions tonight. Madison then says that she is the reigning champion. <laughs> very funny Madison. Apparently it will be against Tara and Angelina who don't happen to like each other very much. I've just realised Angelina Love won that Knockouts title like two weeks ago in that TNA Knockouts lockbox challenge, that stupid match. And now Madison's the champion already. What was the point in it? Let's bounce over to Raw. Raw is a special three hour show tonight as it's the night of the 2010 draft. TNA is basically screwed because this is always a good night for ratings in WWE. I don't think I've ever watched a draft before apart from the first ever draft in 2002 when it was Flair and Vince feuding. And of course I've played it on the Smackdown Here Come the Pain Season mode and PS2. If it's like this it will be cool. The winner of each match tonight will win a draft pick for their respective brand. The unified tag team titles are up for grabs first as Showmiz come out. At the Extreme Rules pay-per-view, Miz's Big Mouth got the team in trouble and they were forced to compete in a gauntlet match. Whichever team managed to beat them would win a shot of the tag titles on this show, and that just so happened to be the Hart Dynasty, so Big Show's not too happy with the Miz here. 
Miz is on the mic and says they are facing the Hart Dynasty, who they've been feuding with for a while. The feud is really just building up to the Miz vs Bret Hart. On the last Raw, the Hart Dynasty lost to Show Miz, and the deal was that Bret would have to admit that Show Miz were the best tag team of all time. Bret comes out and actually says that Show Miz are the best tag team of all time, fair play to him. But then he also goes on to say that the Mountie is the best intercontinental champion of all time, and that David Arquette is the best world champion of all time. The commentary team start laughing about David Arquette. Out come Tyson Kidd and David Hart Smith. The match begins and Tyson Kidd does some dodgy looking bounces on the ropes, and then he kicks Miz a few times. David Hart Smith then comes in and hits a massive delayed suplex. On the outside, Hart Smith knocks the Miz over. This has been all one way traffic so far. Big Show eventually gets the tag in and kicks Tyson Kidd down with ease. He then picks him up and choke bombs him in the air. Not seen that before from Big Show, but it looked cool. Big Show then chucks Tyson Kidd across the ring and tags back into the Miz. What was the point, Big Show? You could have won this match on your own. Miz then starts taunting Bret Hart and this allows Tyson Kidd to almost pin him for the free. Tyson is desperate to tag out here and he does eventually manage to get David Hart Smith back into the match, who easily beats up The Miz. There were then a couple of pinning attempts in what seems like an X Division match. David Hart Smith then power slams The Miz, but he can only get a two count. Miz then tries to cheat with his feet on the ropes, but Bret Hart kicks his feet off the ropes. Big Show objects to this interference and tries to beat up Bret Hart, but Tyson Kidd flips into him from the ring apron. Back in the ring, David Hart Smith rolls up The Miz for a very close two. The crowd are on their feet with excitement here. The Hart Dynasty then set up the Hart attack and slam Miz into the middle of the ring. They could go ahead and pin him, but they don't. Instead, Tyson Kidd puts the sharpshooter on him and The Miz taps out. The Hart Dynasty are the new unifying tag team champions. Wow, I didn't even realize they won the tag belts, let alone this. Fair play, great start to the show. Next up, there's a recap of the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. I'm gonna be reviewing this pay-per-view separately at some point, but just not right now. Here's a brief summary. John Cena beat Batista in a last man standing match after seller taping Batista's legs to the ring. There's then a recap from the advert break and it seems that Show Miz have broken up, as Big Show punched Miz in the face. I don't blame him, they could have won that match if Miz wasn't such an idiot. In the Sheamus vs Triple H match, the game was assaulted pre-match with a pipe and he struggles to the ring and he can only just about compete in the street fight. Triple H had to endure four bro kicks during the night and he did lose the match to Sheamus. The goofball Josh Matthews is then backstage interviewing the goofball Jack Swagger. Apparently Swagger retained his belt last night in the match against Randy Orton. Swagger looks like he's catching flies in his big goofy mouth. Edge then walks up to him and says that he beat Chris Jericho in a steel cage last night and he's now the number one contender for the title. Cool. Lay Cool come out next, aka the poor man's beautiful people. I prefer them when Vicky isn't with them. Two weeks ago Eve won the Divas Championship for Maurice in a two minute match. Well, some brain surgeon decided that they were tagged together tonight. Maurice gets the jobber treatment and doesn't get her music plays. That sucks because I like that song. During the match, Eve Torres tries to tag out, but Maurice doesn't want anything to do with it and kicks her in the stomach. The two start catfighting on the outside of the ring. Eve throws Maurice into the side, and then stupidly she gets back into the ring and gets kicked in the face. Idiot. I would have just bailed out on the match, it's obvious you're going to lose. Michelle then chokes Eve on the ropes and then Layla joins in. Michelle puts the submission on Eve, but she's eventually able to get out of it and slam Michelle McCool, but she can only get a two count from this. Eve then with a couple of drop kicks and then hits the netbreaker on Michelle. Maurice then decides to tag herself in for some reason. She's basically costing her team the match just like her husband did in the last one. Michelle then kicks Maurice in the face and pins her for the free. Eve Torres acts like she's devastated. She was literally two centimeters away from the pinfall. Why didn't she break it up? Well, it wasn't a two minute match, but it still sucked. The draft then starts for the first time, and a bunch of random pictures start scrolling on the screen. This ends up on Kelly Kelly, and they say that she's joining SmackDown. Who cares? I thought there was going to be some form of drama in this. I thought there was going to be general managers fighting it out for the draft pick. Not just a dumb scrolling picture, a completely random effect. Who cares? Why do people tune in to watch this specifically? I'm disappointed. I'm switching back to TNA. It's the knockouts match next on TNA. Tara has a stupid spider with her again. Madison isn't really sweating this match at all as she expects Tara and Angelina to just tear each other apart as they don't like each other very much. The beautiful people have all the gold and Velvet comes to the ring with a riding crop. She looks like absolute money here. Can you imagine if Velvet Sky had debuted during the WWF Attitude Era? That would have been a license to print money. Anyway, the match starts and Tara and Angelina do just fight each other and Madison rolls out the ring to let them get on with it, but she does want to try and sneak a pinfall victory. Madison takes Tara out of the match with a weak looking kick. Back in the ring, Angelina almost gets the pin with a front slam on Madison, who bails out of the ring. Tara then starts smashing Angelina. That slap sounded painful. Tara and Madison then fighting in the ring, but to be honest, I was a bit busy paying attention to something else. Angelina then starts beating the other two up, and then she hits the Botox injection on Madison Rain. 
Katara then flattens Angelina with a side slam and doesn't pin her because she wants to hurt her more and hit the Widow's Peak. Madison then awkwardly rams Angelina into Tara and schoolboy pins her for the free. Can we just talk about something here briefly? The subject is Madison Rain. She would dominate the knockouts division from this point onwards other than perhaps Gail Kim. She didn't have the wrestling ability of Gail Kim, that's for sure. And I hated the whole Vicky Guerrero gimmick she started doing not long after this. What do you guys think of her? Did she deserve the push she got or did she help make the knockouts division worse? Because I can't think of any good matches that she had. Tara and Angelina then for all after the match. Seems like they're bad losers. Out next, it's Jeff Hardy's stoner friend. I wonder what he's up to this week. Oh, he's taking on Kazarian. You know, I get comments on these videos all the time from people asking me what Jeff Hardy's stoner friend's up to this week. Well, last week he turned down Matt Morgan's invitation to be his tag team partner. There, I hope you're all happy. Kazarian is the X Division champion as of lockdown, as Williams was unable to defend his title due to the Iceland volcano and he got stranded in the UK. Williams missed about two shows because of this, but Abyss would later hold the TV title for about a year and didn't defend it, but he didn't get stripped for ages. It's not what you know, it's who you know. The two X Division stars are pretty even on the early going. Shannon then hits a Hurricarada and hits more moves inspired by his mentor Jeff Hardy. Kaz then hits a lovely netbreaker out of nowhere and nearly gets the victory. Shannon then comes back into the ring at an awkward angle and Kaz almost catches him with his fade to black finisher, but he sneaks out of it. Shannon then goes to the top but gets booted by Kazarian. Kazarian goes for a top rope Hurricarana, but Shannon shoves him off and he crashes and burns. Matt Morgan then sprints out and cripples Jeff Hardy's stoner friend. Kazarian then hits the fade to black and pins Jeff Hardy's stoner friend for the free. It's all gone downhill for Shannon since he got hit by that brick. Samoa Joe's music then hits. He returned last week after being off TV for a long time as he was kidnapped by ninjas. Joe then kicks Kazarian and also hits him with a muscle buster for absolutely no reason. What a knob. Russo brought him back because he was low on baby faces for the roster. Well, congratulations Russo. You've just made Joe into a hill one week after returning. Backstage, the idiot Abyss is talking about the Hall of Fame ring. He admits that the Hall of Fame ring doesn't actually have any special powers, but he said that the ring gives him the self-belief to carry on. It's basically just TNA backtracking and realising that people hate the Abyss Mania gimmick and laughing at how stupid it is. He says that it'll beat Ric Flair in the main event tonight and take his Hall of Fame ring too. So far, I don't really see what the big deal was about this TNA show. It's fine, just nothing special, nothing terrible. Let's check out Raw. Evan Bourne is out next. I've just realised how much TV time Evan has had during this series. He's been winning quite a lot too. Some scruffy looking men come out next. CM Punk is the leader of these scruffy men and he still has his hair after he was able to beat Rey Mysterio at Extreme Rules with his hair on the line. Rey Mysterio's hair wasn't on the line because he doesn't have any. Evan Bourne takes CM Punk down with a running head scissors and then starts kicking him. He then tries to go for another but CM Punk counters into a backbreaker. Evan eventually counters Punk and rolls him up for a two count. Evan then hits a lovely shining wizard on CM Punk. This is a good match so far. Evan is so fast, it's like watching Amazing Red in his prime. Punk then gets sent to the outside, and Evan dives onto the Straight Edge Society. Back in the ring, Evan knees Punk in the corner and looks like he's knocked him out. Evan then goes to hit his airborne finisher from the top rope, but a man in a hood runs out from the crowd and distracts Bourne. CM Punk is then able to nail Bourne with the go to sleep and pins him for the free. As SmackDown won this match, they get another draft pick and the random pictures start scrolling again on the screen. This time it lands on the big show. He looks really happy about being drafted, probably because he's scared of The Miz and doesn't want to have to face him after punching him earlier on. CM Punk looks terrified at the prospect of The Big Show being on the same show as him. Sheamus is then seen smiling backstage as he walks towards the ring. Elsewhere backstage, The Big Show is walking along. He bumps into Teddy Long. Teddy marches up to him and says how excited he is about him being on the SmackDown brand. They end up cuddling and Teddy celebrates the cuddle by dancing. Sheamus is out next. He gets on the mic and brags about beating Triple H last night. He said he's going after John Cena and his title next. Before he can get any further, Randy Orton interrupts him. Orton basically sticks up for Triple H and says that he was a coward for attacking him before the match. Sheamus then laughs at Orton for losing to Jack Swagger last night and tells him to get lost before he hurts him. Orton tries to threaten him, but Sheamus says he's not interested in fighting Orton, and he only wants to fight Cena and get the title, and he doesn't deal with losers. Big Match John then comes out and says that he's going to introduce us to his special guest host for the night. Then he says, actually, there is no guest host. Yes! Best news I've had all day. I hate the guest host. Cena reveals that he has the power to choose the number one contender for the night, and he makes the match of Sheamus versus Randy Orton for the number one contendership. Wow, that's a bit harsh on Sheamus. Sheamus and Orton then try to attack each other, but they both miss. If one of them gets drafted tonight, this match is potentially pointless. Let's switch back to the Hogan Show. 
I know I said before the break that there was nothing wrong with this episode of TNA. Well, stay tuned because it's all downhill from here. Back on TNA, Matt Morgan is trying to recruit a man with a mohawk to help him face Team 3D for the tag titles tonight. That man is former naval officer Jesse Neal. I know none of you can remember who Jesse Neal actually is, but he got trained at the Team 3D Wrestling Academy. But during his training, they forgot to give him a finisher or any kind of personality. Jesse basically has been completely directionless since the Team 3D Nasty Boys feud. Matt Morgan needs a tag team partner tonight because he keeps beating up his own partners. Jesse rejects Matt Morgan's offer because he saw him beat up Amazing Red last time. Matt Morgan said Jesse is a lot better than Amazing Red and he compares him to a paperboy. Morgan said that Jesse made a promise to his dying comrades in war zones that he would go as far as he can in life and become a champion. Wow, way to manipulate him Morgan. Jesse looks like he's considering it too. What an idiot. Backstage, AJ Styles is ranting to himself. He needs to get a grip. AJ Styles will be teaming up with Sting tonight, who is still a heel for some reason, but nothing has been explained as to why. They'll be taking on Team Jeff, which consists of Jarrett and Jeffrey. What a weird match. The four wrestlers almost crash into each other in the first few seconds. They're brawling all over the ring, and Jarrett hits an enziguri in the ring on Sting. Jeff Hardy hits a suplex on the ramp on AJ for a two count. Meanwhile, someone gets waffled by a steel chair, but I barely saw who it was. This match must be a Fool's Count Anywhere match, but I'm not sure as to why. AJ chucks Jeff Hardy over the top rope, and then Styles boots Jarrett. Jarrett then tries to put AJ Styles in the sleeper hold, but he's waving his arm around like a maniac, and punches the referee. This distraction allows Styles to boot Jarrett in the nuts, and get on top of the match. Sting then gets the tag in, but he's wrestling in a t-shirt. Sting and Jarrett then awkwardly collide in the middle of the ring, and there's a double down. Both men stay down for at least 9 seconds. They are completely exhausted. Bearing in mind Sting literally got in the ring about 20 seconds ago. Jarrett then tries to tag in Jeff but AJ distracts him on the ring apron. This slight distraction blocks both of the referee's vision and there's a tag but it's disallowed as they couldn't see it. Wait, is it? Jeff Hardy then short armed clotheslines AJ and hits a front suplex and then kicks him in the corner. Sting then walks away from the match for some reason. I think he's had enough. The referee then signals like the match is over, but then the match keeps going. AJ punches Jeff Hardy off the top rope, and then the two start brawling with Hardy on the outside ramp. Jarrett walks to the back looking for Sting, and AJ and Hardy brawl to the back as well. Jarrett then manages to find Sting and starts punching him on the steps towards the rafters. They keep cutting back to AJ and Jeff, and it seems that AJ is now lying on a table, and Jeff Hardy is hyping up the fact that he's going to jump off the ladder onto him. Back in the rafters, Sting is now hitting Jarrett with the baseball bat and knocks him down and pins him for the free. Jeff Hardy hears that the match is over and doesn't get to jump off the ladder and he looks very disappointed about this. This match has left me with more questions than answers. First of all, what on earth was that match? Why was it a no DQ match if these four all been feuding? Why did Sting walk to the back and then suddenly decide he actually did want to compete in the match? Who was the legal man in the match? Why did it matter as it was no DQ and it was false count anywhere? Why? What? Why? That was honestly one of the worst matches I've seen on this series, and I'm pretty annoyed now. Backstage, Jesse Neal is asking Team 3D if they are okay for him to tag with Matt Morgan tonight against them in the tag title match. They call him stupid for trusting Matt Morgan, the same thing we were all thinking. Bubba looks like a gone-off Easter egg here. This must have been just before he decided to start going to the gym. Jesse reassures them that if there's any trouble, he'll take out Matt Morgan. Yeah, as if you can take Matt Morgan out, you little jobber. Jesse says he wants their blessing tonight, and Team 3D eventually do give it to him. Team 3D then say that they need to go and take care of some other business. The Pope is shown walking along backstage. He's got one arm in a sling and an eye patch on. I'm going back to Raw now. What was that garbage match, seriously? Back on the red brand, there's a tag team over the top rope match next, and Team Smackdown are shown walking along. I honestly had no idea who that guy is on the far right. He looks a bit miserable, whoever it is. The winning team tonight will get free draft picks. You know, I was thinking about this, but why would the team want to win free draft picks? It just means that they'll have more wrestlers on their show, which means less TV time for you. Team Smackdown is Kane, Rey Mysterio, R-Truth, Drew McIntyre, and Shad Gaspar. You know, I thought Shad had a big personality. What on earth happened? Team Raw tonight is Mark Henry, MVP, Yoshi Tatsu, Ted DiBiase Jr. and Santino Morella. Kane starts out the match by smacking Santino in the face and then the brawl breaks out. The ch ch chosen one is eliminated in about the first 10 seconds. What a complete joke this intercontinental champion is. Shad then throws Yoshi out. I don't know why Kane is having so much trouble in this match. Didn't he hold the Royal Rumble record for eliminations for a while? Ray then manages to eliminate two men himself. Everyone then starts suddenly flying out the ring, and we're just left with a handicap situation, as Ray is left with Ted DiBiase and Santino Morella, but Santino's dead in the corner. DiBiase and Ray have a good little back and forth for a while. The two are then fighting on the ring apron, but Ted eventually manages to kick Ray off the apron, and he picks up the win for Raw as they gain another three draft picks. 
Well, congratulations, Ted DiBiase. That will push you even further down the card. Ted then hits the Dream Street on Santino Morella for celebrating. The first random picture starts scrolling and it's John Morrison. He comes out and looks very happy. The second pick is R-Truth and he looks happy as well as he's been teaming with John Morrison. The third random picture is Edge, in the biggest movement of the night so far. He looks fairly happy too. There's then a recap of NXT as Heath Slater was taking on Chris Jericho and apparently he beat Jericho and caused him to throw a tantrum after the match. Jericho is still looking as miserable as ever as he comes out to the ring. He will be taking on Christian tonight who is Heath Slater's NXT Pro. There's another draft pick on the line. Jericho also lost at Extreme Rules and he gets on the mic and starts crying. Jericho looks extra podgy and washed up here. You know I can't believe he's still main eventing 10 years after this, that's crazy. Jericho then says that Heath Slater still owes him an apology and calls him out. He says that he's a red-headed freak. Slater comes out and laughs at him, but he doesn't apologise. The crowd are completely dead here. Captain Charisma comes out to take on Jericho. Just before the match, Heath Slater throws Jericho out the ring to laugh at him even more. Jericho is so mad he almost grows another forehead line. This crowd is so bad, and Christian fails to get them going as Christian hits a baseball slide on Jericho. Christian then almost rolls up Jericho for a two, before Jericho shuts him down. You know, I don't know what's more orange in this match, Christian's skin tone or Heath Slater's head. I'm not even joking around here, was Christian always as orange as this? Chris Jericho misses the lion soul and this allows Christian to fight back with a flying elbow. Christian then goes to the top again but misses his dropkick and Jericho reverses it into the walls, but Christian counters that into a pin and almost has him again. Jericho is really struggling to deal with his frustrations here. Christian tries to hit the Unpredia, but the two just keep countering each other. Jericho does manage to get him in the walls of Jericho eventually, but Christian makes it to the ropes. Christian then smacks Jericho from the outside and goes to the top again, but Jericho catches him this time with the codebreaker. Jericho has managed to redeem himself. I felt for sure Jericho was going to lose here. Jericho then beats up Heath Slater after the match. Random pictures then start scrolling on the screen again, and this time it lands on Kofi Kingston. Everyone celebrates like it's a special event. Kingston starts sprinting down to the ring and takes Jericho out with the trouble in paradise. They also make the match tonight of John Morrison vs Jack Swagger. No dodgy matches on Raw tonight, it's all been pretty good. Raw is very sensible as usual, but a little bit lifeless. TNA is crazy, just too crazy. Back on the TNA show, the Pope is struggling out to the ring. He only has one arm, but he still makes it rain. The reason he has an eye patch is that he challenged AJ for the world title at lockdown, but AJ stabbed him in the eye with a pen. Pope calls AJ out for trying to end his career. Pope says that he's not forgotten about AJ and he will get his own back at some point. Pope then says that the fans keep asking him, where does he go from here? Well, to answer your question, Pope, it's all downhill, I'm afraid. Completely fire promo from the Pope, though. The fans are right behind him. Man, TNA screwed this guy so hard. His charisma is off the chart. Mr. Anderson's music then randomly hits. Anderson lost to Kurt Angle at lockdown in one of my favourite TNA matches of all time. Anderson then brings his mic down and cuts a completely nonsensical promo running down the fans. Anderson then says that Kurt Angle is at home too injured to show up. See, this is how a heel should act. Anderson lost at the pay-per-view, but he's acting like he won. Pope tells him to get to the point. Anderson says he wants to face him at the next pay-per-view and starts making chicken noises on the mic. This was so bad, it went on for 30 seconds, I'm not kidding you. It was embarrassingly awkward. Pope looks like he's going to cry. Pope then tells Anderson to watch his hand and slaps him in the face. Anderson then goes absolutely nuts and starts jamming his hand into Pope's broken eye. Well that escalated quickly. Poor Pope. It's the tag team title match up next. The music hits but there's no Dudleys. The cameraman is then running backstage and Six Pack is seen laid out on a table in a pool of his own blood. He literally looks like he's dead. I've never seen a man look more dead than he looked here. Bubba then gets on the mic and starts yelling at Six Pack. I'm pretty sure he can't hear him. He gloats that they took care of Nash and Elvis at lockdown and tells Six Pack he shouldn't have turned up. Devon then says nonchalantly that Six Pack is in a coma. I'm pretty sure he's dead, Devon. Matt Morgan and Officer Jesse Neal then come out. During the match, the crowd are going absolutely nuts for Jesse Neal. Probably the only time you'll ever see that. Team 3D start out the match by beating up their student. Bubba puts him in a bear hug. Then a wolf sound is heard and yes, the band is here. Everybody's favourite team. The one who looks like Elvis is beating up on Bubba Ray. But the match gets thrown out after 20 seconds due to this disruption. Matt Morgan then turns on Jesse Neal on the ramp and batters him. There's a fan in the crowd of a sign saying Last Call with Scott Hall, a highly underrated YouTube channel 10 years ago. He then throws Jesse Neal into the ring and chokeslams him. Morgan then screams, you will never be a tag team champion. Well, you got that right, Matt Morgan. Back to Raw we go. The goofball Jack Swagger is out next. He will be taking on John Morrison, Raw's newest star. Throughout the match, Swagger is rolling Morrison all over the place with his amateur wrestling skills. 
He then stops wrestling him and starts slapping him and allows Morrison to get up. What an idiot. Morrison kicks him in the head to thank him, but he can only get a two count. Eventually Morrison kips up and drop kicks Swagger out of the ring and then he hits a corkscrew plancher to take out Swagger on the outside of the ring. About time something happened in this match. Back in the ring, Swagger spears Morrison out of the ring, but they miss it because they're too busy showing replays of the corkscrew move. Morrison almost rolls into a very nice pinning attempt on Swagger, but Swagger manages to get up. Swagger then gets the abdominal stretch across the ropes. I've never seen it applied like that before. It's a bit like Tajiri's Tarantula. Why hasn't anyone got that as a signature move? It looks pretty cool. After a while, Morrison fights back with a nice kick and then a standing shooting star press for a two count. You know I'm surprised Morrison is getting such a good showing here against the champion. Morrison then slingshots Swagger into the turnbuckle for a weak looking spot. Morrison is then peppering Swagger's massive forehead with kicks, but this time Swagger gets his leg on the rope to break the pin. Morrison then starts slamming Swagger into the ringside barriers. Back in the ring, Swagger tries to hit him with his powerbomb, but Morrison counters it into a Russian leg sweep. He then thinks the damage is done and goes up top to hit the starship paint, but Swagger gets up and stops him and then hits his own gut wrench powerbomb for the free. You know, I think they're trying to give Swagger a bit of credibility with some wins here and make him look like a more serious threat. Problem is, he struggles with everyone he faces. This is where we miss jobbers in the modern age. He needs some dominant victories. Swagger's win has earned a pick for SmackDown, and as the pictures start scrolling, it's Christian. Christian comes out celebrating, and he motions that he's coming for Jack Swagger's title. You know, I honestly forgot Swagger was even a SmackDown wrestler, because he's just been on this series so much. I'm meant to be reviewing Raw here, but the main event wrestlers just jump between shows whenever they feel like it. Up next, they advertise on the next show Wayne Brady will be the guest host, and just like normal, I have no idea who he is. Backstage, Ted DiBiase Jr. is talking to Carlito about an opportunity. They don't say what the opportunity is, though. Carlito rejects him, whatever it was. I feel bad for Carlito, I liked him as a wrestler. Ted DiBiase then starts talking to R-Truth in the locker room, and he offers R-Truth an opportunity and a lot of money. Basically, he just wants R-Truth to be his servant. Truth don't want to do it and slaps him for it. They then cut back to the commentary team, and all three of them chat for a while. I've just noticed that all three commentators have the exact same haircut. They look like triplets. Next up, John Cena is talking about his appreciation of the army. There's lots of footage of the tours they go on every year to visit the war zones and entertain the troops. It's well known that WWE wrestlers hate this tour, but they're too scared to voice their opinions. Dolph Ziggler comes out next. Here's a new face, we haven't seen him on this series. Correct me if I'm wrong though. Oh, for God's sake, he's facing Hornswoggle, and he's in the middle of the dreaded DX run at the moment. The match goes like 20 seconds, Dolph Ziggler ends up on the outside of the ring, and Hornswoggle keeps knocking him off the ring, and then Ziggler gets counted out. Hornswoggle has won the match against Ziggler. Dolph is such a bad loser that he runs into the ring and put Hornswoggle in the sleeper hold for a while, and eventually knocks him out. But hey, at least Raw has won another draft pick. The random draft pick here is Chris Jericho. He looks happy too. Doesn't anybody have any brand loyalty? Or are they all so miserable on their own shows that they can't wait to leave? Let's get the last part of TNA out of the way now. Okay, it's the last part of TNA. Jesse Neal was on the mic screaming at Matt Morgan. Christy Hemi is then shown in the back and runs up to Matt Morgan to warn him about Jesse Neal. Matt Morgan says he has no idea who Jesse Neal is and says he's off home for the night. Hogan then walks up to Morgan and he looks absolutely terrified. Oh, for God's sake, Morgan, you're like 20 years younger than him. You're in great shape. You're not crippled. Is this a joke or something? Hogan must have written this segment. Why are you scared of him? Hogan then says get back to the ring and take on superstar Jesse Neal. <laughs> superstar. I wish they'd used that as his actual nickname, that's great. Back in the ring, Jesse Neal is beating on Matt Morgan, and then he threatens to hit him with the tag team belt, but he hesitates and Matt Morgan hits him in the nuts. He then nails him with the tag team belt. Suddenly, Jeff Hardy's stoner friend randomly runs out and makes the save. Hang on, where did Team 3D go? I swear they were there a second ago. I'm gonna have to rewind a second for the 50th time tonight. Wait, where did they go? I haven't cut out any footage here. This is how it was. How have they just disappeared? Why did Jesse Neal have to rely on this random guy to come out and save him when your brothers are right there with you? Maybe people with mohawks just look out for each other and they're all best friends. As Jesse Neal struggles to his feet, he looks up and makes eye contact with the man who has saved him. He realises that they both have mohawks and tattoos, and they shake hands. Eric Bischoff is backstage with Brooke Tessmarker and says he's here to talk about the new TNA ranking system, something that has never been done before. This new ranking system will be determined by the fans, all we have to do is go to the TNA website and pick out who we would like to see win a shot at the world title. Bischoff says it's just like politics, be ready to vote early and as often as you can. <laughs> we all know how that turns out. Major backfire. Jay Lethal then barges into the office, just like every week, and says that he would like to vote for Andre the Giant, Coco Beware, Red Rooster, One Man Gang and the Hart Foundation. Bischoff looks so annoyed about this. Aren't these two guys enemies anyway? Backstage, it's, oh, it's Orlando Jordan. 
He's covered head to toe in a load of colourful feathers. He says that there is one man he admires for his beauty more than anybody else in TNA. And that man is Rob Terry. <laughs> Next week will be the debut of his talk show, The Ozone, and Rob Terry will be his first guest. So we've all got that to look forward to on the last episode of my series. Next, there's a random interview of Ric Flair backstage, but he's so muffled that they had to put subtitles in. He says he's not happy about having to come out of retirement yet again, but it's Hogan's fault. He says Abyss offends him and everything he believes in. He says Abyss offends Ric Flair's whole wrestling career and wraps up the interview by saying, that's the bottom line because Ric Flair said so. Oh, and by the way, I've been saying that before Stone Cold. This is in fact true, but why is he bringing it up? Why, why is he taking a random shot at Stone Cold? What's the relevance? This is my favorite episode of TNA of all time. I've completely changed my mind throughout this video. It's so funny. I, mean, I can barely breathe here. I'm laughing too much. This is so random, this show. It's like it's gone mad in the last 15 minutes. What's going to happen next? Oh, <laughs> look, it's the band. An interviewer runs up to them. It turns out that their team lost at lockdown versus Team 3D. The interviewer politely asks Nash what's next. Nash then flips out and says that my friend is in a coma and you have to ask what's next. The man who looks like Elvis then threatens the interviewer and tries to calm down Nash at the same time. The interviewer then asks what they are going to do about Team 3D, as they are now a man down with Pack in Hospital. Why is that relevant? There's two members of Team 3D and two members of the band now. You don't need a third person. Nash vows to bring in a third man to help them fight against Team 3D. He's spitting mad about getting a third man. Why are they so fixated on this? So what actually happened with Pack then? Well, just before the lockdown pay-per-view, he was scheduled to compete, but he was diagnosed with Hepatitis C and Kevin Nash had to take his place. For those of you who are Kevin Nash fans, he had to pull double duty on this pay-per-view. So if you're a Kevin Nash fan, this is the show for you. This was the last ever appearance of Pac on TNA, as he was fired a couple of months after this. Everyone makes a big fuss out of the Desmond Wolf hepatitis thing, but it's never really mentioned how poorly TNA handled the situation with Pac. I don't know why that is quite. Oh, and by the way, what a good way to feature someone with hepatitis in wrestling. Let's smash his head open and make him bleed everywhere and put him in a coma on TV. I know this probably wasn't his real blood, but with TNA, you never know. Words fail me. Ric Flair is out next. He will be taking on the idiot Abyss with both Hall of Fame rings on the line. Abyss pounds on Flair in the corner and then he throws him overhead with the back body drop. The two then start chopping each other on the outside of the ring. Flair starts bleeding pretty quickly. Basically, he lost a lot of blood on the lockdown pay-per-view and Abyss is reopening his wounds. There's a sign in the crowd that says this equals ratings. Well, we'll find out soon enough, pal. Flair is then slammed from the top rope. Abyss then hits his big boot and he also follows this up with a side slam. Flair is screaming in agony here. He's barely got any offense in. Abyss then squashes Flair in the corner. Flair then starts punching the air and takes the Flair bump to the ground. Flair then gets shunted into a corner again, but this time he back kicks Abyss and the referee in the nuts. That is the third time tonight someone has been kicked in the nuts. He then gets a pair of brass knuckles out and punches Abyss square in his big face, but Abyss is unaffected. Flair then drops to his knees and this time he punches Abyss in the nuts. Abyss collapses to the floor and Flair covers him for the free. The referee then raises Ric Flair's hand, but he's stupid and drops the brass knuckles and the referee sees it. Earl Hebner orders that the match should restart. Abyss then hulks up and he nails Flair with the black hole slam and he pins Flair for the free. Hulk Hogan then comes out to celebrate the win with Abyss. He now has two Hall of Fame rings. Hogan then yanks the Hall of Fame ring off Ric Flair's hand and he places it onto his own hand. Wait, what? Why does Hulk Hogan get the ring? Surely Abyss would. Hogan says that he'll be presenting the ring to someone who deserves it next week, but doesn't say who. And that's the cliffhanger that we end the show on tonight, folks. What a great show. Back to Raw now. Back on Raw, Justin Roberts announced that next up is the number one contenders match between Orton and Sheamus, but instead Batista stomps out to the ring looking very angry after his loss at Extreme Rules. Batista gets on the mic and he's screaming that he should be the number one contender. He's literally foaming at the mouth like a dog with rabies. He calls out Cena, but Sheamus comes out instead. Damn, Sheamus' back is covered in welts from that street fight with Triple H. To be fair, Sheamus doesn't back down and calls Batista a loser. Orton then comes out to join them. I do have to admit, I like what they're doing with Sheamus here tonight. He's actually standing up to the established guys with valid points. Orton brings up Evolution and says Batista's always been complaining since the days of Evolution. Orton then makes the offer that if he can beat Sheamus tonight, he will fight Batista in a number one contendership match. Sheamus calls them both losers again and reminds them that they both lost last night at the pay-per-view. I'm 100% behind Sheamus here. Cena then comes out again and declares it will be a triple threat match. Wow, Sheamus is getting completely screwed tonight. Batista already had his rematch and he lost. 
Anyway, early on in the match, Batista bails out the ring. Sheamus starts attacking Orton in the corner, but he quickly turns it around. Lots of hard hitting here, but Sheamus fights back with a slam and the pin is broken up by Batista. Batista then hurls Sheamus into the corner and knocks him out the ring. Orton gets the better of Batista and drops the knee on his head. They then start fighting on the outside of the ring, but nothing really happens. Batista then realises that Sheamus is just chilling out on the outside of the ring and rolls out and slams Sheamus into the commentary desk. Back in the ring, Sheamus keeps trying to get into the ring, but he gets his head slammed on the ring post and he's eliminated for a while again. Batista hits Autumn with an extremely aggressive kick, and he looks almost as angry as Scott Steiner in roid rage mode. Batista then puts Autumn in a submission, but Sheamus is able to break it up. This doesn't last for long, as Autumn takes Sheamus out of the ring again. This is a really good match, one of the best I've seen during this series. Batista nails Autumn with the spine buster, but this doesn't lead to much for him, unfortunately. They fight inside the ring, they fight outside the ring, there's quite a lot happening here in this match. Randy Orton seems to be getting the best of this match and he DDTs Batista off the ropes. He then starts gritting his teeth and going nuts, but Sheamus runs over and knees him in the head to calm him down. Sheamus then lifts Orton up to hit his finisher, but Batista appears out of nowhere and spears him. He can only get a two count with this. Batista then gets taken out with a bro kick, but Sheamus first night on Raw. I think they missed a trick here not having Sheamus win this match, because let's be honest, Triple H will probably be back next week and he'll batter Sheamus, and his win at Extreme Rules will be for nothing. This is probably the best night for wrestling I've seen during this entire series. So that's it, that's both shows. Make sure you comment down below which show you preferred tonight. I've got quite a lot to talk about here, so I'll start with Raw first as it's fresh in my mind. Raw was a little bit less boring than usual, and the matches were good. It was also quite interesting to see that the Hart Dynasty won the unified tag belts. I honestly didn't realise they won any serious gold. The only thing I disliked about this show is the whole draft thing. I really don't understand why anyone would tune in specifically to watch the draft. There's no drama to it and it's not really like it affects anything because the main stars just show up on Raw or Smackdown regardless of what brand they're on. So why does anybody care about it? Okay, TNA, look, I know I probably exaggerate sometimes for the purpose of entertaining you guys. I am not exaggerating at all here. This TNA show, it was bad. This was the most over-the-top, all-over-the-place show I've ever seen. Find this show and watch it if you can. I promise you won't be disappointed. I was staring in shock at my screen at times at what I was seeing. I couldn't even follow this, and I like to pride myself on being in the know when it comes to TNA. I actually had to rewind 10 times during this video just because I kept missing things. They chose to focus the show around Jesse Neal and Shannon Moore and the formation of a new tag team, which in principle sounds okay, but then you realise the team consists of Jeff Hardy's stoner friend and a complete jobber. They won zero tag belts, Ink Ink sucks, and this was a complete waste of time. Whoever booked that should be fired. And that main event of Flair and Abyss, that was one of the most ridiculous main events I've seen in a long time. At this time, TNA had one of the most talented rosters in the history of pro wrestling, but you wouldn't know it from the way this show went. Shannon Moore, Jesse Neal and the Dudleys, they got like three segments each. Whilst Beer Money, Motor City Machine Guns, Desmond Wolf, Amazing Red, The Young Bucks, none of these talented guys got a second on this show. Do you know what else? I counted 31 different wrestlers on this show, and this show is only two hours including adverts. Guess how much wrestling there actually was on this show? I timed it, 21 minutes. You cannot properly focus on a wrestler when you're doing that. It's impossible. They need to stop focusing on the wrestlers who aren't good and focus on the ones that people actually want to see. This show reeks of desperation because they knew they were up against it tonight with Raw having the draft. There's a lot of talk about how bad 2010 TNA is, and throughout this series, I really haven't agreed with that. Yes, there have been some dumb moments and hirings, like Nasty Boys, Bubba the Love Sponge, Abyssomania, but those are just moments, they're not entire shows. But let me tell you, when people say 2010 TNA, this show is the definition of it. It's the worst episode I've seen, and that even beats the Eric Bischoff episode. On a side note, it wasn't boring, so it had that going for it. Rant over. Here was the uh, Abyssomania storyline, because that was a sort of big, big portion of the TNA. Oh, was, that, was that the one with the ring and all that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that, was, that was Hulk's baby. That was yeah. Hulk, 100% Hulk's baby, bro. Anyway, let's see what the ratings are doing, because Raw usually does really, really well on these draft episodes. Okay, so Raw gets a 3.3. That is their highest rating since the post-Raw WrestleMania, so that's good for them. TNA, let's see if they're in trouble. A 0.5. Oh, God. That is by far their worst in this Monday Night War series. They lost 48% of their audience. That is vastly below the average numbers they did before they moved to Monday Night. It sounds like TNA have been battered tonight, and it's probably going to be game over for them. However, we all know that there's one episode left in this series.
So it's the first Raw since the 2010 draft. Batista comes out to start the show. He is the number one contender after beating Sheamus and Randy Orton with help from Edge last week. Batista gets on the mic and moans about losing to Cena at Extreme Rules in a last man standing match. Batista says Cena cheated because he sellotaped Batista to the ring and he couldn't beat the 10 count. The crowd all chant Wiener. Batista and Cena will be competing in a beat the clock challenge tonight. The winner will choose the next pay-per-view stipulation match. The Great Red comes out to interrupt Batista and he brags that he beat Triple H at Extreme Rules. Sheamus says it's not fair that he's not in the championship match. He does have a fair point. Sheamus challenges Batista to a number one contendership match tonight, but Batista sells Sheamus must know and tell Seamus to leave, so he does. Up next, Batista, who is still in the ring, will be taking on The Miz in a beat the clock challenge. The US champion comes out with a mic and says that he can't fight tonight because he's got a doctor's note after he got punched by the big show. He's got a giant letter that says doctor's note on it. Miz says Batista can face his NXT rookie instead, and Daniel Bryan comes out. Daniel Bryan says that he's going to make Batista tap out. Batista tries to powerbomb him straight away, but Daniel Bryan rolls through into a pin, but he only gets a two. Brian then tries to get the submission on Batista, so Batista gets out of it and then chills on the outside of the ring. Back in the ring, Batista starts bashing him in the corner and throws him left, right and centre. Brian then tries to get a submission on Batista, so Batista launches him overhead. Batista then splits Brian in half with a clothesline, but Brian kicks out of this. Brian then kicks Batista in the head and tries to mount some offence, but Batista kicks him in the head. Brian then knocks Batista down and puts him in the crossface, but Batista makes the ropes. Brian then stupidly starts to celebrate, so Batista hits the spear and then power bombs him for the free. Batista set the time at just over 5 minutes. Batista is really embarrassed and then power bombs him again, and then he hits a third Batista bomb, and then he leaves. With the time set, Cena will have to beat Jericho in less than 5 minutes and 6 seconds. That doesn't really seem fair. The guest host tonight is Wayne Brady, and in proud tradition with this series, I have no idea who he is. Let's find out what's happening with TNA. The show starts out with Eric Bischoff promoting to vote for the number one contender for the world title. Yeah, that was such a great idea, it was truly revolutionary. I'm being sarcastic if you can't tell. Eric and the Hawk are in a limo talking about someone defecting and joining TNA. Hawk also says that he's going to give Ric Flair's Hall of Fame ring away to somebody tonight. The Idiot Abyss won it in a weird match last week against Flair. They also talk about how much they hate Sting. Hawk says he's going to call Sting out tonight. At the arena, Tanay announces that Dixie Carter has listened to the fans and that TNA is being moved back to Thursday nights. Yeah, because they listened to the fans and it wasn't anything to do with the fact they were getting their asses kicked in the ratings. Flair comes out to start the show. I bet he's not in a good mood. Wait a minute, that's not Flair, it's Jay Lethal. He seems to have Flair's Hall of Fame ring. Hang on, how does he have the Hall of Fame ring? Hogan was in a limo a moment ago with the Hall of Fame ring. How does Jay Lethal have it now? Before you all get excited, this isn't the famous woo-off segment, although it's close. Jay Lethal has been completely worthless on this show, and he's just been appearing in segments with the Hawk and Bischoff to talk about wrestlers from the 80s. I wonder what he's got to say. He starts doing a brilliant flair impression as the audience goes nuts. He suddenly starts threatening people in the audience, and then he takes his jacket off and attacks it. He calls someone in the audience Fat Boy. Flair then comes out, but he's not in his pushchair. Flair tells Lethal he's stood in front of God and accuses Lethal of disrespecting him. Lethal starts panicking and apologises and gives Flair the Hall of Fame ring back. The crowd chant, you suck at Lethal. Lethal says that standing with Flair is his proudest moment of his career and he talks about how great Flair is. Flair thanks him for giving the Hall of Fame ring back and then he slaps him. Flair really starts slapping Lethal more and more as he turns into a squashed tomato. Lethal slaps him back and they start fighting. Lethal then puts the figure four leg lock on but Fortune run out to protect Flair and they beat Lethal down. The idiot Abyss tries to make the save but Fortune beat him down too. Team 3D then run out. I'm not sure what they've got to do with any of this. They've done nothing since feuding with the band. No job Rob, the TNA world champion runs out of a chair and Fortune bail. In a limo somewhere else, the Hawk and Eric are saying that the driver needs to turn the car around because something's gone wrong. I have no idea what they're on about. No Job Rob and his cronies are still in the ring and they challenged the four horses' asses to a fight. This is Fortune before Kazarian came on board, so it's Desmond Wolf instead. So it's better? They all start fighting again because they don't like each other very much. The Hawk's music then hits. How did he get to the arena so suddenly? He takes out Bobby Roode with one punch. Desmond Wolf then runs at him and he sends him flying like a Mortal Kombat fatality. Storm and AJ then also get knocked out by the Hawk. Flair and the Hawk then square off and the Hawk chucks him over the top rope. The Hawk says that TNA is the best thing going today. He puts Desmond Wolf in a match against No Job Rob for the title tonight. This is actually where Desmond Wolf had won the TNA fan poll, where he was voted to get a shot for the TNA world title. But they completely undersell it. They don't mention that Wolf actually won the poll. 
The backstory is that the hawk wanted Abyss to win the fan poll, but he came dead last and now he's sulking. Wolf proved how popular he was with the fans who wanted to see him get a shot. You will see just what Hogan thought of Wolf a bit later on in this show. Hogan says that the X Division champ AJ can fight Abyss in a Monsters Ball match tonight. I'm pretty sure Kazarian is the champion, what is he on about? Did he mess up or is that just his personal opinion on Styles? He also says that the Motor City Machine Guns, Beer Money and Team 3D will have a match tonight. Damn, this is going to be a good show. Sting is shown sulking in the rafters. Sting has sworn that he'll break his silence tonight. Well, it's about time. We all wonder what the hell he's on about. The beautiful people are backstage acting like porn stars and saying that their backs are hurting. The tag titles and the knockouts titles will be on the line tonight in one match. Lacey is acting like an idiot. Let's check out Raw. Eve is being photographed. She then meets Wayne Brady, the guest host. Maurice then attacks her. What was the point? Edge is walking backstage talking to a nerd about the return of his Talking Edge segment tonight. The nerd says that they can't use any of the previous footage because of the PG kids. Edge says that he's rated R and doesn't like PG, and the crowd cheer. He says it's time to start an era of controversy, and he will start this with Orton tonight. I bet this got a lot of WWE fans excited in 2010. Ted DiBiase Jr. is out next. He tried to make R-Truth to be the new Virgil last week, but Truth slapped him instead. Ted DiBiase talks about Truth being poor and from the streets. He said Truth could do with some money when his WWE career is over. A decade later, I think it's the other way around, Ted. John Morrison is the opponent tonight for some reason. Morrison kicks him in the face and batters him. On the outside, Morrison hits a springboard axe handle. Seemed a bit excessive. Ted walks off and tries to leave. The referee goes to count him out, but Morrison then begs him to come back. After some deliberation, Ted agrees to come back under the stipulation that if Ted wins the match tonight, Morrison will have to be his Virgil. Why would he agree to that? Why would he be so desperate to face him? DBRC keeps getting close pins until Morrison finally fights back with a kick to the face. Morrison then tries to do some high flying, but DBRC cuts him off. DBRC then hits a power slam and a clothesline. DBRC then tries to hit his Dream Street finisher, but Morrison reverses it into a pin and gets the three. The shine has truly come off Ted at this point. He tries to attack Morrison after the match, but R-Truth comes out to make the save. Truth and Morrison have been a makeshift tag team recently. Damn, I wanted to see Morrison be his Virgil just because these two would have been such an odd couple. Wiener is out next and the little kids go nuts. Chris Jericho comes out next looking like a urinal. He brings a mic with him and says that he can't be bothered to face Cena tonight. Well, at least he's honest. He says that instead of him, he will send Wade Barrett in his place. It's nice to see some different faces on this show. Cena desperately tries to pin Barrett early on. Cena then hits the attitude adjustment over the top and slams Barrett into Chris Jericho on the outside. Jericho then gets involved and throws Cena into the announce table. Wade Barrett is all over Cena and almost puts him away of a clothesline. Barrett then puts a submission on with two minutes left on the clock. Cena fights out of it, but Barrett kicks him in the face. Lots of people get kicked in the face tonight. Barrett then hits a backbreaker for another two. Just 40 seconds left on the clock and Cena randomly gets a submission on Barrett and taps him out with 30 seconds left to spare. Cena gets the mic and goes to announce what type of match he will have with Batista at the pay-per-view. Sheamus then appears out of nowhere and guess what he does? He kicks Cena in the face. He better hope he has dental insurance. Let's get back to TNA. Back on TNA, in the ring is Brian Kendrick with Douglas Williams for some reason. Have you ever seen two such random people hanging around together? Douglas is on the mic complaining because when the Iceland volcano erupted, he was stripped of his title because he missed one pay-per-view. Douglas says he doesn't want to be in a tag match with Brian Kendrick because he's a crazy lunatic and he's just stating facts. Douglas challenges Kazarian to a match at the pay-per-view and says he won't give the title back till Kaz has beaten him. I love Williams on the mic, he always cracks me up every time. The opponents tonight are a couple of Mohawk guys. One of them just so happens to be Jeff Hardy's stoner friend. He teamed up with Jesse Neal last week because they both have tattoos and Mohawks. Apparently Hogan has given these guys a tag title shot due to their problems with Matt Morgan. Morgan is the sole tag team champion and is out to do commentary. Last week he cried and cowered in fear as the Hawk threatened him. He's a complete joke. The Hawk will be picking Morgan's partner for the match. Jesse Neal is getting battered and Kendrick tries to mess up Jesse Neal's Mohawk. Jeff Hardy's stoner friend eventually gets in the ring and beats everybody up. But we all just wish Williams would hit him with a brick again. Williams ditches Kendrick during the match. Shannon then hits the Morgasm and Jesse Neal hits a spear and they pin Brian Kendrick. Not sure how I'd rate the Jesse Neal spear. Williams comes back and slaps Kendrick. Samoa Joe then randomly comes out and he beats both guys up for no reason at all because he's a dick, I guess. He puts Brian Kendrick in the ring and hits him with a huge muscle buster. Samoa Joe looks like Kim Jong-un here. Tanay asks who abducted Joe several months ago. It was the ninjas, Tanay. we all know that. Samoa Joe gets on the mic but changes his mind and then leaves. Backstage in the Fortune dressing room, Flair is giving Fortune a hard time for getting beaten up earlier. 
Flair takes Storm's beer away and the crowd boo. Flair says that even though RVD is high, Desmond Wolf will have to concentrate in his match with him tonight. He says that he hopes Wolf gives it as hard as he gives it to his manager Chelsea. Somewhere else backstage, the Hawk is talking about how hard his life is and all the problems he has. He then starts talking about Sting and says that he wants to know why Sting attacked Dixie Carter like eight weeks ago. Guess he had more important things to worry about until now. Hogan says that he'll get the answers from him tonight from the man with the big black bat. Taz again acknowledges that Desmond Wolf did well in the fan poll, but doesn't actually say that he won. Backstage, Mr. Anderson is dressed like a padre in a dress and is attacking the Pope and spitting on him. He steals the Pope's sunglasses. It's really all been downhill for the Pope since they changed their mind about him beating AJ for the world title in lockdown. Mr. Anderson has just finished up feuding with Kurt Angle and Kurt's taking some time off. Mr. Anderson comes out to the ring looking wacky. He starts mocking the Pope and preaching to the congregation. Don't you just miss wrestling being fun like this? The crowd start furiously chanting for the Pope. He's randomly interrupted instead by Jeffrey Nero Hardy. Jeff calls the Pope his good friend. What? I'm pretty sure these two have never interacted in their lives. Hardy says that the Pope can't compete because of Anderson, who starts sarcastically crying. Anderson's funny. Nero challenges Anderson to a match at the Sacrifice pay-per-view. What a random reason to start up a feud. They're feuding over a guy that neither of them have previously interacted with. The crowd chant for Mr. Anderson to take his dress off. Anderson says that he doesn't want to fight Nero and pretends to leave, but then he tries to sneak attack Nero, but he gets nailed with the twist of fate. Nero starts to strip Anderson, who for some reason is wearing Y front, saying talk into this. What the hell? Available on shoptna.com, it's the Don West Brown Bag Special. Nero impersonates Anderson and accepts the challenge for a match from him. I'm not sure that's quite how it works, Jeff. Taylor Wilde, Sarita and Tara are in the ring. They'll be taking on the beautiful people with all the gold on the line. Tara isn't really getting on with her tag team partners and spits at them. Sarita tries to start doing Lucha Libra with Velvet, but it doesn't work. She then starts working with Taylor Wilde, her tag team partner. Madison gets the tag, but Taylor Wilde nails her with the German suplex. Tara then tags herself in and then Sarita tries to tag herself in. So Tara says, shut up or I'll smack you one. Tara then batters Taylor Wilde. The beautiful people then hit a double DDT on Taylor Wilde and pin her. It went for about 30 seconds and it wasn't very good. What were you expecting? Back to Raw. Maurice is out next and she will be taking on Nikki Bella. Well, she sort of did. It was over in about 30 seconds after Maurice hit the French kiss. The beautiful people may be all over the TNA shows, but the TNA knockouts were still better than the Divas at this time. Maurice gets on the mic and says that she needs to show her new photo shoot called Maurice Looking Sexy. I bet this got a few eyes on the screen. It's actually just Maurice posing with the belt over Eve's crippled body from earlier on in the night. Eve then tries to run out to attack her, but the referee blocks her. Maurice is one of the best bits of Raw. Alicia and Gail Kim are then at the commentary desk as Zack Ryder is randomly in the ring. First time we've seen him on this show. Ryder says he's now single and invited the ladies to come out and watch him tonight. The guest host then appears on the screen and says that he's got a special match for him. Mark Henry then comes out with a beautiful smile on his face. Jim, the King Lawler, is not watching the match and is checking out the ladies instead. Old school King. Zack Ryder hits the Rough Rider, but Mark Henry kicks out of this. Zack Ryder looks like a young Heath Slater here. Mark Henry hits the world's strongest slam and it's over. About one minute. I wonder what Gail Kim was thinking while watching this. Mark Henry then leaves with both the ladies. This surely can't be all they have for Gail Kim. Jericho and The Miz are backstage both complaining that they have both been punched by The Big Show recently. They share stories about how annoying The Big Show is and talk about his snoring. Well what did they do? Share beds with him or something? Somewhere else backstage, Kozlov is looking annoyed. He's talking to the guest host when Santino walks in with an afro wig on. I have no idea what Santino's talking about. Regal walks in and tells Vladimir to ignore him. First appearance for Regal on this show too, I believe. I think Santino wants to team up with Vladimir or something along those lines, I have no idea. Goldust then randomly appears for another first appearance on this series. Jericho and The Miz are at the commentary desk next as the unified tag team champions are out. The Happy Heart Dynasty. They will be taking on Regal and Kozlov who are already in the ring. I forgot these guys were ever a team. Kozlov cripples Tyson Kidd from the top to the outside, and I think he legitimately hurts him here. Back in the ring, Kozlov hits a fallaway slam on Tyson Kidd. Tyson Kidd fights back with a drop kick to Regal's face, and then the Bulldog son gets the tag, and then he taps out Regal with the sharpshooter. The Miz and Jericho then attack the Hart Dynasty, and they look like twins. Let's catch up to see what's going on with TNA. Back in TNA world, Tara is bitching to Christy Hemi that she doesn't get any respect and she challenges Madison to a match for the title at the pay-per-view. Christy says that Tara doesn't deserve a shot because she hasn't won any matches lately. Tara says that she'll put her career on the line if Madison gives her a shot. Tara can't catch a break since losing her title in that lockbox match. 
The Dudley boys are out next, and the guns and beer money don't even get their entrances shown. Always so much crammed into these shows. The guns are so fast and beat up James Storm. The crowd love them. Beer Money start cheating to get the advantage. They hit the Beer Money suplex. Then there's a double down after Devon was in the match for about two minutes. I guess he really doesn't do much cardio. Bubba then gets the tag and beats Beer Money up. 3D then hit the what's up. Suddenly Kevin Nash and a man who looks like Elvis wander out to the ring. They beat down Team 3D and the match is thrown out. Eric Young then runs out of a kendo stick and hits Team 3D with it. He then two sweets the band so I guess he's joined them. The guns randomly attack the band for no reason. Beer Money then run back into the match and hit the DWI. Beer Money and the band join up and celebrate. What a tag division they had at this time. Dave Penzer on a pole then screams, Welcome to the Ozone. Oh god, I forgot about this. It's the debut of Orlando Jordan's talk show. Orlando talks about how much he's in love with Rob Terry. He brings out Rob the Roider, or does he? It's just a cutout of Rob Terry, although it's just as bland and boring as the real life Rob Terry. Orlando starts talking about how perfect Rob Terry's body is, and he loves his bulges. I don't know how anyone could possibly enjoy this segment. Taz says, how long is this going to go for? The crowd are booing. Orlando Jordan says, who do you fancy about tonight, Rob Terry? And then pretends that Rob says he fantasizes about him. The real Rob Terry then runs out and knocks Orlando Jordan down, and he destroys the cutout. He tells Jordan, don't make me come back, and celebrates like an idiot. Jordan then attacks him from behind and chokes him out of a chain. Jordan then slams a pot on him, and it's over. What a great debut talk show that was. My two least favorite wrestlers in one place at the same time. Back to the last bit of Raw. They announce that the guest host for Raw next week will be Flavor Flav. Wow, a guest that I've actually heard of. Shame I won't be watching it. Edge will end the show tonight with his Cutting Edge talk show segment. Edge gives an explanation as to why he cost Randy Orton his match last week. He justifies the attack as an act of defiance. He didn't want to be drafted to Raw. Edge goes on to bring out Randy Orton, but then Wayne Brady comes out instead. He says he wants to see what it's like to be a WWE superstar. He threatens all the guest hosts and cuts a promo, and then Randy Orton comes out. Orton is gorming out, so Wayne Brady tries to see if he's okay, so Orton nails him with the RKO. Edge is scared of Orton and is begging him not to attack him. Edge says that he wants to reform their tag team rated RKO. Randy doesn't respond and he starts gritting his teeth and looking like he's going to go nuts. Edge rants that the audience didn't accept him and says he's jealous that the audience like Randy Orton. Edge keeps complaining and saying everything is not fair. Edge says that he will spear Orton every week unless he agrees to team up with him. Orton refuses to speak and then he tries to hit the RKO but Edge reverses it and kicks him in the face. Edge then goes for the spear, but Randy catches him with the RKO. So I guess this is a feud now over Randy Orton's popularity. It's over. There were no good matches on Raw tonight, but it was at least nice to see some fresh faces on the show. Let's catch the last part of the TNA show. The following is taken from 15 minutes of the TNA show. Believe it or not, I don't know how they fit all this into such a little time. AJ is coming out to fight the idiot Abyss in the Monsters Ball match. These two have had some excellent matches in the past. Abyss comes out of a trash can full of weapons. He has the Hawk Hogan theme music. I forgot to talk about this before. God, I hated Abyssomania. AJ tries to springboard Abyss on the ramp. AJ then throws a trash can at Abyss, and Abyss doesn't care about this and throws AJ overhead into the ring. Abyss then sets up a chair in the corner and kicks AJ in the face. AJ blocks a steel chair shot and then Abyss whacks him in the face. What a punch. AJ then hits the Pele kick and gets on top of Abyss. AJ tries to mount some form of offense, but Abyss throws him back into the air. AJ then charges into the steel chair in the corner like an idiot. Abyss hits the shock treatment bat breaker, but can only get a two. Abyss brings the dumb tax into the ring. Flair then suddenly comes out to the ring, dragging Chelsea in a trench coat. Flair is screaming, take your clothes off. Abyss is distracted and AJ hits him with the steel chair. AJ then hits him with the brass knuckles and then springboards into the ring into the tax. He then pins Abyss for the free. Chelsea then takes her coat off, but she's not in lingerie, unfortunately. Not a single replay is shown, and it's straight into the main event. As if by magic, Desmond Wolf is in the ring straight away. He doesn't get his entrance shown. I think you can predict how this one's about to go down, as the world champion No Job Rob comes out. Desmond kicks RVD before he get into the ring. Wolf smashes him into the ring pole and then throws him in the ring. Wolf then batters RVD in the corner and gets a two count. Wolf then hits a hammerlock drop on RVD for another two. Tanae says that they had around a half a million votes on the fan poll, but they still don't acknowledge that Wolf won. They then say that they're listening to the fans. I'm not sure they are really. Wolf starts showboating and then RVD kicks him from the top and hits the rolling thunder. Wolf then tries to hit the Tower of London in the corner, but decides to try and do it on the outside for some stupid reason. RVD reverses it and kicks him down the entrance ramp. He then back body drops Wolf into the ring. Five star frog splash. Bish bash bosh. It's over. Three minutes at the most. Thanks for coming, Desmond Wolf. You will never have another world title shot in TNA. 
AJ then flies out of nowhere and attacks RVD. AJ screams that they will be having a rematch for the title at the pay-per-view. The Hawkster then comes out to end the show because of course he does. He gets on the mic and calls out Steve Borden. The Hawk asks Sting what makes him tick. Sting is talking in riddles again. Sting talks about how much he loves the company. A good promo from the Hawk to be fair. He brings up everyone Sting has attacked over the last few weeks, but Sting doesn't really explain anything. Sting threatens Hogan with his big black bat. Unfortunately, he doesn't hit him with it, and then Jeff Jarrett runs out to attack him. Apparently, Jarrett and Sting will be fighting at the pay-per-view. When was that ever announced? I guess they just did it now. The Hawk stops Jarrett from hurting Sting too much with the bat, and then the show suddenly ends. What a 15 minutes. I don't know what to say, it's crazy how different this show is to Raw, and modern day wrestling for that matter. So many in-ring segments and promos, and so many rushed matches. This show is perfect for anyone with ADD, who struggles to concentrate for long. Has anyone ever asked Vince Russo if he has ADD? Let's do the ratings for one final time. Raw scored a 3.05 down on last week. TNA scored a 0.8, which is at least better than their catastrophe last week. During 2009, TNA was averaging a 1.14 rating, but during the Monday Night Wars, only the opening episode of the war got over a 1.0. TNA lost roughly 7% of their audience time. So that's how the Monday Night War ends. A fan poll where the fans got screwed, an Orlando Jordan talk show segment with him leering at a Rob Terry cutout, 10 minutes of wrestling action, strange feuds over nothing, Sting talking in riddles for the eighth week in a row, as usual, it's extremely entertaining, but it's hard to keep up with anything that's happening. TNA bailed out and went back to Thursdays after this. I thought it might be interesting to do a bit of analysis before we bring this series to a close. Obviously, the Hawk was all over the show, and so was Eric Bischoff. But who was pushed the strongest, and which wrestler had the most TV time? We had two TNA World Champions during the Monday Night Wars. AJ Styles to start with, and then they switched the belt to RVD. Let the Hawk tell you something. There's a reason he's called No Job Rob. Because during the Monday Night Wars, RVD, nine wins, zero defeats. Yet they never mentioned that he was undefeated. Do you know who else was undefeated? The beautiful people. They won seven matches. Sex sales, or it doesn't in TNA's case. Okay, so Rob did the best, but who did the worst? The answer is, surprise, surprise, Desmond Wolf. Five defeats and only one win. It's clear that someone didn't think much of him in the TNA office. Two people managed to hold on to their belts for the entire Monday Night Wars. That was Rob Terry, who was the TV champion and defended it twice. Great TV champion right there. And Matt Morgan, who won the Tag Team Championship and held it on his own for most of the Monday Night War. Yeah, great when you have such amazing tag teams, but instead you've got Matt Morgan as the sole champion. It ultimately comes down to who had the most TV time matches and promos. I'm not going to go back and watch all of it and time it all out because that would be pure insanity. But I'd say that Hawk Hogan, Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair spent the most minutes on the screen. I'm starting to see why TNA lost. Do you know what else is interesting? To see who else was on the TNA roster at this time. They had a huge roster. Did you know that they had the following wrestlers during this time? Deep Breath Please, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe, LAX, Okada, Raven, The Young Bucks, Magnus, The Amazing Red, Rhino, Kiyoshi, Tomko, and Stevie Richards. And the majority of those wrestlers didn't make a single appearance. TNA definitely had the best roster at the time. It could have been so good. So what could TNA have done differently? Well, not letting Scott Steiner leave because of the Hawk for one. I'm kidding, but we did miss Steiner during this Monday Night War. Trying to go head-to-head -head with Raw during WrestleMania season is probably the biggest mistake. I'd also say that there are too many short matches on Impact and long promos. This might have worked in the 90s, but internet fans were becoming the majority, and they wanted to see more wrestling on their product. They had also differed too much from the perfect balance of wrestling and talking that they had around 2007. There were also many older wrestlers that were featured, especially at the start of the Monday Night War. This turned new fans off straight away, and they never came back to watch. I'm just going to round this series off by saying they didn't have a clear goal for branding. They were basically WWE, but they had too much action squashed in. They had a chance to be different and push some new faces like the Pope or Desmond Wolfe as main eventers, but they blew it. Right when the fans wanted to see these guys, TNA had so much talent and the management clearly let them down, and they turned them into a laughing stock when they lost the Monday Night War. They also didn't have the budget that WWE had. That's a big factor. Almost left that one out. WWE seemed to partially try for the first two episodes of this war, Maybe they were ever so slightly concerned at the start. But then they proved that they didn't care by having Sheamus as a champion who got lucky by punching Cena through a table. But much worse was Jack Swagger as champion. But the most unforgivable thing is the amount of rubbish we had to suffer through of all these guest hosts. It really ruined my enjoyment of pretty much all the shows. Ultimately, what it comes down to is WWE always had a clear and sensible plan and they hyped and promoted everything. Whereas there was too much happening on each TNA show and no time to promote anything. The TNA show was definitely more exciting, but it was also a lot more confusing, and they made it difficult for new fans to get on board. 
hopefully some stuff in this video that AEW can learn from because we don't want history to repeat twice. And if you don't agree with that, tough luck, no dice.